Book One of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book One. Recording by Joshua Christensen. The Quarrel Between Agamemnon and Achilles. Achilles withdraws from the war, and sends his mother Thetis to ask Jove to help the Trojans. Scene between Jove and Juno on Olympus. Sing, O goddess, the anger of Achilles, son of Peleus, that brought countless ills upon the Achaeans. Many a brave soul did it send hurrying down to Hades, and many a hero did it yield a prey to dogs and vultures, for so were the counsels of Jove fulfilled from the day on which the son of Atreus, king of men, and great Achilles, first fell out with one another. And which of the gods was it that set them on to quarrel? It was the son of Jove and Leto, for he was angry with the king, and sent a pestilence upon the host to plague the people, because the son of Atreus had dishonored Chryses his priest. Now Chryses had come to the ships of the Achaeans to free his daughter, and had brought with him a great ransom, Moreover he bore in his hand the scepter of Apollo, wreathed with a suppliant's wreath, and he besought the Achaeans, but most of all the two sons of Atreus, who were their chiefs. Sons of Atreus, he cried, and all other Achaeans, may the gods who dwell in Olympus grant you to sack the city of Priam, and to reach your homes in safety, but free my daughter, and accept a ransom for her, in reverence to Apollo, son of Jove. On this, the rest of the Achaeans, with one voice, were for respecting the priest, and taking the ransom that he offered. But not so Agamemnon, who spoke fiercely to him, and sent him roughly away. Old man, said he, let me not find you tarrying about our ships, nor yet coming hereafter. Your scepter of the god, and your wreath shall profit you nothing. I will not free her. She shall grow old in my house at Argos, far from her own home, busying herself with her loom and visiting my couch. So go, and do not provoke me, or it shall be the worse for you. The old man feared him and obeyed. Not a word he spoke, but went by the shore of the sounding sea, and prayed apart to King Apollo, whom lovely Leto had borne. Hear me, he cried, O God of the silver bow, that protectest Chrysi and holy Scylla, and rulest Tenedos with thy might. Hear me, O thou of Smintha. If I have ever decked your temple with garlands, or burned your thigh bones in fat of bulls or goats, grant my prayer, and let your arrows avenge these my tears upon the Danaeans. Thus did he pray, and Apollo heard his prayer. He came down furious from the summits of Olympus, with his bow and his quiver upon his shoulder, and the arrows rattled on his back with the rage that trembled within him. He sat himself down away from the ships, with a face as dark as night, and his silver bow rang death as he shot his arrow in the midst of them. First he smote their mules and their hounds, but presently he aimed his shafts at the people themselves, and all day long the pyres of the dead were burning. For nine whole days he shot his arrows among the people, but upon the tenth day Achilles called them in assembly, moved thereto by Juno, who saw the Achaeans in their death throes and had compassion upon them. Then, when they were got together, he rose and spoke among them. "'Son of Atreus,' said he, "'I deem that we should now turn roving home "'if we would escape destruction, "'for we are being cut down by war and pestilence at once. "'Let us ask some priest or prophet, "'or some reader of dreams, "'for dreams too are of Jove, "'who can tell us why Phoebus Apollo is so angry, "'and say whether it is for some vow that we have broken, "'or hecatomb that we have not offered.' and whether he will accept the savour of lambs and goats without blemish, so as to take away the plague from us. With these words he sat down, and Calchas, son of Thestor, wisest of augurs, who knew things past, present, and to come, rose to speak. He it was who had guided the Achaeans with their fleet to Ilius, through the prophesyings of which Phoebus Apollo had inspired him. With all sincerity and good will he addressed them thus. Achilles, loved of heaven, you bid me tell you about the anger of King Apollo. I will therefore do so, but consider first and swear that you will stand by me heartily in word and deed, 
for I know that I shall offend one who rules the Argives with might, to whom all the Achaeans are in subjection. A plain man cannot stand against the anger of a king, who, if he swallow his displeasure now, will yet nurse revenge till he has wreaked it. Consider, therefore, whether or no you will protect me. And Achilles answered, Fear not, but speak as it is borne upon you from heaven, for by Apollo, Calchas, to whom you pray, and whose oracles you reveal to us, not a Danaan at our ships shall lay his hand upon you, while I yet live to look upon the face of the earth. No, not though you name Agamemnon himself, who is by far the foremost of the Achaeans. Thereon the seer spoke boldly. The god, he said, is angry neither about vow nor hecatomb, but for his priest's sake, whom Agamemnon has dishonored, in that he would not free his daughter, nor take a ransom for her. Therefore he has sent these evils upon us, and will yet send others. He will not deliver the Danaeans from this pestilence till Agamemnon has restored the girl without fee or ransom to her father, and has sent a holy hecatomb to Chrysi. Thus we may perhaps appease him. With these words he sat down, and Agamemnon rose in anger. His heart was black with rage, and his eyes flashed fire as he scowled on Calchas and said, Seer of evil, you never yet prophesied smooth things concerning me, but have ever loved to foretell that which was evil. You have brought me neither comfort nor performance, and now you come seeing among the Danaeans, and saying that Apollo has plagued us because I would not take a ransom for this girl, the daughter of Chrysus. I have set my heart on keeping her in my own house, for I love her better even than my own wife Clemenestra, whose peer she is alike in form and feature, in understanding and accomplishments. Still, I will give her up if I must, for I would have the people live, not die, but you must find me a prize instead, or I alone among the Argives shall be without one. This is not well, for you behold, all of you, that my prize is to go elsewhither. And Achilles answered, Most noble son of Atreus, covetous beyond all mankind, how shall the Achaeans find you another prize? We have no common store from which to take one. Those we took from the cities have been awarded. We cannot disallow the awards that have been made already. Give this girl, therefore, to the god, and if ever Jove grants us to sack the city of Troy, we will requite you three and fourfold. Then Agamemnon said, Achilles, valiant though you be, you shall not thus outwit me. You shall not overreach, and you shall not persuade me. Are you to keep your own prize while I sit tamely under my loss and give up the girl at your bidding? Let the Achaeans find me a prize in fair exchange to my liking, or I will come and take your own, or that of Ajax or of Ulysses, and he to whomsoever I may come shall rue my coming. But of this we will take thought hereafter. For the present, let us draw a ship into the sea and find a crew for her expressly. Let us put a hecatomb on board, and let us send Chryseis also. Further, let some chief man among us be in command, either Ajax, or Idomeneus, or yourself, son of Peleus, mighty warrior that you are, that we may offer sacrifice and appease the anger of the god. Achilles scowled at him and answered, You are steeped in insolence and lust of gain. With what heart can any of the Achaeans do your bidding, either on foray or in open fighting? I came not warring here for any ill the Trojans had done me. I had no quarrel with them. They have not raided my cattle nor my horses, nor cut down my harvests on the rich plains of Pythia. For between me and them there is a great space, both mountain and sounding sea. We have followed you, Sir Insolence, for your pleasure, not ours, to gain satisfaction from the Trojans for your shameless self and for Menelaus. You forget this, and threaten to rob me of the prize for which I have toiled, and which the sons of the Achaeans have given me. Never when the Achaeans sack any rich city of the Trojans do I receive so good a prize as you do, though it is my hands that do the better part of the fighting. When the sharing comes, your share is far the largest, and I, forsooth, must go back to my ships, take what I can get and be thankful, when my labor of fighting is done. Now, therefore, I shall go back to Phythia. It will be much better for me to return home with my ships, for I will not stay here dishonored to gather gold and substance for you. And Agamemnon answered, Fly if you will, I shall make you no prayers to stay you. I have others here who will do me honor, 
and above all Jove, the lord of counsel. There is no king here so hateful to me as you are, for you are ever quarrelsome and ill-affected. What, though you be brave, was it not heaven that made you so? Go home, then, with your ships and comrades, to lord it over the Myrmidons. I care neither for you, nor for your anger, and thus will I do. Since Phoebus Apollo is taking Chryseis from me, I shall send her with my ship and my followers, but I shall come to your tent, and take your own prize, Briseis, that you may learn how much stronger I am than you are and that another may fear to set himself up as equal or comparable with me. The son of Peleus was furious, and his heart within his shaggy breast was divided whether to draw his sword, push the others aside and kill the son of Atreus, or to restrain himself and check his anger. While he was thus in two minds, and was drawing his mighty sword from its scabbard, Minerva came down from heaven, for Juno had sent her in the love she bore to them both, and seized the son of Peleus by his yellow hair, visible to him alone, for of the others no man could see her. Achilles turned in amaze, and by the fire that flashed from her eyes at once knew that she was Minerva. "'Why are you here?' said he, daughter of Aegeus bearing Jove, to see the pride of Agamemnon, son of Atreus? Let me tell you, and it shall surely be, he shall pay for this insolence with his life.' And Minerva said, "'I come from heaven, if you will hear me, to bid you stay your anger.' Juno has sent me, who cares for both of you alike. Cease, then, this brawling, and do not draw your sword. Rail at him if you will, and your railing will not be vain, for I tell you, and it shall surely be, that you shall hereafter receive gifts three times as splendid by reason of this present insult. Hold, therefore, and obey. Goddess, answered Achilles, however angry a man may be, he must do as you two command him. This will be best, for the gods ever hear the prayers of him who has obeyed them. He stayed his hand on the silver hilt of his sword, and thrust it back into the scabbard as Minerva bade him. Then she went back to Olympus among the other gods, and to the house of Aegis bearing Jove. But the son of Peleus again began railing at the son of Atreus, for he was still in a rage. Wine-bibber, he cried, with the face of a dog and the heart of a hind, you never dare to go out with a host and fight, nor yet with our chosen men in ambuscade. You shun this as you do death itself. You had rather go round and rob his prizes from any man who contradicts you. You devour your people, for you are king over a feeble folk. Otherwise, son of Atreus, henceforward you would insult no man. Therefore I say, and swear it with a great oath, nay, by this my scepter which shall sprout neither leaf nor shoot, nor bud anew from the day on which it left its parent stem upon the mountains, for the axe stripped it of leaf and bark, and now the sons of the Achaeans bear it as judges and guardians of the decrees of heaven. So surely and solemnly do I swear that hereafter they shall look fondly for Achilles and shall not find him. In the day of your distress, when your men fall dying by the murderous hand of Hector, you shall not know how to help them, and shall rend your heart with rage for the hour when you offered insult to the bravest of the Achaeans. With this, the son of Peleus dashed his gold-bestudded scepter on the ground and took his seat, while the son of Atreus was beginning fiercely from his place upon the other side. Then up rose smooth-tongued Nestor, the facile speaker of the Pylians, and the words fell from his lips sweeter than honey. Two generations of men, born and bred in Pylos, had passed away under his rule, and he was now reigning over the third. With all sincerity and good will, therefore, he addressed them thus. Of a truth, he said, a great sorrow has befallen the Achaean land. Surely Priam with his sons would rejoice, and the Trojans be glad at heart if they could hear this quarrel between you two, who are so excellent in fight and counsel. I am older than either of you, therefore be guided by me. Moreover, I have been the familiar friend of men even greater than you are, and they did not disregard my counsels. Never again can I behold such men as Pirithous and Dryas, shepherd of his people, or as Caneus, Exadius, godlike Polyphemus, and Theseus, son of Aegeus, peer of the immortals. These were the mightiest men ever born upon this earth. Mightiest were they, and when they fought the fiercest tribes of mountain savages, they utterly overthrew them. I came from distant Pylos, and went about among them, 
for they would have me come, and I fought as was in me to do. Not a man now living could withstand them, but they heard my words, and were persuaded by them. So be it also with yourselves, for this is the more excellent way. Therefore, Agamemnon, though you be strong, take not this girl away, for the sons of the Achaeans have already given her to Achilles. And you, Achilles, strive not further with the king, for no man who by the grace of Jove wields a scepter has like honour with Agamemnon. You are strong and have a goddess for your mother, but Agamemnon is stronger than you, for he has more people under him. Son of Atreus, check your anger, I implore you. End this quarrel with Achilles, who in the day of battle is a tower of strength to the Achaeans. And Agamemnon answered, Sir, all that you have said is true, but this fellow must needs become our lord and master. He must be lord of all, king of all, and captain of all, and this shall hardly be. Granted that the gods have made him a great warrior, have they also given him the right to speak with railing? Achilles interrupted him. I should be a mean coward, he cried, were I to give in to you in all things. Order other people about, not me, for I shall obey no longer. Furthermore I say, and lay my saying to your heart, I shall fight neither you nor any man about this girl, for those that take were those also that gave. But of all else that is at my ship you shall carry away nothing by force. Try that others may see. If you do, my spear shall be reddened with your blood." When they had quarrelled thus angrily, they rose and broke up the assembly at the ships of the Achaeans. The son of Peleus went back to his tents and ships, with the son of Menoetius and his company, while Agamemnon drew a vessel into the water, and chose a crew of twenty oarsmen. He escorted Chryseis on board, and sent moreover a hecatomb for the god, and Ulysses went as captain. These, then, went on board and sailed their ways over the sea. But the son of Atreus bade the people purify themselves. So they purified themselves and cast their filth into the sea. Then they offered hecatombs of bulls and goats without blemish on the seashore, and the smoke with the savour of their sacrifice rose curling up towards heaven. Thus did they busy themselves through the host. But Agamemnon did not forget the threat that he had made Achilles, and called his trusty messengers and squires Talthybius and Eurybides. Go, said he, to the tent of Achilles, son of Peleus. Take Briseis by the hand and bring her hither. If he will not give her, I shall come with others and take her, which will press him harder. He charged them straightly further and dismissed them, whereon they went their way sorrowfully by the seaside, till they came to the tents and ships of the Myrmidons. They found Achilles sitting by his tent and his ships, and ill-pleased he was when he beheld them. They stood fearfully and reverently before him, and never a word did they speak, but he knew them and said, Welcome, heralds, messengers of gods and men. Draw near, my quarrel is not with you, but with Agamemnon, who has sent you for the girl Briseis. Therefore, Patroclus, bring her and give her to them, but let them be witnesses by the blessed gods, by mortal men and by the fierceness of Agamemnon's anger, that if ever again there be need of me to save the people from ruin, they shall seek and they shall not find. Agamemnon is mad with rage, and knows not how to look before and after that the Achaeans may fight by their ships in safety. Patroclus did as his dear comrade had bidden him. He brought Biseus from the tent, and gave her over to the heralds, who took her with them to the ships of the Achaeans, and the woman was loth to go. Then Achilles went all alone by the side of the horror sea, weeping and looking out upon the boundless waste of waters. He raised his hands in prayer to his immortal mother. Mother, he cried, you bore me doomed to live but for a little season. Surely Jove, who thunders from Olympus, might have made that little glorious. It is not so. Agamemnon, son of Atreus, has done me dishonor, and has robbed me of my prize by force. As he spoke he wept aloud, and his mother heard him where she was sitting in the depths of the sea, hard by the old man her father. Forthwith she rose as it were a grey mist out of the waves, sat down before him as he stood weeping, caressed him with her hand, and said, My son, why are you weeping? What is it that grieves you? Keep it not from me, but tell me, that we may know it together. Achilles drew a deep sigh, and said, You know it. Why tell you what you know well already? We went to Thebe, the strong city of Etion, sacked it, and brought hither the spoil. 
the sons of the Achaeans shared it duly among themselves, and chose lovely Chryseis as the mead of Agamemnon. But Chryses, priest of Apollo, came to the ships of the Achaeans to free his daughter, and brought with him a great ransom. Moreover he bore in his hand the scepter of Apollo, wreathed with a suppliant's wreath, and he besought the Achaeans, but most of all the two sons of Atreus, who were their chiefs. On this the rest of the Achaeans, with one voice, were for respecting the priest and taking the ransom that he offered. But not so Agamemnon, who spoke fiercely to him and sent him roughly away. So he went back in anger, and Apollo, who loved him dearly, heard his prayer. Then the gods sent a deadly dart upon the Argives, and the people died thick on one another, for the arrows went everywhither among the wide hosts of the Achaeans. At last a seer, in the fullness of his knowledge, declared to us the oracles of Apollo, and I was myself first to say that we should appease him. Whereon the son of Atreus rose in anger, and threatened that which he has since done. The Achaeans are now taking the girl and a ship to Chrysa, and sending gifts of sacrifice to the god. But the heralds have just taken from my tent the daughter of Briseus, whom the Achaeans had awarded to myself. Help your brave son, therefore, if you are able. Go to Olympus, and if you have ever done him service in word or deed, implore the aid of Jove. Oft times in my father's house have I heard you glory, in that you alone of the immortals saved the son of Saturn from ruin, when the others, with Juno, Neptune, and Pallas, Minerva, would have put him in bonds. It was you, goddess, who delivered him by calling to Olympus the hundred-handed monster whom gods call Briareus, but men Aegeon, for he is stronger even than his father. When therefore he took his seat all glorious beside the son of Saturn, the other gods were afraid and did not bind him. Go then to him, remind him of all this, clasp his knees and bid him give succor to the Trojans. Let the Achaeans be hemmed in at the sterns of their ships, and perish on the seashore, that they may reap what joy they may of their king, and that Agamemnon may rue his blindness in offering insult to the foremost of the Achaeans. Thetis wept and answered, My son, woe is me that I should have borne or suckled you. Would indeed that you had lived your span free from all sorrow at your ships, for it is all too brief. Alas, that you should be at once short of life and long of sorrow above your peers. Woe, therefore, was the hour in which I bore you. Nevertheless, I will go to the snowy heights of Olympus, and tell this tale to Jove, if he will hear our prayer. Meanwhile, stay where you are with your ships, nurse your anger against the Achaeans, and hold aloof from fight. For Jove went yesterday to Oceanus, to a feast among the Ethiopians, and the other gods went with him. He will return to Olympus twelve days hence. I will then go to his mansion paved with bronze and will beseech him, nor do I doubt that I shall be able to persuade him. On this she left him, still furious at the loss of her that had been taken from him. Meanwhile Ulysses reached Chrysi with the hecatomb. When they had come inside the harbour, they furled the sails and laid them in the ship's hold. They slackened the forestays, lowered the mast into its place, and rowed the ship to the place where they would have her lie. There they cast out their mooring stones and made fast the hawsers. Then they got out upon the seashore and landed the hecatomb for Apollo. Chryseis also left the ship, and Ulysses led her to the altar to deliver her into the hands of her father. Chryses, said he, King Agamemnon has sent me to bring you back your child, and to offer sacrifice to Apollo on behalf of the Danaeans, that we may propitiate the god who has now brought sorrow upon the Argives. So saying, he gave the girl over to her father, who received her gladly, and they ranged the holy hecatomb all orderly round the altar of the god. They washed their hands and took up the barley meal to sprinkle over their victims, while Chryses lifted up his hands and prayed aloud on their behalf. Hear me, he cried, O god of the silver bow, that protectest Chrysa and holy Scylla, and rulest Tenedos with thy might. Even as thou didst hear me aforetime when I prayed, and didst press hardly upon the Achaeans, so hear me yet again, and stay this fearful pestilence from the Danaeans. Thus did he pray, and Apollo heard his prayer. When they had done praying and sprinkling the barley meal, they drew back the heads of the victims and killed and flayed them. They cut out the thigh bones, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, set some pieces of raw meat on the top of them, and then Chrysas laid them on the wood fire and poured wine over them, while the young men stood near him with five-pronged spits in their hands. When the thigh bones were burnt and they had tasted the inward meats, 
they cut the rest up small, put the pieces upon the spits, roasted them till they were done, and drew them off. Then, when they had finished their work, and the feast was ready, they ate it, and every man had his full share, so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, pages filled the mixing bowl with wine and water and handed it round, after giving every man his drink offering. Thus, all day long, the young men worshipped the god with song, hymning him and chaunting the joyous Paean, and the god took pleasure in their voices. But when the sun went down, and it came on dark, they laid themselves down to sleep by the stern cables of the ship, and when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared, they again set sail for the host of the Achaeans. Apollo sent them a fair wind, so they raised their mast and hoisted their white sails aloft. As the sail bellied with the wind, the ship flew through the deep blue water, and the foam hissed against her bows as she sped onward. When they reached the wide-stretching host of the Achaeans, they drew the vessel ashore, high and dry upon the sands, set her strong props beneath her, and went their ways to their own tents and ships. But Achilles abode at his ships, and nursed his anger. He went not to the honourable assembly, and sallied not forth to fight, but gnawed at his own heart pining for battle and the war-cry. Now, after twelve days, the immortal gods came back in a body to Olympus, and Jove led the way. Thetis was not unmindful of the charge her son had laid upon her, so she rose from under the sea and went through great heaven with early morning to Olympus, where she found the mighty son of Saturn sitting all alone upon its topmost ridges. She sat herself down before him, and with her left hand seized his knees, while with her right she caught him under the chin and besought him, saying, Father Jove, if I ever did you service in word or deed among the immortals, hear my prayer, and do honour to my son, whose life is to be cut short so early. King Agamemnon has dishonoured him by taking his prize and keeping her. Honour him then yourself, Olympian lord of council, and grant victory to the Trojans, till the Achaeans give my son his due, and load him with riches and requital. Jove sat for a while silent, and without word, but Thetis still kept firm hold of his knees, and besought him a second time. "'Incline your head,' said she, "'and promise me surely, or else deny me, for you have nothing to fear, that I may learn how greatly you disdain me.' At this Jove was much troubled, and answered, "'I shall have trouble if you set me quarrelling with Juno, for she will provoke me with her taunting speeches.' Even now she is always railing at me before the other gods and accusing me of giving aid to the Trojans. Go back now, lest she should find out. I will consider the matter, and will bring it about as you wish. See, I incline my head that you may believe me. This is the most solemn promise that I can give to any god. I never recall my word, or deceive, or fail to do what I say, when I have nodded my head. As he spoke, the son of Saturn bowed his dark brows, and the ambrosial locks swayed on his immortal head till vast Olympus reeled. When the pair had thus laid their plans, they parted, Jove to his house, while the goddess quitted the splendor of Olympus and plunged into the depths of the sea. The gods rose from their seats before the coming of their sire. Not one of them dared to remain sitting, but all stood up as he came among them. There, then, he took his seat. But Juno, when she saw him, knew that he and the old merman's daughter silver-footed Thetis, had been hatching mischief, so she at once began to upbraid him. "'Trickster!' she cried. "'Which of the gods have you been taking into your counsels now? You are always settling matters in secret behind my back, and have never yet told me, if you could help it, one word of your intentions.' "'Juno,' replied the sire of gods and men, "'you must not expect to be informed of all my counsels. You are my wife, but you would find it hard to understand them.' When it is proper for you to hear, there is no one, God or man, who will be told sooner. But when I mean to keep a matter to myself, you must not pry nor ask questions. Dread son of Saturn, answered Juno, what are you talking about? I? Pry and ask questions? Never. I let you have your own way in everything. Still, I have strong misgivings that the old merman's daughter Thetis has been talking you over, for she was with you and had hold of your knees this selfsame morning. I believe, therefore, that you have been promising her to give glory to Achilles and to kill much people at the ships of the Achaeans. Wife, said Jove, I can do nothing but you suspect me and find it out. 
You will take nothing by it, for I shall only dislike you the more, and it will go harder with you. Granted, that it is as you say, I mean to have it so, sit down and hold your tongue as I bid you, for if I once begin to lay my hands about you, though all heaven were on your side, it would profit you nothing. On this Juno was frightened, so she curbed her stubborn will and sat down in silence. But the heavenly beings were disquieted throughout the house of Job, till the cunning workman Vulcan began to try and pacify his mother Juno. It will be intolerable, said he, if you two fall to wrangling and setting heaven in an uproar about a pack of mortals. If such ill counsels are to prevail, we shall have no pleasure at our banquet. Let me then advise my mother, and she must herself know that it will be better, to make friends with my dear father Jove, lest he again scold her and disturb our feast. If the Olympian thunderer wants to hurl us all from our seats, he can do so, for he is far the strongest. So give him fair words, and he then will soon be in a good humour with us. As he spoke, he took a double cup of nectar, and placed it in his mother's hand. "'Cheer up, my dear mother,' said he, "'and make the best of it. I love you dearly, and should be very sorry to see you get a thrashing. However grieved I might be, I could not help, for there is no standing against Jove. Once before when I was trying to help you, he caught me by the foot and flung me from the heavenly threshold. All day long from morn till eve was I falling, till at sunset I came to ground in the island of Lemnos, and there I lay, with very little life left in me, till the Sintians came and tended me. Juno smiled at this, and as she smiled she took the cup from her son's hands. Then Vulcan drew sweet nectar from the mixing bowl, and served it round among the gods, going from left to right, and the blessed gods laughed out a loud applause as they saw him bustling about the heavenly mansion. Thus, through the livelong day, to the going down of the sun they feasted, and every one had his full share, so that all were satisfied. Apollo struck his lyre, and the muses lifted up their sweet voices, calling and answering one another. But when the sun's glorious light had faded, they went home to bed, each in his own abode, which lame Vulcan, with his consummate skill, had fashioned for them. So Jove, the Olympian lord of thunder, hied him to the bed in which he always slept, and when he had got on to it he went to sleep, with Juno of the Golden Throne by his side. End of Book One Book Two of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, Book Two. Recorded by M. L. Cohen. Jove sends a lying dream to Agamemnon, who thereon calls the chiefs in assembly and proposes to sound the mind of his army. In the end, they march to fight. Catalogue of the Achaean and Trojan Forces Now the other gods and the armed warriors on the plain slept soundly, but Jove was wakeful, for he was thinking how to do honors to Achilles, and destroyed much people at the ships of the Achaeans. In the end, he deemed it would be best to send a lying dream to King Agamemnon, so he called one to him and said, Lying dream! Go to the ships of the Achaeans, into the tent of Agamemnon, and say to him word for word as I now bid you. Tell him to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for he shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Juno has brought them to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans. The dream went when it had heard its message, and soon reached the ships of the Achaeans. It sought Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and found him in his tent wrapped in a profound slumber. It hovered over his head in the likeness of Nestor, son of Neleus, whom Agamemnon honored above all his counselors, and said, You are sleeping, son of Atreus. One who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I come as a messenger from Jove, who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you and pities you. He bids you to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided councils among the gods. 
Juno has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betide the Trojans at the hand of Jove. Remember this, and when you wake, see that it does not escape you. The dream then left him, and he thought of things that were surely not to be accomplished. He thought that on the same day he was to take the city of Priam, but he knew little what was in the mind of Jove, who had many another hard-fought fight in store alike for Danans and Trojans. Then presently he woke, with the divine message still ringing in his ears, so he sat upright and put on his soft shirt so fair and new, and over this his heavy cloak. He bound his sandals onto his comely feet and slung his silver-studded sword about his shoulders. Then he took the imperishable staff of his father and sallied forth to the ships of the Achaeans. The goddess Dawn now wended her way to vast Olympus that she might herald the day to Jove and to the other immortals, and Agamemnon sent the criers round to call the people in assembly. So they called them, and the people gathered thereon. But first he summoned a meeting of the elders at the ship of Nestor, king of Pylos, and when they were assembled, he laid a cunning counsel before them. My friends, said he, I have had a dream from heaven in the dead of night, and its face and figure resembled none but Nestor's. It hovered over my head and said, You are sleeping, son of Atreus. One who has the welfare of his host and so much other care upon his shoulders should dock his sleep. Hear me at once, for I am a messenger from Jove, who, though he be not near, yet takes thought for you and pities you. He bids you to get the Achaeans instantly under arms, for you shall take Troy. There are no longer divided counsels among the gods. Juno has brought them over to her own mind, and woe betides the Trojans at the hand of Jove. Remember this. The dream then vanished, and I awoke. Let us now, therefore, arm the sons of the Achaeans. But it will be well that I should first sound them, and to this end I will tell them to fly with their ships. But do you others go about them among the host and prevent their doing so? He then sat down, and Nestor, the prince of Pylos, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus. My friends, said he, Princes and counselors of the Argives, if any other man of the Achaeans had told us of this dream, we should have declared it false, and would have had nothing to do with it. But he who has seen it is the foremost man among us. We must therefore set about getting the people under arms. With this he led the way from the assembly, and the other sceptred kings rose with him in obedience to the word of Agamemnon. But the people pressed forward to hear. They swarmed like bees that sally from some hollow cave and flit in countless throng among the spring flowers, bunched in knots and clusters. Even so did the mighty multitude pour from ships and tents to the assembly and range themselves upon the wide-watered shore, while among them ran wildfire rumor, messenger of Jove, urging them ever to the fore. Thus they gathered in a pell-mell of mad confusion, and the earth groaned under the tramp of men as the people sought their places. Nine heralds went crying about among them to stay their tumult and build them listen to the kings, till at last they were got into their several places and ceased their clamor. Then King Agamemnon rose, holding his scepter. This was the work of Vulcan, who gave it to Jove, the son of Saturn. Jove gave it to Mercury, slayer of Argus, guide and guardian. King Mercury gave it to Pelops, the mighty charioteer, and Pelops to Atreus, shepherd of his people. Atreus, when he died, left it to Thyestes, rich in flocks, and Thyestes, in his turn, left it to be borne by Agamemnon, that he might be the lord of all Argos and of the Isles. Leaning then on his scepter, he addressed the Argives. My friends, he said, heroes, servants of Mars, the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Cruel Jove gave me his solemn promise that I should sack the city of Priam before returning, but he has played me false, and is now bidding me go ingloriously back to Argos with the loss of much people. Such is the will of Jove, who has laid many a proud city in the dust, as he will yet lay others, for his power is above all. It will be a sorry tale hereafter that an Achaean host, at once so great and valiant, battled in vain against men fewer in number than themselves, but as yet the end is not in sight. Think that the Achaeans and Trojans have sworn to a solemn covenant, and that they have each been numbered, the Trojans by the roll of their householders, and we by companies of ten. Think further that each of our companies desired to have a Trojan householder to pour out their wine. We are so much greatly more in number than full many company would have us go without the cup-bearer. 
but they have in the town allies from other places, and it is these that hinder me from being able to sack the rich city of Ilius. Nine of Jove's years are gone. The timbers of our ships have rotted. Their tackling is sound no longer. Our wives and little ones at home look anxiously for our coming. But the work that we came hither to do has not been done. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. Let us sail back to our own land, for we shall not take Troy. With these words he moved the hearts of the multitude, so many of them as knew not the cunning counsel of Agamemnon. They surged to and fro like waves of the Icarian Sea, when the east and south winds break from heaven's cloud to lash them, or as when the west wind sweeps over a field of corn and the ears bow beneath the blast. Even so were they swayed as they flew with loud cries towards the ships, and the dust from under their feet rose heavenward. They cheered each other on to draw the ships into the sea. They cleared the channels in front of them. They began taking away the stays from underneath them, and the welkin rang with their glad cry, so eager were they to return. Then surely the Argives would have returned after a fashion that was not faded. But Juno said to Minerva, Alas, daughter of a just bearing Jove, unweariable, shall the Argives fly home to their own land over the broad sea, and leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen? For whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy far from their homes? Go about at once among the host, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. Minerva was not slack to do her bidding. Down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus, and in a moment she was at the ships of the Achaeans. There she found Ulysses, peer of Jove and counsel, standing alone. He had not yet as laid a hand upon his ship, for he was grieved and sorry. So she went close up to him and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, are you going to fling yourself into your ships and be off home to your own land in this way? Will you leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, far from their homes? Go about at once among the host, and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. Ulysses knew the voice of that goddess. He flung his cloak from him and set off to run. His servant, Eurybates, a man of Ithaca, who waited on him, took charge of the cloak, whereon Ulysses went straight up to Agamemnon and received from him his ancestral and perishable staff. With this, he went about among the ships of the Achaeans. Whenever he met a king or chieftain, he stood by him and spoke fairly. Sir, said he, this flight is cowardly and unworthy. Stand to your post, and bid your people also keep their places. You do not yet know the full mind of Agamemnon. He was sounding us, and ere long will visit the Achaeans with his displeasure. We were not all of us at the council to hear what he then said. See to it, lest he be angry and do us a mischief. For the pride of kings is great, and the hand of Jove is with them. But when he came across any common man who was making a noise, he struck him with a staff and rebuked him, saying, Sirrah, hold your peace, and listen to better men than yourself. You are a coward and no soldier. You are nobody either in fight or counsel. We cannot all be kings. It is not well that there should be so many masters. One man must be supreme. One king to whom the son of scheming Saturn has given the scepter of sovereignty over you all. Thus masterfully did he go about among the host and the people hurried back to the council from their tents and ships with the sound of the thunder of surf when it comes crashing down upon the shore, and all the sea is in an uproar. The rest now took their seats, and kept to their own several places, but Thersites still went on wagging his unbridled tongue. A man of many words, and those unseemly, a monger of sedition, a railer against all who were in authority, who cared not what he said, so that he might set the Achaeans in a laugh. He was the ugliest man of all those that came before Troy, bandy-legged, lame of one foot, with his two shoulders rounded and hunched over his chest. His head ran up to a point, but there was little hair on top of it. Achilles and Ulysses hated him worst of all, for it was with them that he was most wont to wrangle. Now, however, with a squill, squeaky voice, he began heaping his abuse on Agamemnon. The Achaeans were angry and disgusted, yet nonetheless he kept on brawling and bawling at the son of Atreus. Agamemnon, he cried, what ails you now, and what more do you want? 
Your tents are filled with bronze and with fair women, for whenever we take the town we give you the pick of them. Would you have yet more gold, which some Trojan is to give you as ransom for his son when I or another Achaean has taken him prisoner? Or is it some young girl to hide and lie with? It is not well that you, the ruler of the Achaeans, should bring them into such misery. Weakling cowards, women rather than men, let us sail home and leave this fellow here at Troy to stew in his own meads of honor, and discover whether we were any service to him or no. Achilles is a much better man than he is, and see how he has treated him, robbing him of his prize and keeping it to himself. Achilles takes it meekly and shows no fight. If he did, son of Atreus, you would never again insult him. Thus railed Thersites, but Ulysses at once went up to him and rebuked him sternly. Check your glib tongue, Thersites, said to be, and babble not a word further. Chide not with princes when you have none to back you. There is no viler creature come before Troy with the son of Atreus. Drop this chatter about kings, and neither revile them, nor keep harping about going home. We do not yet know how things are going to be, nor whether the Achaeans are to return with good success or evil. How dare you jibe at Agamemnon because the Danans have awarded him so many prizes? I tell you, therefore, and it shall surely be, that if I again catch you talking such nonsense, I will either forfeit my own head and be called no more father of Telemachus, or I will take you, strip you stark naked, and whip you out of the assembly till you go blubbering back to the ships. On this he beat him with his staff about the back and shoulders till he dropped and fell a-weeping. The golden scepter raised the bloody wheel on his back, so he sat down frightened and in pain, looking foolish as he wiped the tears from his eyes. The people were sorry for him, yet they laughed heartily, and one would turn to his neighbor, saying, Ulysses has done many a good thing ere now in fight and counsel, but he never did the Argives a better turn than when he stopped this fellow a mouth from prattling further. He will give the kings no more of his insolence. Thus said the people. Then Ulysses rose, scepter in hand, and Minerva in the likeness of a herald bade the people be still, that those who were far off might hear him and consider his counsel. He therefore, with all sincerity and goodwill, addressed them thus, King Agamemnon, the Achaeans are for making you a byword among all mankind. They forget the promise they made you when they set out from Argos, that you should not return till you had sacked the town of Troy, and, like children or widowed women, they murmur and would set off homeward. True, it is that they have had toil enough to be disheartened. A man chafes at having to stay away from his wife either for a single month, when he's on shipboard, at the mercy of wind and sea. But now it is nine long years that we have been kept here. I cannot therefore blame the Achaeans if they turn restive. Still, we shall be shamed if we go home empty after so long a stay. Therefore, my friends, be patient yet a little longer that we may learn whether the prophecyings of Calchas were false or true. All who have not since Paris must remember as though it were yesterday or the day before how the ships of the Achaeans were destined in Aulis while we are on our way hither to make war on Priam and the Trojans. We were ranged about a fountain offering hecatombs to the gods upon their holy altars, and there was a fine plane tree from beneath where would well the stream of pure water. Then we saw a prodigy, for Jove sent a fearful serpent out of the ground with blood rent stains upon his back, and it darted from under the altar onto the plane tree. Now there was a brood of young sparrows, quite small upon the topmost bough, peeping out from under the leaves, eight in all, and their mother that hatched made them nine. The serpent ate the poor cheeping things while the old bird flew about lamenting her little ones, but the serpent threw his coils about her and caught her by the wing as she was screaming. Then, when he had eaten both the sparrow and her young, the god who had sent him made him become a sign, for the son of scheming Saturn turned him into stone, and we stood wondering at that which had come to pass. Seeing, then, that such a fearful potent had broken upon our hecatombs, Calchas forthwith declared to us the oracles of heaven. Why, Achaeans, said he, are you thus speechless? Jove has sent us this sign, long in coming and long ere it be fulfilled, though its fame shall last for ever. As the serpent ate the eight fledglings and the sparrow that hatched them, which makes nine, so shall we fight nine years at Troy, but in the tenth shall take the town. This was what he said, and now it is all coming true. Stay here, therefore, all of you, till we take the city of Priam. On this the Argive raised a shout till the ships rang again with the uproar. Nestor, knight of Gerene, then addressed them. 
"'Shame on you,' he cried, "'to stay here talking like children "'when you should fight like men. "'Where are our covenants now "'and where are the oaths that we have taken? "'Shall our counsels be flung into the fire "'with our drink offerings "'at the right hands of fellowships "'wherein we are put our trust? "'We waste our time in words, "'and for all our talking here "'shall be no further forward. "'Stand, therefore, son of Atreus, "'by your own steadfast purpose. "'Lead the Argives on to battle "'and leave this handful of men to rot, "'who scheme and scheme in vain "'to get back to Argos "'ere they have learned "'whether Jub be true or liar.' For the mighty son of Saturn surely promised that we should succeed, and when we Argives set sail to bring death and destruction upon the Trojans, he showed us favorable signs by flashing his lightning on our right hands. Therefore, let none make haste to go till he has first lain with the wife of some Trojan, and avenge the toil and sorrow that he has suffered for the sake of Helen. Nevertheless, if any man is in such haste to be at home again, let him lay his hand to his ship that he may meet his doom in the sight of all. But, O king, consider and give ear to my counsel, for the word that I say may not be neglected lightly. Divide your men, Agamemnon, into their several tribes and clans, that clans and tribes may stand by and help one another. If you do this, and if the Achaeans obey you, you will find out who, both chiefs and people, are brave, and who are cowards, for they will vie against the other. Thus you shall also learn whether it is through the counsel of heaven, or the cowardice of man, that you shall fail to take the town. And Agamemnon answered, Nestor, you have again outdone the sons of the Achaeans in council. Would by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo that I had among them ten more such counselors, for the city of King Priam would then soon fall beneath our hands, and we should sack it. But the son of Saturn afflicts me with bootless wranglings and strife. Achilles and I are quarreling about this girl, in which matter I was the first to offend. If we can be of one mind again, the Trojans will not stave off destruction for a day. Now, therefore, get your morning meal, that our host join us in fight. Wet well your spears, see well to the ordering of your shields, give good feeds to your horses, and look your chariots carefully over, that we may do battle the live-long day, for we shall have no rest, not for a moment, till night falls to part us. The bands that bear your shields shall be wet with the sweat upon your shoulders, your hands shall be weary upon your spears, your horses shall steam in front of your chariots, and if I see any man shirking the fight, or trying to keep out of it at ships, there shall be no help for him, but he shall be prey to dogs and vultures. Thus he spoke, and the Achaeans roared applause. As when the waves run high before the blast of the south wind, and break on some lofty headland, dashing against it and buffeting without ceasing, as the storms from every quarter drive them, even so did the Achaeans rise and hurry in all directions to their ships. Then they lighted their fires at their tents and got dinner, offering sacrifice every man to one or other of the gods and praying each one of them that he might live to come out of the fight. Agamemnon, king of men, sacrificed a fat five-year-old bull to the mighty son of Saturn and invited the princes and elders of his host. First he asked Nestor and king Idomeneus, then the two Ajaxes, and the son of Tydes, and sixthly Ulysses, peer of gods in council. But Menelaus came of his own accord, for he knew how busy his brother was then. They stood round the bull with the barley meal in their hands, and Agamemnon prayed, saying, Jove, most glorious, supreme, that dwellest in heaven, and ridest upon the storm cloud, grant that the sun may not go down, nor the night fall, till the palace of Priam is laid low, and its gates are consumed with fire." Grant that my sword may pierce the shirt of Hector about his heart, and that full many of his comrades may bite the dust as they fall dying round him. Thus he prayed, but the son of Saturn would not fulfill his prayer. He accepted the sacrifice, yet none the less increased their toil continually. When they had done praying and sprinkling the barley meal upon the victim, they drew back its head, killed it, and then flayed it. They cut out the thigh bones, wrapped them round in two layers of fat, and set pieces of raw meat on top of them. These they burned upon the split logs of firewood, but they spitted the inward meats and held them to the flame to cook. When the thigh bones were burned and they had tasted the inward meats, they cut the rest up small, put the pieces upon the spits, roasted them till they were done, and drew them off. Then, when they had finished their work and the feast was ready, they ate of it, and every man had his full share so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Nestor, knight of Gerene, began to speak. King Agamemnon, said he, let us not stay talking here, nor be slack in the work that heaven has put into our hands. 
Let the heralds summon the people to gather at their several ships. We will then go about among the host that we may begin fighting at once. Thus did he speak, and Agamemnon heeded his words. He at once sent the criers round to call the people in assembly. So they called them, and the people gathered thereon. The chiefs about the son of Atreus chose their men and marshaled them, while Minerva went among them, holding her priceless aegis that knows neither age nor death. From it there waved a hundred tassels of pure gold, all deftly woven, and each one of them worth a hundred oxen. With this she darted furiously everywhere among the host of the Achaeans, urging them forward and putting courage into the heart of each, though they might fight and do battle without ceasing. Thus war became sweeter in their eyes even than returning home in their ships. As when some great forest fire is raging upon a mountain top and its light is seen afar, even so as they marched the gleam of their armor flashed up the firmament of heaven. They were like great flocks of geese or cranes or swans on the plain about the waters of Caister that winged their way hither and thither, glorying in the pride of flight and crying as they settled to the fen is alive with their screaming. Even thus did the tribes pour from the ships and tents on the plan of Scamander, and the ground rang as brass under the feet of men and horses. They stood as thick upon the flower-bespangled field as leaves that bloom in summer. As countless swarms of flies buzz round a herdsman homestead in the time of spring when pails are drenched with milk, even so did the Achaeans swarm on to plain to charge the Trojans and destroy them. The chiefs disposed their men this way and that before the fight began, drafting them out as easily as goat herds draft their flocks when they have got mixed while feeding. And among them when King Agamemnon, with a head and face like Jove the Lord of Thunder, a waist like Mars and a chest like that of Neptune. As some great bull that lords it over the herds upon the plain, even so did Jove make the son of Atreus down peerless among the multitude of heroes. And now, O muses, dwellers in the mansions of Olympus, tell me, for you are the goddesses and are all places so that you see all things, while we know nothing but by report. Who were the chiefs and princes of the Danans? As for the common soldiers, they were so that I could not name every single one of them, though I had ten tongues, and though my voice failed not and my heart were bronze within me, unless you, O Olympian muses, daughters of the Aegis-bearing Jove, were to recount them to me. Nevertheless, I will tell the captains of the ships and all the fleet together. Penelos, Laetes, Arcaselius, Prothonor, and Clonius were the captains of the Bothians. These were they that dwelt in Hyria and Rocky Aulis, who held Shonus, Scolus, and the highlands of Etonius, with Thespia, Greia, and the fair city of Mycalasus. They also held Harma, Elysium, and Erythrae, and they had Elion, Hyle, and Pition, Ocelia, and the strong fortress of Medion, Copia, Eutresis, and Thisbe, the haunt of doves. Coronia, and the pastures of Haliartus, Platea, and Glissus, the fortress of Thebes the Less, Holy on Kestis with his famous groan of Neptune, Arnian rich in vineyards, Medea sacred Nisa, and Anthedon upon the sea. From these came the fifty ships, and in each there were a hundred and twenty young men of the Bothians. Ascalaphus and Ialmus, son of Mars, led the people that dwell in Esplendon and Orchomenus, the realm of Minus. Astiochi, a noble maiden, bore them in the house of Actor, son of Asius, for she had gone with Mars secretly into an upper chamber, and he had lain with her. With these there came thirty ships. The Phocians were led of Saedus and Epistrophus, son of Mudiaphetus, the son of Nabulus. These were those that truly held Cyparissus, Rocky Pytho, Holy Chrysa, Daulis, and Panopius. They also that dwelt in Anamora and Hyampolis and about the waters of the river Cephasus and Lalea by the springs of Cephasus. With their chieftains came forty ships, and they marshaled the forces of the Phocians, which were stationed next to the Boeotians on their left. Ajax, the fleet son of Oileus, commanded the Locrians. He was not so great, nor nearly so great, as Ajax the son of Telamon. He was a little man, and his breastplate was made of linen. But in use of the spear he excelled all the Hellenes and the Achaeans. These dwelt in Sinus, Opius, Calarius, Bessus, Scarfe, Fair Algiae, Tarfe, and Thronium about the river Bogrius. With him there came forty ships of the Locrians who dwelt beyond Euboea. The fierce Abantes held Euboea with its cities, Chalcis, Eritrea, Histea, rich in vines, Cerinthes upon the rock and the rock perched town of Diam. With them were also men of Charistus and Styra. 
Elephinir of the race of Mars was his command of these. He was son of Chalcodon and chief over all the Abantes. With him they came, fleet of foot and wearing their hair long behind, brave warriors who would ever strive to tear open the corslets of their foes with their long ashen spears. Of these there came fifty ships. And they that held the strong city of Athens, the people of great Erechtheus, who were born of the soil itself but Jove's daughter, Minerva fostered him and established him at Athens in her own rich sanctuary. There, year by year, the Athenian youths worshipped him with sacrifices of bulls and rams. These were commanded by Menestheus, son of Pedios. No man living could equal him in marshalling of chariots and foot soldiers. Nestor could alone rival him, for he was older. With him there came fifty ships. Ajax bought twelve ships from Salamis and stationed them alongside those of the Athenians. The men of Argos, again, and those who held the wall of Tyrenes with Hermione and a sign upon the gulf, Trozene, Iliane, and the vineyard lands of Epidaurus the Achaean youths, moreover, who came from Aegina and Masses, these were led by Diomed of the law of bottle cry, and Stenisthenes, son fame of Capaneus. With them in command was Euralius, son of King Mesides, son of Talus, but Diomed was chief over them all. With these there came eighty ships. Those who held the strong city of Mycenae, rich Corinth and Cleonthe, Ornea, Arathea, and Lycion, where Adrastus reigned of old, Hyperesia, Hygonessa, and Pellene, Aegeum and all the coastland round about the Hellas, these sent a hundred ships under the command of King Agamemnon, son of Atreus. His force was far both finest and most numerous, and in their midst was the king himself all glorious in his armor of gleaming bronze, foremost among the heroes, for he was the greatest king, and had the most men under him. And those that dwelt in Lacedaemon, lying low among the hills, Pharis, Sparta with Messi, the haunt of doves, Brysiae, Augiae, Amicle, and Helos upon the sea, Laius, moreover, and Odalus, these were led by Menelaus of the loud battle cry, brother to Agamemnon, and of them there were sixty ships drawn apart from the others. Among them went Menelaus himself, strong in zeal, urging his men to fight, for he longed to avenge the toil and sorrow that he had suffered for the sake of Helen. The men of Pylos and Arene and Thurium were at the ford of the river Alpheus, strong Ap, Cyperesis, and Amphigenea. Telium, Helos, and Dorium, where the muses met Thrymius, and stilled as minstrelly for ever. He was returning from Ocalalia, where Eutrius lived, and reigned and boasted that he would surpass even the muses, daughters of a just-bearing Jove, if they should sing against him, whereon they were angry and maimed him. They robbed him of his divine power of song, and thenceforth he could strike the lyre no more. These were commanded by Nestor, knight of Gerene, and with him there came ninety ships. And those that held Arcadia, under the high mountain of Silene near the tomb of Aeptus, where the people fight hand to hand, the men of Phineas also, and Orchomenus rich in flocks, of Ripe Stridae, the bleak of Anispa, of Tagia and fair Mantinea, of Stymphialus and Parhasa, of these King Agepnor, son of Anseus, was commander, and they had sixty ships. Many Arcadians, good soldiers, came in each one of them, but Agamemnon found them the ships in which to cross the sea, for they were not a people that occupied their business upon the waters. The men, moreover, of Euprasium and of Elis, so much of it is enclosed between Hermene and Myrcenus upon the seashore, the rock of Olene and Elysium. These had four leaders, and each of them had ten ships, with many Apeans on board. Their captains were Amphimarchus and Thelipius, the one son of Cetaceus and the other of Eurytus, both of the race of Actor. The two others were Diorus, son of Amarynces, and Polyxenus, son of King Agasthenes, son of Augeus. And those of Dulcium were the sacred Achaean islands who dwelt beneath the sea off Elis. These were led by Megis, peer of Mars, and the son of valiant Phileus, dear to Jove, who quarreled with his father and went to settle in Dulcurium. With him there came forty ships. Ulysses led the brave Cephalanians who held Ithaca, Neridum with his forest, Crocalia, rugged Egyptus, Samos, and Zacnius, with the mainland also that was over against the islands. These were led by Ulysses, peer of Jove and council, and with them there came twelve ships. Thoas, son of Andramion, commanded the Aetolians, who dwelled in Pleuron only as Pylene, Chalcis by the sea, and rocky Calydon, for the great king Onius had now no sons living, and was himself dead, as was also the golden-haired Melager, who had been sent over the Aetolians to be their king. And with Thoas there came forty ships. The famous spearsman Idomeneus led the Cretans, who held Croesus. 
and the well-walled city of Gordus, Lytus also, Miletus and Lycastus that lies upon the chalk, the populous town of Phaestus and Rhydium, with all the other peoples that dwell in the hundred cities of Crete. All these were led by Idomeneus and by Merionis, peer of murderous Mars, and with these there came eighty ships. Tlepolemus, son of Hercules, a man both brave and large of stature, bought nine ships of lordly warriors from Rhodes. These dwelt in Rhodes, which is divided among the three cities of Lindus, Aeusius, and Camerinus, that lie upon the chalk. These were commanded by Tlepolemus, son of Hercules by Astiochia, whom he had carried off from Ephyria on the river Celius after sacking many cities of valiant warriors. When Tlepolemus grew up, he killed his father's uncle Lysimenius, who had been a famous warrior in his time, but was then grown old. On this he built himself a fleet, gathered the great following, and fled beyond the sea, for he was menaced by the other sons and grandsons of Hercules. After a voyage during which he suffered great hardship, he came to Rhodes, where the people divided into three communities according to their tribes, and were dearly loved by Jove, the lord of gods and men. Wherefore the son of Saturn showered down great riches upon them. And Nereus bought three ships from Syme. Nereus, who was the handsomest man that came up under Ilius of all the Danans after the son of Peleus, but he was a man of no substance, and had but a small following. And those that held Nisiris, Crapathus, and Cassus with cost, the city of Eurypolis, and the Chaldinian islands, these were commanded by Phidippus and Antiphus, two sons of King Thessalus, the son of Hercules. And with them there came thirty ships. Those again who held Pelagasic, Argos, Alos, Alopi, and Trachus, and those of Phythiath and Hellas, the land of fair women, who were called the Myrmidons, Hellenes, and Achaeans, these had fifty ships, over which Achilles was in command. But now they took no part in the war, inasmuch as there was no one to marshal them. For Achilles stayed by his ships, furious about the loss of the girl Briseis, whom he had taken from Lernesis at his own great peril, when he had sacked Lernesis and Thebe and had overthrown Minus and Epiphistrophus, son of King Evanor, son of Selipus. For her sake Achilles was still grieving, but ere long he was again to join them. And those that held Flace in the flowery meadows of Persiris, sanctuary of Ceres, Iton, the mother of sleep, Antrum upon the sea, and Tilium that lies upon the grasslands, of these brave Protesilius had been captain while he was yet alive, but he was now lying under the earth. He had left the wife behind him in Phylace to tear her cheeks in sorrow, and his house was only half finished, for he was slain by a Dardanian warrior while leaping foremost of the Achaeans upon the soil of Troy. Still, Though his people mourned their chieftain, they were not without a leader, for Podorices, the race of Mars, marshaled them. He was son of Iphiclus, rich in sheep, who was the son of Phylaxius, and he was own brother to Protesilius, only younger, Protesilius being at once the elder and more valiant. So the people were not without a leader, though they mourned him whom they had lost. With him there came forty ships. And those that held Fury by the Bobian Lank, with Bobi, Glaphyria, and the populous city of Iolcus, those with their eleven ships were led by Eumelius, son of Adametius, with Alcestes bore to him, loveliest of the daughters of Peleus. And those that held Methone and Thaumatia, with Melobia and rugged Olazon, these were led by the skillful archer Philoctetes, and they had seven ships, each with fifty oarsmen, all of them good archers, but Philoctetes was lying in great pain in the island of Lemnos, where the sons of the Achaeans left him for he had been bitten by a poisonous water snake. There he lay, sick and sorry, and full soon did the Argives come to miss him. But his people, though they felt his loss, were not leaderless, for Medon, the bastard son of Oileus by rain, set them in array. Those again, of Tricca and the stony region of Ithome, and they that held Ocalius, the city of Ocalian Eurythus, these were commanded by the two sons of Asclepius, skilled in the art of healing. Podalirius and Machion, and with them came thirty ships. The men, moreover, of Ormenius, and by the fountain of Hyperia, with those that held Asterius and the white crest of Titanus, these were led by Eurypolis, the son of Eumaeon, and with them there came forty ships. Those that held Agrissa and Gytone, or Theolone, the whelp city of Ulysan, of those brave Pelopodes was the leader. He was the son of Perithius, who was the son of Jove himself, for Hippodamia bore him to Perithius on the day when he took his revenge on the shaggy mountain savages and drove them from Mount Peleon to the Ianthes. 
But Polypedius was not sole in command, for with him was Leontius of the race of Mars, who was son of Coronis, the son of Canius, and with these there came forty ships. Gunaeus bought two and twenty ships from Cyphus, and he was followed by the Munaeus and the valiant Parabi, who dwelt about the wintry Dodona, and held the lands round the lovely river of Titarius, which sends its waters into the Peneus. They do not mingle with the silver eddies of the Peneus, but flow on top of them like oil. For the Tartaresius is a branch of dread Orcus and of the river Styx. Of the Magnetes, Prothus, son of Tethrodon, was commander. They were they that dwelt about the river Peneus and Mount Pelion. Prothos, fleet of foot, was their leader, and with them there came forty ships. Such were the chiefs and princes of the Danans, who then, O Muse, was the foremost, whether man or horse, among those that followed after the sons of Atreus. Of the horses, those of the son of fairies were by far the finest. They were driven by Eumelus and were fleet as birds. They were the same age and color and perfectly matched in height. Apollo of the silver bow had bred them in Perea, both of them mares and terrible as Mars in battle. Of men, Ajax, son of Telamon, was much the foremost, so long as Achilles' anger lasted, for Achilles excelled him greatly when he also had better horses. But Achilles was now holding aloof at his ships by reason of his quarrel with Agamemnon, and his people passed their time upon the seashore, throwing discs or aiming with spears at Mark, and in archery. Their horses stood each by his own chariot, champing lotus and wild celery. The chariots were housed under cover, but their owners, for lack of leadership, wandered hither and thither about the host, and went not forth to fight. Thus marched the host like a consuming fire, and the earth groaned beneath them when the lord of thunder is angry and lashes about the land of Typhoeus among the Arimi, where they say Typhoeus lies. Even so did the earth groan beneath them as they sped over the plain. And now Iris, fleet as the wind, was sent by Jove to tell the bad news among the Trojans. They were gathered in assembly, old and young, at Priam's gates, and Iris came close up to Priam, speaking with the voice of Priam's son Polites, who, being fleet of foot, was stationed as watchman for the Trojans on the tome of old Aestes, to look out for any sally of the Achaeans. In his likeness, Iris spoke, saying, Old man, you talk idly, as in times of peace, while war is at hand. I have been in many a battle, but never yet saw such a host as is now advancing. They are crossing the plain to attack the city as thick as leaves or as the sands of the sea. Hector, I charge you above all, others, do as I say. There are many allies dispersed about the city of Priam from distant places and speaking diverse tongues. Therefore, let each chief give orders to his own people, setting them severally in array and leading them forth to battle. Thus she spoke. But Hector knew that it was the goddess, and at once broke up the assembly. The men flew to arms, all the gates were open, and the people thronged through them, horse and foot, with a tramp as of a great multitude. Now there is a high mound before the city, rising by itself upon the plain. Men called it Bataia, but the gods know that it is the tomb of Lyth Myrnene. Here the Trojans and their allies divided their forces. Priam's son, great Hector of the gleaming helmet, commanded the Trojans, and with him were arrayed by far the greatest number and most valiant of those who were longing for the fray. The Dardanians were led by brave Aeneas, whom Venus bore to Anchises when she, goddess though she was, had lain with him upon the mountain slopes of Ida. He was not alone, for with him were the two sons of Antenor, Acacolochus and Acamas, both skilled in the arts of war. They that dwelt in Telia under the lowest spurs of Mount Ida, men of substance who drank the limpid waters of Asippus, and are of Trojan blood. These were led by Pandarus, son of Lycaon, whom Apollo had taught to use the bow. They that held Adrastea at the land of Apicius with Pytidia in the high mountain of Terea, these were led by Adrestus and Amphius, whose breastplate was of linen. These were the sons of Merops of Percote, who excelled in all kinds of divination. He told them not to take part in the war, but they gave him no heed, for fate lured them to destruction. They that dwelt about Percote and Practius with Cestos, Albidos, and Arispe, these were led by Asius, son of Hercticus, a brave commander. Asius, the son of Hercticus, whom his powerful dark bay steeds of the breed that comes from the river Celius had brought from Arisbe. Hippothos led the tribes of Pelagzi and Spearmen 
who dwelt in fertile Larissa, Hippothos and Pileus of the race of Mars, two sons of Pelasgian and Lethus, son of Teutimus. Acamas and the warriors Pyrrhus commanded the Thracians and those that came from beyond the mighty stream of the Hellespont. Euphemus, son of Troesius, the son of Ceos, was captain of the Ceronium spearmen. Pyrachemes led the Paeonian archers from distant Amidon by the broad waters of the river Axius, the fairest that flow upon the earth. The Palphagonians were commanded by stout-hearted Pylemaeus from Ente, where the mules run wild in herds. These were they that held Cytorus in the country road round Sesamus, with the cities by the river Parthenius, Cromna, Aegilus, and lofty Erythini. Odius and Epistrophus were captains over the Halzoni from distant Alibi, where there are mines of silver. Chromus and Enimus, the augur, led the Mycians, but his skill in augury availed him not to save him for destruction, for he fell by the hand of the fleet descendant of Achaeus in the river, where he slew other of the Trojans. Phorcys, again, and noble Ascanius led the Phrygians from the far country of Ascania, and both were eager for the fray. Mesthes and Antiphus commanded the Meonians, son of Talamenes, born to him of the Gideon Lake. These led the Meonians, who dwelt under Mount Tmolus. Nastes led the Carians, men of strange speech. These held Miletus in the wooded mountain of Phytheres, with the water in the river Melander and the lofty crest of Mount Mycali. These were commanded by Nastes and Amphimachus, brave son of Nomion. He came into the fight with gold about him like a girl, fool that he was. His gold was no avail to save him for he fell in the river by the hand of the fleet descendant of Achaeus, and Achilles bore away his gold. Sarpedon and Glaucus led the Lycians from their distant land by the eddying waters of Xanthus. End of Book Two. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio. www.mojomove411.com This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer in Samuel Butler's translation. Book 3. Alexandrus, also called Paris, challenges Menelaus. Helen and Priam view the Achaeans from the wall. The Covenant. Paris and Menelaus fight, and Paris is worsted. Venus carries him off to save him. Scene between him and Helen. When the companies were thus arrayed, each under its own captain, the Trojans advanced as a flight of wildfowl or cranes that scream overhead when rain and winter drive them over the flowing waters of Oceanus to bring death and destruction on the pygmies and they wrangle in the air as they fly, but the Achaeans march silently, in high heart, and minded to stand by one another. As when the south wind spreads a curtain of mist upon the mountain tops, bad for shepherds, but better than night for thieves, and a man can see no further than he can throw a stone, even so rose the dust from under their feet as they made all speed over the plain. When they were close up with one another, Alexandrus came forward as champion on the Trojan side. On his shoulders he bore the skin of a panther, his bow and his sword, and he brandished two spears shod with bronze, as a challenge to the bravest of the Achaeans to meet him in single fight. Menelaus saw him thus stride out before the ranks, and was glad as a hungry lion that lights on the carcass of some goat or horned stag, and devours it there and then, though dogs and youths set upon him. Even thus was Menelaus glad when his eyes caught sight of Alexandrus, for he deemed that now he should be revenged. He sprang, therefore, from his chariot, clad in his suit of armour. Alexandrus quailed as he saw Menelaus come forward, and shrank in fear of his life under cover of his men, as one who starts back affrighted, trembling and pale, when he comes suddenly upon a serpent in some mountain glade. Even so did Alexandrus plunge into the throng of Trojan warriors, terror-stricken at the sight of the son of Atreus. Then Hector upbraided him, 
Paris, said he, evil-hearted Paris, fair to see, but woman-mad and false of tongue, would that you had never been born, or that you had died unwed, better so than live to be disgraced and look to scance at. Will not the Achaeans mock at us and say that we have sent one to champion us who is fair to see, but who has neither wit nor courage? Did you not, such as you are, get your following together and sail beyond the seas? Did you not, from a far country, carry off a lovely woman, wedded among a people of warriors, to bring sorrow upon your father, your city, and your whole country, but joy to your enemies, and hang-dog shamefacedness to yourself? And now can you not dare face Menelaus and learn what manner of man he is, whose wife you have stolen? Where indeed would be your lyre and your love-tricks, your comely locks and your fair favour when you were lying in the dust before him? The Trojans are a weak-kneed people, or ere this you would have had a shirt of stones for the wrongs you have done them. And Alexandrus answered, Hector, your rebuke is just. You are hard as the axe which a shipwright wields at his work, and cleaves the timber to his liking. As the axe in his hand, so keen is the edge of your scorn. Still taunt me not with the gifts that golden Venus has given me. They are precious. Let not a man disdain them, for the gods give them where they are minded, and none can have them for the asking. If you would have me do battle with Menelaus, bid the Trojans and Achaeans take their seats, while he and I fight in their midst for Helen and all her wealth. Let him who shall be victorious, and prove to be the better man, take the woman and all she has, to bear them to his home. But let the rest swear a solemn covenant of peace, whereby you Trojans shall stay here in Troy, while the others go home to Argus, and the land of the Achaeans. When Hector heard this he was glad, and went about among the Trojan ranks, holding his spear by the middle to keep them back, and they all sat down at his bidding but the Achaeans still aimed at him with stones and arrows, till Agamemnon shouted to them, saying, Hold, Argives, shoot not, sons of the Achaeans. Hector desires to speak. They ceased taking aim, and were still, whereon Hector spoke. Hear from my mouth, said he, Trojans and Achaeans, the saying of Alexandrus, through whom this quarrel has come about. He bids the Trojans and Achaeans lay their armour upon the ground, while he and Menelaus fight in the midst of you for Helen and all her wealth. Let him who shall be victorious and prove to be the better man take the woman and all she has, to bear them to his own home, but let the rest swear to a solemn covenant of peace. Thus he spoke, and they all held their peace till Menelaus of the loud battle cry addressed them. And now, he said, hear me too, for it is I who am the most aggrieved. I deem that the parting of Achaeans and Trojans is at hand, as well it may be, seeing how much they have suffered for my quarrel with Alexandrus and the wrong he did me. Let him who shall die, die, and let the others fight no more. Bring then two lambs, a white ram and a black ewe, for earth and sun, and we will bring a third for Jove. Moreover, you shall bid Priam come, that he may swear to the covenant himself, for his sons are high-handed and ill to trust and the oaths of Jove must not be transgressed or taken in vain. Young men's minds are light as air, but when an old man comes he looks before and after, deeming that which shall be the fairest upon both sides. The Trojans and Achaeans were glad when they heard this, for they thought that they should now have rest. They backed their chariots toward the ranks, got out of them, and put off their armour, laying it down upon the ground, and the hosts were near to one another with a little space between them. Hector sent two messengers to the city to bring the lambs and to bid Priam come, while Agamemnon told Talthybius to fetch the other lamb from the ships, and he did as Agamemnon had said. Meanwhile Iris went to Helen in the form of her sister-in-law, wife of the son of Antina, for Helicion, son of Antina, had married Laodice, the fairest of Priam's daughters. She found her in her own room, working at a great web of purple linen, on which she was embroidering the battles between Trojans and Achaeans, that Mars had made them fight for her sake. Iris then came close up to her and said, Come hither, child, and see the strange doings of the Trojans and Achaeans. Till now they have been warring upon the plain, mad with lust of battle. But now they have left off fighting and are leaning upon their shields, sitting still with their spears planted besides them. 
Alexandrus and Menelaus are going to fight about yourself, and you are to be the wife of him who is the victor. Thus spoke the goddess, and Helen's heart yearned after her former husband, her city, and her parents. She threw a white mantle over her head and hurried from the room, weeping as she went, not alone, but attended by two of her handmaids, Aethrae, daughter of Pythaeus, and Clymene, and straightway they were at the Scian gates. The two sages, Ucalegon and Antinor, elders of the people, were seated by the Scian gates, with Priam, Panthous, Thymoetes, Lampus, Clytius, and Hicataion of the race of Mars. These were too old to fight, but they were fluent orators, and sat on the tower like cicadas that chirrup delicately from the boughs of some high tree in the wood. When they saw Helen coming towards the tower, they said softly to one another, Small wonder that Trojans and Achaeans should endure so much and so long for the sake of a woman so marvellously and divinely lovely. Still, fair though she be, let them take her and go, or she will breed sorrow for us and for our children after us. But Priam bade her draw nigh. My child, said he, take your seat in front of me, that you may see your former husband, your kinsmen, and your friends. I lay no blame upon you. It is the gods, not you, who are to blame. It is they that have brought about this terrible war with the Achaeans. Tell me, then, who is yonder huge hero so great and goodly? I have seen men taller by a head, but none so comely and so royal. Surely he must be a king. Sir, answered Helen, father of my husband, dear and reverend in my eyes, would that I had chosen death rather than to have come here with your son, far from my bridal chamber, my friends, my darling daughter, and all the companions of my girlhood. But it was not to be, and my lot is one of tears and sorrow. As for your question, the hero of whom you ask is Agamemnon, son of Atreus, a good king and a brave soldier, brother-in-law as surely as that he lives, to my abhorred and miserable self. The old man marvelled at him and said, Happy son of Atreus, child of good fortune, I see that the Achaeans are subject to you in great multitudes. When I was in Phrygia I saw much horsemen, the people of Otreus and Migdon, who were camping upon the banks of the river Sangarius. I was their ally, and with them, when the Amazons, peers of men, came up against them, but even they were not so many as the Achaeans. The old man next looked upon Ulysses. Tell me, he said, who is that other, shorter by head than Agamemnon, but broader across the chest and shoulders? His armour is laid upon the ground, and he stalks in front of the ranks as if it were some great woolly ram ordering his ewes. And Helen answered, He is Ulysses, a man of great craft, son of Laertes. He was born in rugged Ithaca, and excels in all manner of stratagems and subtle cunning. On this Antina said, Madam, you have spoken truly. Ulysses once came here as an envoy about yourself and Menelaus with him. I received them in my own house, and therefore know both of them by sight and conversation. When they stood up in the presence of the assembled Trojans, Menelaus was the broader shouldered, but when both were seated, Ulysses had the more royal presence. After a time they delivered their message, and the speech of Menelaus ran trippingly on the tongue. He did not say much, for he was a man of few words, but he spoke very clearly and to the point, though he was the younger man of the two. Ulysses, on the other hand, when he rose to speak, was at first silent, and kept his eyes fixed upon the ground. There was no play nor graceful movement of his sceptre. He kept it straight and stiff like a man unpractised in oratory. One might have taken him for a mere churl or simpleton, but when he raised his voice and the words came driving from his deep chest like winter snow before the wind, then there was none to touch him, and no man thought further of what he looked like. Priam then caught sight of Ajax and asked, Who is that great and goodly warrior whose head and broad shoulders tower above the rest of the Argives? That, answered Helen, is huge Ajax, bulwark of the Achaeans, and on the other side of him, among the Cretans, stands Idomeneus, looking like a god, and with the captains of the Cretans round him. Often did Menelaus receive him as a guest in our house, when he came visiting us from Crete. I see, moreover, many other Achaeans, whose names I could tell you, 
but there are two whom I can nowhere find, Castor, breaker of horses, and Pollux, the mighty boxer. They are children of my mother, and own brothers to myself. Either they have not left Lacedaemon, or else, though they have brought their ships, they will not show themselves in battle for the shame and disgrace that I have brought upon them. She knew not that both these heroes were already lying under the earth in their own land of Lacedaemon. Meanwhile the heralds were bringing the holy oath offerings through the city, two lambs and a goatskin of wine, the gift of earth, and Ideas brought the mixing bowl and the cups of gold. He went up to Priam and said, Son of Laomedon, the princes of the Trojans and Achaeans bid you come down onto the plain and swear to a solemn covenant. Alexandrus and Menelaus are to fight for Helen in single combat, that she and all her wealth may go with him who is the victor. We are to swear to a solemn covenant of peace, whereby we others shall dwell here in Troy, while the Achaeans return to Argos and the land of the Achaeans. The old man trembled as he heard, but bade his followers yoke the horses, and they made all haste to do so. He mounted the chariot, gathered the reins in his hand, and Antina took his seat beside him. They then drove through the Scian gates onto the plain. When they reached the ranks of the Trojans and Achaeans, they left the chariot, and with measured pace advanced into the space between the hosts. Agamemnon and Ulysses both rose to meet them. The attendants brought on the oath offerings and mixed the wine in the mixing bowls. They poured water over the hands of the chieftains, and the son of Atreus drew the dagger that hung by his sword and cut wool from the lambs' heads. This the men-servants gave about among the Trojan and Achaean princes, and the son of Atreus lifted up his hands in prayer. Father Jove, he cried, that rulest in Ida, most glorious in power, and thou, O son, that seest and givest ear to all things, earth and rivers, and ye who in the realms below chastise the soul of him that has broken his oath, witness these rites and guard them, that they be not vain. If Alexandrus kills Menelaus, let him keep Helen and all her wealth, while we sail home with our ships. But if Menelaus kills Alexandrus, let the Trojans give back Helen and all that she has, let them, moreover, pay such fine to the Achaeans as shall be agreed upon, in testimony among those that shall be born hereafter. And if Priam and his sons refuse such fine when Alexandrus has fallen, then will I stay here and fight on till I have got satisfaction. As he spoke, he drew his knife across the throats of the victims, and laid them down, gasping and dying upon the ground, for the knife had reft them of their strength. Then they poured wine from the mixing bowl into the cups, and prayed to the everlasting God, saying, Trojans and Achaeans among one another, Jove, most great and glorious, and ye other everlasting gods, grant that the brains of them who shall first sin against their oaths, of them and their children, may be shed upon the ground even as this wine, and let their wives become the slaves of strangers. Thus they prayed, but not as yet would Jove grant them their prayer. Then Priam, descendant of Dardanus, spoke, saying, Hear me, Trojans and Achaeans, I will now go back to the wind-beaten city of Ilius. I dare not with my own eyes witness this fight between my son and Menelaus, for Jove and the other immortals alone know which shall fall. On this he laid the two lambs on his chariot and took his seat. He gathered the reins in his hand, and Antina sat beside him. The two then went back to Ilius. Hector and Ulysses measured the ground, and cast lots from a helmet of bronze to see which should take aim first. Meanwhile the two hosts lifted up their hands and prayed, saying, Father Jove, that rulest from Ida, most glorious in power, grant that he who first brought about this war between us may die and enter the house of Hades while we others remain at peace and abide by our oaths. Great Hector now turned his head aside, while he shook the helmet, and the lot of Paris flew out first. The others took their several stations, each by his horse, and the place where his arms were lying, while Alexandrus, husband of lovely Helen, put on his goodly armour. First he grieved his legs with greaves of good make, and fitted with ankle clasps of silver. After this he donned the cuirass of his brother Lycaon, and fitted it to his own body. 
he hung his silver-studded sword of bronze about his shoulders, and then his mighty shield. On his comely head he set his helmet, well wrought, with a crest of horsehair that nodded menacingly above it, and he grasped the redoubtable spear that suited his hands. In like fashion Menelaus also put on his armour. When they had thus armed, each amid his own people, they strode, fierce of aspect, into the open space, and both Trojans and Achaeans were struck with awe as they beheld them. They stood near one another on the measured ground, brandishing their spears, and each furious against the other. Alexandrus aimed first, and struck the round shield of the son of Atreus, but the spear did not pierce it, for the shield turned its point. Menelaus next took aim, praying to Father Jove as he did so. King Jove, he said, grant me revenge on Alexandrus, who has wronged me. Subdue him under my hand, that in ages yet to come a man may shrink from doing ill deeds in the house of his host. He poised his spear as he spoke, and hurled it at the shield of Alexandrus. Through shield and cuirass it went, and tore the shirt by his flank, but Alexandrus swerved aside and thus saved his life. Then the son of Atreus drew his sword and drove at the projecting part of his helmet, but the sword fell shivered in three or four pieces from his hand, and he cried, looking towards heaven, Father Jove, of all gods thou art the most despiteful. I made sure of my revenge, but the sword has broken in my hand, my spear has been hurled in vain, and I have not killed him. With this he flew at Alexandrus, caught him by the horsehair plume of his helmet, and began dragging him towards the Achaeans. The strap of the helmet that went under his chin was choking him, and Menelaus would have dragged him off to his own great glory, had not Jove's daughter Venus been quick to mark and break the strap of oxhide, so that the empty helmet came away in his hand. This he flung to his comrades among the Achaeans, and was again springing upon Alexandrus to run him through with a spear, but Venus snatched him up in a moment, as a god can do, hid him under a cloud of darkness, and conveyed him to his own bedchamber. Then she went to call Helen, and found her on a high tower with the Trojan women crowding about her. She took the form of an old woman who used to dress wool for her when she was still in Lacedaemon, and of whom she was very fond. Thus disguised, she plucked her by perfumed robe, and said, Come hither. Alexandrus says you are to go to the house. He is on his bed in his own room, radiant with beauty, and dressed in gorgeous apparel. No one would think he had just come from fighting, but rather that he was going to a dance, or had done dancing, and was sitting down. With these words she moved the heart of Helen to anger, when she marked the beautiful neck of the goddess, her lovely bosom, and sparkling eyes, she marvelled at her, and said, Goddess, why do you thus beguile me? Are you going to send me a field still further, to some man whom you have taken up in Phrygia or fair Meonia? Menelaus has just vanquished Alexandrus, and is to take my hateful self back with him. You are come here to betray me. Go, sit with Alexandrus yourself. Henceforth, be a goddess no longer. Never let your feet carry you back to Olympus. Worry about him, and look after him till he make you his wife, or for the matter of that his slave. But me, I shall not go. I can garnish his bed no longer. I should be a byword among all the women of Troy. Besides, I have trouble on my mind. Venus was very angry, and said, Bold hussy! Do not provoke me. If you do, I shall leave you to your fate, and hate you as much as I have loved you. I will stir up fierce hatred between Trojans and Achaeans, and you shall come to a bad end. At this Helen was frightened. She wrapped her mantle about her, and went in silence, following the goddess, and unnoticed by the Trojan women. When they came to the house of Alexandrus, the maid-servants set about their work, but Helen went into her own room, and the laughter-loving goddess took a seat and set it for her facing Alexandrus. On this Helen, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, sat down, and with eyes askance began to upbraid her husband. "'So you are come from the fight,' said she. "'Would that you had fallen rather by the hand of that brave man who was my husband. You used to brag that you were a better man with hands and spear than Menelaus.' Go then and challenge him again, but I should advise you not to do so, for if you are foolish enough to meet him in single combat, 
you will soon fall by his spear. And Paris answered, Wife, do not vex me with your reproaches. This time, with the help of Minerva, Menelaus has vanquished me. Another time I may myself be victor, for I too have gods that will stand by me. Come, let us lie down together and make friends. Never yet was I so passionately enamoured of you as at this moment, not even when I first carried you off from Lacedaemon and sailed away with you, not even when I had converse with you upon the couch of love in the island of Cranai was I so enthralled by desire of you as now. On this he led her towards the bed, and his wife went with him. Thus they laid themselves on the bed together, but the son of Atreus strode amongst the throng, looking everywhere for Alexandrus, and no man, neither of the Trojans nor of the allies, could find him. If they had seen him, they were in no mind to hide him, for they all of them hated him as they did death itself. Then Agamemnon, king of men, spoke, saying, Hear me, Trojans, Dardanians, and allies. The victory has been with Menelaus. Therefore give back Helen with all her wealth, and pay such fine as shall be agreed upon, in testimony among them that shall be born hereafter. Thus spoke the son of Atreus, and the Achaeans shouted in applause. End of Book 3「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名前は「ヒロシアの名 He then goes about among his captains and upbraids Ulysses and Sthenelus, who each of them retort fiercely. Diomed checks Sthenelus, and the two hosts engage with great slaughter on either side. Now the gods were sitting with Jove in council upon the golden floor, while Hebe went around pouring out nectar for them to drink. And as they pledged one another in their cups of gold, they looked down upon the town of Troy. The son of Saturn then began to tease Juno, talking at her so as to provoke her. Menelaus, he said, has two good friends among the goddesses, Juno of Argos and Minerva of Alalcomene. But they only sit still and look on, while Venus keeps ever at Alexandrus's side to defend him at any danger. Indeed, she has just rescued him when he made sure that it was all over with him, for the victory really did lie with Menelaus. We must consider what we shall do about all this. Shall we set them fighting anew, or make peace between them? If you will agree to this last, Menelaus can take back Helen, and the city of Priam may remain still inhabited. Minerva and Juno muttered their discontents as they sat side by side hatching mischief for the Trojans. Minerva scowled at her father, for she was in a furious passion with him, and said nothing, but Juno could not contain herself. Dread son of Saturn, said she, What, pray, is the meaning of all this? Is my trouble then to go for nothing, and the sweat that I have sweated, to say nothing of my horse, while getting the people together against Priam and his children? Do as you will, but we, the other gods, shall not all of us approve your counsel. Jove was angry, and answered, My dear, what harm have Priam and his sons done you that you are so hotly bent on sacking the city of Ilius? Will nothing do for you but you must within their walls and eat Priam raw, with his sons and all the other Trojans to boot? Have it your own way then, for I would not have this matter become a bone of contention between us. I say further, and I lay my saying to your heart, if ever I want to sack a city belonging to friends of yours, you must not try to stop me. You will have to let me do it, for I am giving in to you sorely against my will. Of all inhabited cities under the sun and stars of heaven, There was none that I so much respected as Ilius with Priam and his whole people. Equitable feasts were never wanting about my altar, nor the savour of burning fat which is honour due to ourselves. My own three favourite cities, answered Juno, are Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae. 
Sack them whenever you may be displeased with them. I shall not defend them. I shall not care. Even if I did, and tried to say to you, I should take nothing by it, for you are much stronger than I am. But I will not have my own work wasted. I too am a god, and of the same race with yourself. I am Saturn's eldest daughter, and am honorable not on this ground only, but also because I am your wife, and you are king over the gods. Let it be a case, then, of give and take between us, and the rest of the gods will follow our lead. Tell Minerva to go and take part in the fighting at once, and let her contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. The sire of gods and men heeded her words, and said to Minerva, Go at once to the Trojans in the Achaean host, and contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. This was what Minerva was already eager to do, so she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus. She shot through the sky as some brilliant meteor which the son of scheming Saturn has sent as a sign to mariners or to some great army, and a fiery train of light follows in its wake. The Trojans and the Achaeans were struck with awe as they beheld, and one would turn to his neighbor and say, Either we shall have a war and din of combat, or Jove the lord of battle will now make peace between us. Thus they did converse. Then Minerva took the form of Laudicus, son of Antenor, and went through the ranks of the Trojans to find Pandarus, the redoubtable son of Lycon. She found him standing among the stalwart heroes who had followed him from the banks of the Aesopus. So she went close to him and said, Brave son of Lycaon, will you do as I tell you? If you dare send an arrow at Menelaus, you will win honor and thanks from all the Trojans, and especially from the prince Alexandrus. He would be the first to requite you very handsomely if he could see Menelaus mount his funeral pyre, slain by an arrow from your hand. Take your home aim, then, and pray to the Lycian Apollo, the famous archer. Vow that when you get home to your strong city of Zeli, you will offer a hectatome of firstling lambs in his honor. His fool's heart was persuaded, and he took his bow from its case. This bow was made from the horns of a wild ibex, which he had killed as it was bounding from a rock. He had stalked it, and it had fallen as the arrow struck its heart. Its horns were sixteen palms long, and a worker in horn had made them into a bow, smoothing them well down, and giving them tips of gold. When Pandarus had strung his bow, he laid it carefully on the ground, and his brave followers held their shields before him, lest the Achaeans should set upon him before he had shot Menelaus. Then he opened the lid of his quiver, and took out a winged arrow that had not yet been shot, fraught with the pangs of death. He laid the arrow on the string, and prayed to Lycian Apollo, the famous archer, vowing that when he got home to his strong city of Zeli, he would offer a hectatome of firstling lambs in his honor. He laid the notch of the arrow on the oxide bowstring, and drew both the notch and the string to his breast till the arrow head was near the bow. Then when the bow was arced into a half circle, he let fly, and the bow twanged and the string sang as the arrow flew gladly on over the heads of the throng. But the blessed gods did not forget the O Menelaus, and Jove's daughter, driver of the spoil, was the first to stand before thee to ward off the piercing arrow. She turned it from his skin, as a mother whisks a fly from off her child when it is sleeping sweetly. She guided it to the part where the golden buckles of the belt that pass over his double cuirass were fastened. So the arrow struck the belt that went tightly round him. It went through this and through the cuirass of cunning workmanship. It also pierced the belt beneath it, which he wore next to his skin to keep out darts or arrows. It was this that served him in the best stead. Nevertheless, the arrow went through it, and grazed the top of the skin, so that blood began to flow from the wound. As when some woman of Maonia or Caria strains purple dyes on a piece of ivory that is to be the cheekpiece of a horse, and is to be laid up in the treasure house, many a knight is fain to bear it, but the king keeps it as an ornament of which both the horse and the driver may be proud. Even so, O Menelaus, were your shapely thighs and your legs down to your fair ankles stained with blood. When King Agamemnon saw the blood flow from the wound, he was afraid, and so was brave Menelaus himself, till he saw that the barb of the arrow and the thread that bound the arrow head to the shaft were still outside the wound. Then he took heart, but Agamemnon heaved a deep sigh as he held Menelaus's hand in his own, and his comrades made moan in concert, 
Dear brother, he cried, I have been the death of you in pledging this covenant, and letting you come forward as our champion. The Trojans have trampled on their oaths, and have wounded you. Nevertheless, the oath, the blood of lambs, the drinking of offerings, and the right hand of fellowship in which we have put our trust shall not be in vain. If he that rules Olympus fulfill it not here and now, he will yet fulfill it hereafter, and they shall pay dearly with their lives and with their wives and children. The day will surely come when mighty Ilias shall be laid low, with Priam and Priam's people, when the son of Saturn from his high throne shall overthrow them with his awful aegis in punishment of their present treachery. This shall surely be, but how, Menelaus, shall I mourn you, if it is your lot now to die? I should return to Argos as a byword, for the Achaeans will at once go home. We shall leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, and the earth will rot your bones as you lie here at Troy with your purpose not fulfilled. Then shall some braggart Trojan leap upon your tomb and say, Ever thus may Agamemnon wreak his vengeance. He brought his army in vain, he has gone home to his own lands with empty ships, and has left Menelaus behind him. Thus will one of them say, and may the earth then swallow me. But Menelaus reassured him, and said, Take heart, and do not alarm the people. The arrow has not struck me in a mortal part, for my outer belt of burnished metal first stayed it, and under this my cuirass, and the belt of mail which the bronze myths made me. And Agamemnon answered, I trust, dear Menelaus, that it may be even so, but the surgeon shall examine your wound and lay herbs upon it to relieve your pain. He then said to Talthebius, Talthebius, tell Machaon, son of the great physician Asclepius, to come to see Menelaus immediately. Some Trojan or Lycian archer has wounded him with an arrow to our dismay and to his great victory. Talthebius did as he was told, and went about the host trying to find Machaon. Presently he found standing amid the brave warriors who had followed him from Trachea, whereon he went up to him and said, Son of Asclepius, King Agamemnon says you are to come to see Menelaus immediately. Some Trojan or Lycian archer has wounded him with an arrow, to our dismay and to his great glory. Thus did he speak, and Machaon was moved to go. They passed through the spreading host of the Achaeans, and went on till they came to the place where Menelaus had been wounded, and was lying with the chieftains gathered in a circle round him. Machaon passed into the middle of the ring, and at once drew the arrow from the belt, bending its barb back through the force with which he pulled it out. He undid the burnished belt, and beneath this the cuirass and the belt of mail which the bronze-smiths had made. Then when he had seen the wound, he wiped away the blood, and applied some soothing drugs, which Chiron had given to Asclepius, out of the good will he bore him. While they were busy about Menelaus, the Trojans came forward against them, for they had put on their armor, and now renewed the fight. You would not have then found Agamemnon asleep, nor cowardly and unwilling to fight, but eager, rather, for the fray. He left his chariot, rich with bronze, and his panting steeds, in the charge of Eurymedon, son of Ptolemaeus, the son of Piraeus, and bade him hold them in readiness against the time his limbs should weary of going about and giving orders to so many, for he went among the ranks on foot. When he saw men hasting to the front, he stood by them and cheered them on. Argives, he said, slacken not one whit in your onset. Father Jove will be no helper of liars. The Trojans have been the first to break their oaths and attack us. Therefore they shall be devoured of vultures. We shall take their city, and carry off their wives and children in our ships. But he angrily rebuked those he saw shirking and disinclined to fight. Argives, he cried, cowardly miserable creatures, have you no shame that you stand here like frightened fawns, who, when they can no longer scud over the plain, huddle together, but show no fight? You are as dazed and spiritless as deer. Would you wait till the Trojans reach the stern of our ships, as they lie on the shore, to see whether the son of Saturn will hold his hand over you to protect you? Thus did he go about giving orders among the ranks. Passing through the crowd, he presently came to the Cretans, arming around Idomeneus, who was at their head, fierce as a wild boar, while Myrianes was bringing up battalions that were in the rear. Agamemnon was glad when he saw him, and spoke him fairly. Idomeneus, said he, I treat you with greater distinction than I do any others of the Achaeans, whether in war or in other things or at the table. 
when the princes are mixing my choicest wines in the mixing bowls, they each of them have a fixed allowance. But your cup is kept always full, like my own, that you may drink whenever you are minded. Go, therefore, into battle, and show yourself the man you have been always proud to be. Idomeneus answered, I will be a trusty comrade, as I promised you from the first I would be. Urge on other Achaeans, that we may join battle at once, for the Trojans have trampled upon their covenants. Death and destruction shall be theirs, seeing they have been the first to break their oaths and attack us. The son of Atreus went on, glad at heart, till he came upon the two Ajaxes arming themselves amid a host of foot soldiers. As when a goat herd, from some high post watches a storm drive over the deep before the west wind, black as pitch is the offing, and a mighty whirlwind draws towards him, so that he is afraid and drives his flock into a cave. Even thus did the ranks of stalwart youths move in a dark mass to battle under the Ajaxes, horrid with shield and spear. Glad was King Agamemnon when he saw them. No need, he cried, to give orders to such leaders of the Argives as you are. For your own selves you spur your men on to fight with might and main. Would by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, that all were so minded as you are, for the city of Priam would then soon fall beneath our hands, and we should sack it. With this he left them, and went onward to Nestor, the facile speaker of the Pylians, who was marshalling his men and urging them on, in company with Pelagon, Alastor, Chromius, Haemon, and Bias, shepherd of his people. He placed his knights, with their chariots and horses in the front rank, while his foot-soldiers, brave men and many, whom he could trust, were in the rear. The cowards he drove into the middle, that they might fight whether they would or no. He gave his orders to the knights first, bidding them to hold their horse well in hand, so as to avoid confusion. Let no man, he said, relying on his strength or horsemanship, get before the others and engage singly with the Trojans. Nor yet let him lag behind, or you will weaken your attack. But let each, when he meets an enemy chariot, throw his spear from his own, this be much the best, this is how the men of old took towns and strongholds. In this wise they were minded. Thus did the old man charge them, for he had been in many a fight, and King Agamemnon was glad. I wish, he said to him, that your limbs were as supple and your strength as sure as your judgment is. But age, the common enemy of mankind, has laid his hand upon you. Would that it had fallen upon some other, and that you were still young. And Nestor, knight of Gerenae, answered, Son of Atreus, I too would gladly be the man I was when I slew mighty Eriuthalion. But the gods will not give us everything at one and the same time. I was young then, and now I am old. Still I can go with my knights, and give them that counsel which old men have a right to give. The wielding of the spear I leave to those who are younger and stronger than myself. Agamemnon went his way rejoicing, and presently found Menestheus son of Petos, tarrying in his place, and with him were the Athenians, loud of tongue in battle. Near him also tarried cunning Ulysses, with his sturdy Cephalanians round him. They had not yet heard the battle cry, for the ranks of Trojans and Achaeans had only just begun to move, so they were standing still, waiting for some other columns of the Achaeans to attack the Trojans and begin the fighting. When he saw this, Agamemnon rebuked them, and said, Son of Petos, and you other, steeped in cunning, heart of guile, why stand you here cowering and waiting on others? You two should be of all men foremost when there is hard fighting to be done. For you are ever foremost to accept my invitation when we counsellors of the Achaeans are holding feast. You are glad enough then to take your fill of roasted meats and to drink wine as long as you please. Whereas now you would not care though you saw ten columns of Achaeans engage the enemy in front of you. Ulysses glared at him, and answered, Son of Atreus, what are you talking about? How can you say that we are slack, when the Achaeans are in full fight with the Trojans? You shall see, if you care to do so, that the father of Telemachus will join the battle with the foremost of them. You are talking idly. When Agamemnon saw that Ulysses was angry, he smiled pleasantly at him, and withdrew his words. Ulysses, said he, noble son of Laertes, excellent in all good counsel. I have neither fault to find nor orders to give you, for I know that your heart is right, and that you and I are of a mind. Enough. 
I will make you amends for what I have said, and if any ill has now been spoken, may the gods bring it to nothing. He then left them, and went on to others. Presently he saw the son of Tydeus, noble Diomed, standing by his chariot and horses, with Sthenelus the son of Capaneus beside him, whereon he began to upbraid him. Son of Tydeus, he said, why stand you cowering here upon the brink of battle? Tydeus did not shrink thus, but was ever ahead of his men when leading them on against the foe. So at least they say that saw him in battle, for I never set eyes upon him myself. They say that there was no man like him. He came once to Mycenae, not as an enemy, but as a guest, in company with Polynices, to recruit his forces, for they were levying war against the strong city of Thebes and prayed our people for a body of picked men to help him. The men of Mycenae were willing to let them have one, but Jove dissuaded them by showing them unfavorable omens. Tydeus, therefore, and Polynices went their way. When they had got as far as the deep meadowed and rush-grown banks of the Aesopus, the Achaeans sent Tydeus as their envoy, and he found the Cadmians gathered in great number to a banquet in the house of Eteocles. Stranger though he was, he knew no fear on finding himself single-handed amongst so many. He challenged them to contests of all kinds, and in each one of them was he at once victorious, so mightily did Minerva help him. The Cadmians were incensed at his success, and sent a force of fifty youths with two captains, the godlike hero Maon, son of Haemon, and Polyphontes, son of Autophonus, at their head to lie in wait for him on his return journey. But Tydeus slew every man of them, save only Maon, whom he let go in obedience to heaven's omens. Such was Tydeus of Aetolia. His son can talk more glibly, but he cannot fight as his father did. Diomed made no answer, for he was shamed by the rebuke of Agamemnon. But the son of Capaneus took up his words and said, Son of Atreus, tell no lies, for you can speak the truth if you will. We boast ourselves as even better men than our fathers. We took seven-gated Thebes, though the walls were stronger and our men were fewer in number. For we trusted in the omens of gods, and in the help of Jove, whereas they perished through their own sheer folly. Hold not, then, our fathers in like honor with us. Diomed looked sternly at him and said, Hold your peace, my friend, as I bid you. It is not amiss that Agamemnon should urge the Achaeans forward for the glory will be his if we take the city, and his the shame if we are vanquished. Therefore let us acquit ourselves with valor. As he spoke he sprang from his chariot, and his armor rang so fiercely about his body that even a brave man might well have been scared to hear it. As when some mighty wave that thunders on the beach when the west wind has lashed it into fury, it has reared its head afar and now comes crashing down on the shore, it bows its arching crest high over the jagged rocks and spews its salt foam in all directions. Even so did the serried phalanxes of the Danians march steadfastly to battle. The chiefs gave orders each to his own people, but the men said never a word. No man would think it, for as huge as the host was, it seemed as though there was not a tongue among them. So silent were they in their obedience. As they marched, the armor about their bodies glistened in the sun, but the clamor of the Trojan ranks was as that of many thousand ewes, that stand waiting to be milked in the yard of some rich flock-master, and bleating incessantly in answer to the bleating of their lambs. For they had not one speech nor language, but their tongues were diverse, and they came from different places. These were inspired of Mars, but the others by Minerva, and with them came panic, rout, and strife, whose fury never tires. Sister and friend of the murderous Mars, who from being at first but small in stature, grows till she uprears her head to heaven, though her feet are still on the earth. She it was that went about am among them, and flung down discord to the waxing of sorrows, with even hand between them. When they were got together in one place, shield crashed with shield, and spear with spear, in the rage of battle. The bossed shields beat upon one another, and there was a tramp as of a great multitude, death cry and shout of triumph of slain and slayers and the earth ran red with blood as torrents swollen with rain course madly down their deep channels till the angry floods meet in some gorge and the shepherd on the hillside hears their roaring from afar even such was the toil and uproar of the hosts as they joined battle 
First Eteocles slew an armed warrior of the Trojans, Acepolis, son of Thalesius, fighting in the foremost ranks. He struck at the projecting part of his helmet, and drove his spear into his brow. The point of bronze pierced the bone, and darkness veiled his eyes. Headlong as a tower he fell amid the press of the fighting, and as he dropped King Elephenor, son of Colchidon, and captain of the proud Abantes, began dragging him out of reach of the darts that were falling around him, in haste to strip him of his armor. But his purpose was not for long. Agenor saw him hauling away the body, and smote him in the side with his bronze-shod spear. For as he stooped, his side was left unprotected by his shield, and thus he perished. Then the fighting between Trojans and Achaeans grew furious over his body, and they flew upon each other like wolves, man and man crushing one upon the other. Forthwith Ajax, son of Telamon, slew the fair youth Simoesis, son of Anthemion, whom his mother bore by the banks of the Simois, as she was coming down from Mount Ida, where she had been with her parents to see their flocks. Therefore he was named Simoesius, but he did not live to pay his parents for his rearing, for he was cut off untimely by the spear of mighty Ajax, who struck him in the breast by the right nipple, as he was coming on among the foremost fighters. The spear went right through his shoulder, and he fell as a poplar that has grown straight and tall in a meadow by some mere, and his top is thick with branches. Then the wheelwright lays his axe to its roots, that he may fashion a fellow for the wheel of some goodly chariot, and it lies seasoning by the water-side. In such wise did Ajax fell to earth Simoesius, son of Anthemion, whereon Antiphus, of the gleaming corset, son of Priam, hurled his spear at Ajax from amid the crowd and missed him. But he hit Lucas, the brave comrade of Ulysses, in the groin as he was dragging away the body of Simoesius over to the other side. So he fell upon the body, and loosed his hold upon it. Ulysses was furious when he saw Laocus slain, and strode in full armor through the front ranks till he was quite close. Then he glared round about him and took aim, and the Trojans fell back as he did so. His dart was not sped in vain, for it struck Damocoon, the bastard son of Priam, who had come to him from Abydos, where he had charge of his father's mares. Ulysses, infuriated by the death of his comrade, hit him with his spear on one temple, and the bronze point came through on the other side of his forehead. Thereon darkness veiled his eyes, and his armor rang, rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Hector, and they that were in front, then gave round, while the Argives raised a shout and drew off the dead, pressing further forward as they did so. But Apollo looked down from Pyrgamus, and called aloud to the Trojans, for he was displeased. Trojans, he cried, Rush on the foe, and do not let yourselves be thus beaten by the Argives. Their skins are not stone nor iron, that when hit you do them no harm. Moreover Achilles, the son of lovely Thetis, is not fighting, but nursing his anger at the ships. Thus spoke the mighty god, crying to them from the city, while Jove's redoubtable daughter, the Trito-born, went about among the host of the Achaeans, and urged them forward whenever she beheld them slackening. Then fate fell upon Diores, son of Amarynchius, for he was struck by a jagged stone near the ankle of his right leg. He that hurled it was Pyroas, son of Ambrassus, captain of the Thracians, who had come from Enus. The bones in both the tendons were crushed by the pitiless stone. He fell to the ground on his back, and in his death throes stretched out his hand towards his comrades. But Pyroas, who had wounded him, sprang on him and thrust a spear into his belly, so that his bowels came gushing out upon the ground, and darkness veiled his eyes. As he was leaving the body, Thoas of Aetolia struck him in the chest near the nipple, and the point fixed itself in his lungs. Thoas came close up to him, pulled the spear from his chest, and then, drawing his sword, smote him in the middle of the belly, so that he died. But he did not strip him of his armor. For his Thracian comrades, men who wear their hair in tufts upon the top of their head, stood round the body and kept him off with their long spears for all his great stature and valor. So he was driven back. Thus the two corpses lay, stretched on the earth near to one another, and one captain of the Thracians and the other of the Epeans, and many another fell round them. And now no man would have made light of the fighting if he could have gone about among it scatheless and unwounded. 
with Minerva leading him by the hand, and protecting him from the storm of spears and arrows. For many Trojans and Achaeans on that day lay stretched side by side, face downwards upon the earth. End of Book Four of the Iliad. Book Five of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Christensen The Iliad by Homer Translated by Samuel Butler Book V. The Exploits of Diomed The Exploits of Diomed, who, though wounded by Pandarus, continues fighting. He kills Pandarus and wounds Aeneas. Venus rescues Aeneas, but being wounded by Diomed, commits him to the care of Apollo and goes to Olympus, where she is tended by her mother Dione. Mars encourages the Trojans, and Aeneas returns to the fight cured of his wound. Minerva and Juno help the Achaeans, and by the advice of the former Diomed wounds Mars, who returns to Olympus to get cured. Then Pallas Minerva put valor into the heart of Diomed, son of Tydeus, that he might excel all the other Argives and cover himself with glory. She made a stream of fire flare from his shield and helmet like the star that shines most brilliantly in summer after its bath in the waters of Oceanus. Even such a fire did she kindle upon his head and shoulders as she bade him speed into the thickest hurly-burly of the fight. Now there was a certain rich and honorable man among the Trojans, priest of Vulcan, and his name was Dares. He had two sons, Phegeus and Idaeus, both of them skilled in all the arts of war. These two came forward from the main body of Trojans, and set upon Diomed, he being on foot, while they fought from their chariot. When they were close up to one another, Phegeus took aim first, but his spear went over Diomed's left shoulder without hitting him. Diomed then threw, and his spear sped not in vain, for it hit Phegeus on the breast near the nipple, and he fell from his chariot. Idaeus did not dare to bestride his brother's body, but sprang from the chariot and took to flight, or he would have shared his brother's fate, whereon Vulcan saved him by wrapping him in a cloud of darkness, that his old father might not be utterly overwhelmed with grief, but the son of Tydeus drove off with the horses, and bade his followers take them to the ships. The Trojans were scared when they saw the two sons of Darius, one of them in fright, and the other lying dead by his chariot. Minerva, therefore, took Mars by the hand and said, Mars, Mars, bane of men, blood-stained stormer of cities. May we not now leave the Trojans and Achaeans to fight it out, and see to which of the two Jove will vouchsafe the victory? Let us go away, and thus avoid his anger. So saying, she drew Mars out of the battle, and set him down upon the steep banks of the Scamander. Upon this the Danaeans drove the Trojans back, and each one of their chieftains killed his man. First King Agamemnon flung mighty Odius, captain of the Halzoni, from the chariot. The spear of Agamemnon caught him on the broad of his back, just as he was turning in flight. It struck him between the shoulders and went right through his chest, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Then Idomeneus killed Phasus, son of Boris the Meonian, who had come from Varn. Mighty Idomeneus speared him on the right shoulder as he was mounting his chariot, and the darkness of death enshrouded him as he fell heavily from the car. The squires of Idomeneus spoiled him of his armor, while Menelaus, son of Atreus, skilled Scamandrius, the son of Strophius, a mighty huntsman and keen lover of the chase. Diana herself had taught him how to kill every kind of wild creature that is bred in mountain forests. But neither she nor his famed skill in archery could now save him, for the spear of Menelaus struck him in the back as he was flying. It struck him between the shoulders and went right through his chest so that he fell headlong, and his armor rang rattling round him. Meriones then killed Phericles, the son of Tecton, who was the son of Hermon, a man whose hand was skilled in all manner of cutting workmanship, for Pallas Minerva had dearly loved him. He it was that made the ships for Alexandrus, which were the beginning of all mischief, and brought evil alike both on the Trojans and on Alexandrus himself, for he heeded not the decrees of heaven. 
Meriones overtook him as he was flying, and struck him on the right buttock. The point of the spear went through the bone into the bladder, and death came upon him as he cried aloud and fell forward on his knees. Meges, moreover, slew Pedias, son of Antenor, who, though he was a bastard, had been brought up by Theano as one of her own children, for the love she bore her husband. The son of Phileus got close up to him and drove a spear into the nape of his neck. It went under his tongue all among his teeth, so he bit the cold bronze and fell dead in the dust. And Eurypylus, son of Euemon, killed Hispanor, the son of noble Dolopion, who had been made priest of the river Scamander, and was honored among the people as though he were a god. Eurypylus gave him chase as he was flying before him, smote him with his sword upon the arm, and lopped his strong hand from off it. The bloody hand fell to the ground, and the shades of death, with fate that no man can withstand, came over his eyes. Thus furiously did the battle rage between them. As for the son of Tadeus, you could not say whether he was more among the Achaeans or the Trojans. He rushed across the plain like a winter torrent that has burst its barrier in full flood. No dikes, no walls of fruitful vineyards can embank it when it is swollen with rain from heaven, but in a moment it comes tearing onward and lays many a field waste that many a strong man's hands has reclaimed. Even so were the dense phalanxes of the Trojans driven in rout by the son of Tadeus, and many though they were, they dared not abide his onslaught. Now when the son of Lycaon saw him scouring the plain and driving the Trojans pell-mell before him, he aimed an arrow and hit the front part of his cuirass near the shoulder. The arrow went right through the metal and pierced the flesh, so that the cuirass was covered with blood. On this the son of Lycaon shouted in triumph, Knights, Trojans, come on! The bravest of the Achaeans is wounded, and he will not hold out much longer if King Apollo was indeed with me when I sped from Lycia hither. Thus did he vaunt, but his arrow had not killed Diomed, who withdrew and made for the chariot and horses of Sthenelus, the son of Capaneus. Dear son of Capaneus, said he, come down from your chariot and draw the arrow out of my shoulder. Sthenelus sprang from his chariot and drew the arrow from the wound, whereon the blood came spouting out through the hole that had been made in his shirt. Then Diomed prayed, saying, Hear me, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, unweariable, if ever you loved my father well and stood by him in the thick of a fight, do the like now by me. Grant me to come within a spear's throw of that man and kill him. He has been too quick for me and has wounded me, and now he is boasting that I shall not see the light of the sun much longer. Thus he prayed and Pallas Minerva heard him. She made his limbs supple and quickened his hands and his feet. Then she went up close to him and said, Fear not, Diomed, to do battle with the Trojans, for I have set in your heart the spirit of your knightly father Tydeus. Moreover, I have withdrawn the veil from your eyes, that you know gods and men apart. If, then, any other god comes here and offers you battle, do not fight him, but should Jove's daughter Venus come, strike her with your spear and wound her. When she had said this, Minerva went away, and the son of Tydeus again took his place among the foremost fighters, three times more fierce even than he had been before. He was like a lion that some mountain shepherd had wounded, but not killed, as he is springing over the wall of a sheepyard to attack the sheep. The shepherd has roused the brute to fury, but cannot defend his flock, so he takes shelter under cover of the buildings, while the sheep, panic-stricken on being deserted, are smothered in heaps, one on top of the other, and the angry lion leaps out over the sheep-yard wall. Even thus did Diomed go furiously about among the Trojans. He killed Astinos, and Hyperion, shepherd of his people, the one with a thrust of his spear which struck him above the nipple, the other with a sword-cut on the collarbone that severed his shoulder from his neck and back. He let both of them die, and went in pursuit of Abbas and Polyidus, sons of the old reader of dreams, Eurydamus, they never came back for him to read them any more dreams, for mighty Diomed made an end of them. He then gave chase to Xanthus and Thune, the two sons of Phaenops, both of them very dear to him, for he was now worn out with age, and begat no more sons to inherit his possessions. But Diomed took both their lives and left their father sorrowing bitterly, for he never more saw them come home from battle alive, and his kinsmen divided his wealth among themselves. 
Then he came upon two sons of Priam, Echemon and Chromius, as they were both in one chariot. He sprang upon them as a lion fastens on the neck of some cow or heifer when the herd is feeding in a coppice. For all their vain struggles he flung them both from their chariot and stripped the armor from their bodies. Then he gave their horses to his comrades to take them back to the ships. When Aeneas saw him thus making havoc among the ranks, he went through the fight amid the rain of spears to see if he could find Pandarus. When he had found the brave son of Lycaon, he said, Pandarus, where is now your bow, your winged arrows, your renown as an archer, in respect of which no man here can rival you, nor is there any in Lycia that can beat you? Lift then your hands to Jove, and send an arrow at this fellow who is going so masterfully about, and has done such deadly work among the Trojans. He has killed many a brave man, unless indeed he is some god who is angry with the Trojans about their sacrifices, and has set his hand against them in displeasure. And the son of Lycaon answered, Aeneas, I take him for none other than the son of Tydeus. I know him by his shield, the visor of his helmet, and by his horses. It is possible that he may be a god, but if he is the man I say he is, he is not making all this havoc without heaven's help, but has some god by his side who is shrouded in a cloud of darkness, and who turned my arrow aside when it had hit him. I had taken aim at him already, and hit him on the right shoulder. My arrow went through the breastpiece of his cuirass, and I made sure I sent him hurrying to the world below, but it seems that I have not killed him. There must be a god who is angry with me. Moreover, I have neither horse nor chariot. In my father's stables there are eleven excellent chariots, fresh from the builder, quite new, with cloths spread over them, and by each of them there stand a pair of horses, champing barley and rye. My old father, Lycaon, urged me again and again when I was at home and on the point of starting to take chariots and horses with me, that I might lead the Trojans in battle. But I would not listen to him. It would have been much better if I had done so, but I was thinking about the horses, which had been used to eat their fill, and I was afraid that in such a great gathering of men they might be ill-fed. So I left them at home and came on foot to Ilias, armed only with my bow and arrows. These, it seems, are of no use, for I have already hit two chieftains, the son of Atreus and of Tydeus, and though I drew blood surely enough, I have only made them still more furious. I did ill to take my bow down from its peg on the day that I led my band of Trojans to Ilias and Hector's service, and if ever I get home again to set eyes on my native place, my wife and the greatness of my house, may someone cut my head off then and there if I do not break the bow and set it on a hot fire. Such pranks as it plays me. Aeneas answered, Say no more. Things will not mend till we too go against this man with chariot and horses and bring him to a trial of arms. Mount my chariot, and note how cleverly the horses of Tross can speed hither and thither over the plain in pursuit or flight. If Jove again vouchsafes glory to the son of Tydeus, they will carry us safely back to the city. Take hold, then, of the whip and reins while I stand upon the car to fight, or else do you wait this man's onset while I look after the horses. Aeneas, replied the son of Lycaon, take the reins and drive. If we have to fly before the son of Tydeus, the horses will go better for their own driver. If they miss the sound of your voice when they expect it, they may be frightened, and refuse to take us out of the fight. The son of Tydeus will then kill both of us and take the horses. Therefore drive them yourself, and I will be ready for him with my spear. They then mounted the chariot, and drove full speed towards the son of Tydeus. Sthenolus, son of Capaneus, saw them coming and said to Diomed, Diomed, son of Tydeus, man after my own heart, I see two heroes speeding towards you, both of them men of might, the one a skilful archer, Pandarus, son of Lycaon, the other Aeneas, whose sire is Anchises, while his mother is Venus. Mount the chariot and let us retreat. Do not, I pray you, press so furiously forward, or you may get killed. Diomed looked angrily at him and answered, Talk not of flight, for I shall not listen to you. I am of a race that knows neither flight nor fear, and my limbs are as yet unwearied. I am in no mind to mount, but will go against them even as I am. Pallas Minerva bids me be afraid of no man, and even though one of them escape, their steeds shall not take both back again. I say further, and lay my saying to your heart, if Minerva sees fit to vouchsafe me the glory of killing both, stay your horses here, and make the reins fast to the rim of the chariot. Then be sure you spring Aeneas's horses, and drive them from the Trojan to the Achaean ranks. They are of the stock that great Jove gave to Tross, in payment for his son Ganymede, 
and are the finest that live and move under the sun. King Anchises stole the blood by putting his mares to them without Laomedon's knowledge, and they bore him six foals. Four are still in his stables, but he gave the other two to Aeneas. We shall win great glory if we can take them. Thus did they converse. But the other two had now driven close up to them, and the son of Lycaon spoke first. "'Great and mighty son,' said he, "'of noble Tydeus, my arrow failed to lay you low, so I will now try with my spear.' He poised his spear as he spoke, and hurled it from him. It struck the shield on the son of Tydeus, the bronze point pierced it, and passed on till it reached the breastplate. Thereon the son of Lycaon shouted out and said, "'You are hit clean through the belly. You will not stand up for long, and the glory of the fight is mine.' But Diomed, all undismayed, made answer, You have missed, not hit, and before you too see the end of this matter, one or other of you shall glut tough-shielded Mars with his blood. With this he hurled his spear, and Minerva guided it on to Pandarus's nose near the eye. It went crashing in among his white teeth, the bronze point cut through the root of his tongue, coming out under his chin, and his glistening armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. The horses started aside for fear, and he was reft of life and strength. Aeneas sprang from his chariot, armed with shield and spear, fearing lest the Achaeans should carry off the body. He bestrode it as a lion in the pride of strength, with shield and spear before him, and a cry of battle on his lips, resolute to kill the first that should dare face him. But the son of Tydeus caught up a mighty stone, so huge and great, that as men now are it would take two to lift it, Nevertheless he bore it aloft with ease unaided, and with this he struck Aeneas on the groin where the hip turns in the joint that is called the cup-bone. The stone crushed this joint and broke both the sinews, while its jagged edges tore away all the flesh. The hero fell on his knees and propped himself with his hand resting on the ground till the darkness of night fell upon his eyes. And now Aeneas, king of men, would have perished then and there had not his mother, Jove's daughter Venus, who had conceived him by Anchises when he was herding cattle, been quick to mark, and thrown her two white arms about the body of her dear son. She protected him by covering him with a fold of her own fair garment, lest some Danaean should drive a spear into his breast and kill him. Thus, then, did she bear her dear son out of the fight. But the son of Capaneus was not unmindful of the orders that Diomed had given him. He made his own horses fast, away from the hurly-burly by binding the reins to the rim of the chariot. Then he sprang upon Aeneas's horses, and drove them from the Trojan to the Achaean ranks. When he had so done, he gave them over to his chosen comrade Dipolus, whom he valued above all others as the one who was most like-minded with himself, to take them on to the ships. He then remounted his own chariot, seized the reins, and drove with all speed in search of the son of Tydeus. Now the son of Tydeus was in pursuit of the Cyprian goddess, spear in hand, for he knew her to be feeble, and not one of those goddesses that can lord it among men in battle, like Minerva, or Enyo, the waster of cities. And when at last, after a long chase, he caught her up, he flew at her and thrust his spear into the flesh of her delicate hand. The point tore through the ambrosial robe which the graces had woven for her, and pierced the skin between her wrist and the palm of her hand, so that the immortal blood, or ichor, that flows in the veins of the blessed gods, came pouring from the wound. For the gods do not eat bread, nor drink wine, hence they have no blood such as ours, and are immortal. Venus screamed aloud, and let her son fall, but Phoebus Apollo caught him in his arms, and hid him in a cloud of darkness, lest some Danaean should drive a spear into his breast and kill him. And Diomed shouted out as he left her, Daughter of Jove, leave war and battle alone. Can you not be contented with beguiling silly women? If you meddle with fighting, you will get what will make you shudder at the very name of war. The goddess went dazed and discomfited away, and Iris, fleet as the wind, drew her from the throng, in pain and with her fair skin all besmirched. She found fierce Mars waiting on the left of the battle, with his spear and his two fleet steeds resting on a cloud, whereon she fell on her knees before her brother and implored him to let her have his horses. Dear brother, she cried, save me! and give me your horses to take me to Olympus, where the gods dwell. I am badly wounded by a mortal, the son of Tydeus, who would now fight even with the father Jove. Thus she spoke, and Mars gave her his gold bedizened steeds. She mounted the chariot, sick and sorry at heart, 
while Ira sat beside her and took the reins in her hand. She lashed her horses on, and they flew forward nothing loth, till in a trice they were at high Olympus, where the gods have their dwelling. There she stayed them, unloosed them from the chariot, and gave them their ambrosial forage. But Venus flung herself on the lap of her mother Dione, who threw her arms about her and caressed her, saying, Which of the heavenly beings has been treating you in this way, as though you had been doing something wrong in the face of day? And laughter-loving Venus answered, Proud Diomed, the son of Tydeus, wounded me because I was bearing my dear son Aeneas, whom I love best of all mankind, out of the fight. The war is no longer one between Trojans and Achaeans, for the Danaeans have now taken to fighting with the immortals. Bear it, my child, replied Dione, and make the best of it. We dwellers in Olympus have to put up with much at the hands of men, and we lay much suffering on one another. Mars had to suffer when Otus and Ephialtes, children of Oileus, bound him in cruel bonds, so that he lay thirteen months imprisoned in a vessel of bronze. Mars would have then perished, had not fair Eriboia, stepmother to the son of Aloeus, told Mercury, who stole him away when he was already well-nigh worn out by the severity of his bondage. Juno again suffered when the mighty son of Amphitryon wounded her on the right breast with a three-barbed arrow, and nothing could assuage her pain. So also did huge Hades, when this same man, the son of Aegis-bearing Jove, hit him with an arrow even at the gates of hell and hurt him badly. Thereon Hades went to the house of Jove on great Olympus, angry and full of pain, and the arrow in his brawny shoulder caused him great anguish, till Paeon healed him by spreading soothing herbs on the wound, for Hades was not of mortal mould. Daring, headstrong evildoer who rucked not of his sin in shooting the gods that dwell in Olympus. And now Minerva has egged this son of Tydeus on against yourself, fool that he is, for not reflecting that no man who fights with gods will live long, or hear his children prattling about his knees when he returns from battle. Let, then, the son of Tydeus see that he does not have to fight with one who is stronger than you are. Then shall his brave wife, Aegialia, daughter of Adrestus, rouse her whole house from sleep, wailing for the loss of her wedded lord, Diomed, the bravest of the Achaeans. So saying, she wiped the ichor from the wrist of her daughter with both hands, whereon the pain left her, and her hand was healed. But Minerva and Juno, who were looking on, began to taunt Jove with their mocking talk, and Minerva was first to speak. "'Father Jove,' said she, "'do not be angry with me, but I think the Cyprian must have been persuading some one of the Achaean women to go with the Trojans of whom she is so very fond, and while caressing one or the other of them she must have torn her delicate hand with the gold pin of the woman's brooch.' The sire of gods and men smiled, and called golden Venus to his side. "'My child,' said he, "'it has not been given you to be a warrior. Attend henceforth to your own delightful matrimonial duties, and leave all this fighting to Mars and to Minerva.' Thus did they converse. But Diomed sprang upon Aeneas, though he knew him to be in the very arms of Apollo. Not one whit did he fear the mighty god, so set was he on killing Aeneas and stripping him of his armour. Thrice did he spring forward with his might and main to slay him, and thrice did Apollo beat back his gleaming shield. When he was coming on for the fourth time, as though he were a god, Apollo shouted to him with an awful voice and said, Take heed, son of Tydeus, and draw off. Think not to match yourself against gods, for men that walk the earth cannot hold their own with the immortals. The son of Tydeus then gave way for a little space, to avoid the anger of the god, while Apollo took Aeneas out of the crowd and set him in sacred Pergamus, where his temple stood. There, within the mighty sanctuary, Latona and Diana healed him and made him glorious to behold, while Apollo of the silver bow fashioned a wraith in the likeness of Aeneas, and armed as he was. Round this the Trojans and Achaeans hacked at the bucklers about one another's breasts, hewing each other's round shields and light hide-covered targets. Then Phoebus Apollo said to Mars, 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 bane of men, blood-stained stormer of cities, can you not go to this man, the son of Tydeus, who would fight even with Father Jove, and draw him out of the battle? He first went up to the Cyprian, and wounded her in the hand near her wrist, and afterwards sprang upon me too, as though he were a god. He then took his seat on the top of Pergamus, while murderous Mars went about among the ranks of the Trojans, cheering them on, in the likeness of fleet Acamus, 
chief of the Thracians. "'Sons of Priam,' said he, "'how long will you let your people be thus slaughtered by the Achaeans? Would you wait till they are at the walls of Troy? Aeneas, the son of Anchises, has fallen, he whom we held in as high honour as Hector himself. Help me, then, to rescue our brave comrade from the stress of the fight.' With these words he put heart and soul into them all. Then Sarpedon rebuked Hector very sternly. "'Hector,' said he, "'where is your prowess now? You used to say that though you had neither people nor allies, you could hold the town alone with your brothers and brothers-in-law. I see not one of them here. They cower as hounds before a lion. It is we, your allies, who bear the brunt of the battle. I have come from afar, even from Lycia and the banks of the river Xanthus, where I have left my wife, my infant son, and much wealth to tempt whoever is needy. Nevertheless, I head my Lycian soldiers and stand my ground against any who would fight me, though I have nothing here for the Achaeans to plunder, while you look on, without even bidding your men stand firm in defense of their wives. See that you fall not into the hands of your foes, as men caught in the meshes of a net, and they sack your fair city forthwith. Keep this before your mind, night and day, and beseech the captains of your allies to hold on without flinching, and thus put away their reproaches from you. So spoke Sarpedon, and Hector smarted under his words. He sprang from his chariot, clad in his suit of armor, and went about among the host brandishing his two spears, exhorting the men to fight and raising the terrible cry of battle. Then they rallied and again faced the Achaeans, but the Argives stood compact and firm and were not driven back. As the breezes sport with the chaff upon some goodly threshing floor when men are winnowing, while yellow Ceres blows with the wind to sift the chaff from the grain, and the chaff heaps grow whiter and whiter, even so did the Achaeans whiten in the dust which the horses' hooves raised to the firmament of heaven as their drivers turned them back to battle, and they bore down with might upon the foe. Fierce Mars, to help the Trojans, covered them in a veil of darkness, and went about everywhere among them, inasmuch as Phoebus Apollo had told him that when he saw Pallas Minerva leave the fray he was to put courage into the hearts of the Trojans, for it was she who was helping the Danaeans. Then Apollo sent Aeneas forth from his rich sanctuary, and filled his heart with valour, whereon he took his place among his comrades, who were overjoyed at seeing him alive, sound, and of a good courage. But they could not ask him how it had all happened, for they were too busy with the turmoil raised by Mars and by Strife, who raged insatiably in their midst. The two Ajaxes, Ulysses and Diomed, cheered the Danaeans on, fearless of the fury and onset of the Trojans. They stood as still as clouds which the son of Saturn had spread upon the mountain tops, when there is no air, and fierce Boreas sleeps with the other boisterous winds, whose shrill blasts scatter the clouds in all directions. Even so did the Danaeans stand firm and unflinching against the Trojans. The son of Atreus went about among them and exhorted them. My friends, said he, quit yourselves like brave men, and shun dishonor in one another's eyes amid the stress of battle. They that shun dishonor more often live than get killed, but they that fly save neither life nor name. As he spoke, he hurled his spear and hit one of those who were in the front rank, the comrade of Aeneas, Dicoon, son of Pergasus, whom the Trojans held in no less honor than the sons of Priam, for he was ever quick to place himself among the foremost. The spear of King Agamemnon struck his shield and went right through it, for the shield stayed it not. It drove through his belt into the lower part of his belly, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Then Aeneas killed two champions of the Danaeans, Crithon and Orsilochus. Their father was a rich man who lived in the strong city of Phyre, and was descended from the river Alpheus, whose broad stream flows through the land of the Pylians. The river begat Orsilochus, who ruled over much people, and was father to Diocles, who in his turn begat twin sons, Crethon and Orsilochus, well skilled in all the arts of war. These, when they grew up, went to Ilius with the Argive fleet, in the cause of Menelaus and Agamemnon, sons of Atreus and there they both of them fell. As two lions, whom their dam has reared in the depths of some mountain forest to plunder homesteads and carry off sheep and cattle till they get killed by the hand of man, so were these two vanquished by Aeneas, and fell like high pine trees to the ground. Brave Menelaus pitied them in their fall, and made his way to the front, 
clad in gleaming bronze and brandishing his spear, for Mars egged him on to do so, with intent that he should be killed by Aeneas. But Antilochus the son of Nestor saw him, and sprang forward, fearing that the king might come to harm and thus bring all their labour to nothing. When, therefore, Aeneas and Menelaus were setting their hands and spears against one another, eager to do battle, Antilochus placed himself by the side of Menelaus. Aeneas, bold though he was, drew back on seeing the two heroes side by side in front of him. So they drew the bodies of Crethon and Arsilochus to the ranks of the Achaeans, and committed the two poor fellows into the hands of their comrades. They then turned back and fought in the front ranks. They killed Pylaemenes, peer of Mars, leader of the Paphlagonian warriors. Menelaus struck him on the collarbone as he was standing on his chariot, while Antilochus hit his charioteer and squire, Mydon, the son of Antimnius, who was turning his horses in flight. He hit him with a stone upon the elbow, and the reins, enriched with white ivory, fell from his hands into the dust. Antilochus rushed towards him and struck him on the temples with his sword, whereon he fell head first from the chariot to the ground. There he stood for a while with his head and shoulders buried deep in the dust, for he had fallen on sandy soil till his horses kicked him and laid him flat on the ground, as Antilochus lashed them and drove them off to the host of the Achaeans. But Hector marked them from across the ranks, and with a loud cry rushed towards them, followed by the strong battalions of the Trojans. Mars and dread Enyo led them on, she fraught with ruthless turmoil of battle, while Mars wielded a monstrous spear and went about, now in front of Hector and now behind him. Diomed shook with passion as he saw them. As a man crossing a wide plain is dismayed to find himself on the brink of some great river rolling swiftly to the sea, he sees its boiling waters and starts back in fear. Even so did the son of Tydeus give ground. Then he said to his men, My friends, how can we wonder that Hector wields the spear so well? Some god is ever by his side to protect him, and now Mars is with him in the likeness of mortal man. Keep your faces, therefore, towards the Trojans, but give ground backwards, for we dare not fight with gods. As he spoke, the Trojans drew close up, and Hector killed two men, both in one chariot, Menesthes and Anchialus, heroes well versed in war. Ajax, son of Telamon, pitied them in their fall. He came close up and hurled his spear, hitting Amphius, the son of Selagus, a man of great wealth who lived in Paesus and owned much corn-growing land, but his lot had led him to come to the aid of Priam and his sons. Ajax struck him in the belt, the spear pierced the lower part of his belly, and he fell heavily to the ground. Then Ajax ran towards him to strip him of his armor, but the Trojans rained spears upon him, many of which fell upon his shield. He planted his heel upon the body, and drew out his spear, but the darts pressed so heavily upon him that he could not strip the goodly armor from his shoulders. The Trojan chieftains, moreover, many and valiant, came about him with their spears, so that he dared not stay. Great, brave, and valiant though he was, they drove him from them, and he was beaten back. Thus, then, did the battle rage between them. Presently the strong hand of fate impelled Tlepolemus, the son of Hercules, a man both brave and of great stature, to fight Serpedon. So the two, son and grandson of great Jove, drew near to one another, and Tlepolemus spoke first. Sarpedon, said he, counsellor of the Lycians, why should you come skulking here, you who are a man of peace? They lie who call you son of ages, bearing Jove, for you are little like those who were of old his children. Far other was Hercules, my own brave and lion-hearted father, who came here for the horses of Laomedon, and though he had six ships only, and few men to follow him, sacked the city of Ilius, and made a wilderness of her highways. You are a coward, and your people are falling from you, for all your strength, and all your coming from Lycia, you will be no help to the Trojans, but will pass the gates of Hades, vanquished by my hand. And Serpedon, captain of the Lycians, answered, Tlepolemus, your father overthrew Ilius by reason of Laomedon's folly in refusing payment to one who had served him well. He would not give your father the horses which he had come so far to fetch. As for yourself, you shall meet death by my spear. You shall yield glory to myself, and your soul to Hades of the noble steeds. Thus spoke Serpedon, and Tlepolemus upraised his spear. They threw at the same moment, and Serpedon struck his foe in the middle of his throat. The spear went right through, and the darkness of death fell upon his eyes. Tlepolemus' spear struck Serpedon on the left thigh with such force that it tore through the flesh and grazed the bone, but his father as yet warded off destruction from him. 
His comrades bore Sarpedon out of the fight, in great pain by the weight of the spear that was dragging from his wound. They were in such haste and stress as they bore him that no one thought of drawing the spear from his thigh so as to let him walk uprightly. Meanwhile the Achaeans carried off the body of Tlepolemus, whereon Ulysses was moved to pity and panted for the fray as he beheld them. He doubted whether to pursue the son of Jove or to make slaughter of the Lycian rank and file. It was not decreed, however, that he should slay the son of Jove. Minerva, therefore, turned him against the main body of the Lycians. He killed Corianus, Alastor, Chromius, Alcandrus, Halius, Noamon, and Protanus, and would have slain yet more had not great Hector marked him, and sped to the front of the fight, clad in his suit of mail, filling the Danaeans with terror. Sarpedon was glad when he saw him coming, and besought him, saying, Son of Priam, let me not be here to fall into the hands of the Danaeans. Help me, and since I may not return home to gladden the hearts of my wife and of my infant son, let me die within the walls of your city. Hector made him no answer, but rushed onward to fall at once upon the Achaeans and kill many among them. His comrades then bore Sarpedon away, and lay him beneath Jove's spreading oak tree. Pelagon, his friend and comrade, drew the spear out of his thigh, but Sarpedon fainted, and a mist came over his eyes. Presently he came to himself again, for the breath of the north wind as it played upon him gave him new life, and brought him out of the deep swoon into which he had fallen. Meanwhile the Argives were neither driven towards their ships by Mars and Hector, nor yet did they attack them. When they knew that Mars was with the Trojans they retreated, but kept their faces still turned towards the foe. Who then was first, and who was last to be slain by Mars and Hector? They were valiant Teuthras, and Orestes the renowned charioteer, Trichus the Aetolian warrior, Oenomaus, Helenus the son of Oenops, and Orsibius of the gleaming girdle, who was possessed of great wealth, and dwelt by the Cephisian lake with the other Boeotians who lived near him, owners of a fertile country. Now when the goddess Juno saw the Argives thus falling, she said to Minerva, Alas, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, unweariable! The promise we made Menelaus that he should not return till he had sacked the city of Ilius will be of no effect if we let Mars rage thus furiously. Let us go into the fray at once. Minerva did not gainsay her. Thereon the august goddess, daughter of great Saturn, began to harness her gold-bedizened steeds. Hebe, with all speed, fitted on the eight-spoked wheels of bronze that were on either side of the iron axle-tree. The fellows of the wheels were gold, imperishable, and over these there was a tire of bronze wondrous to behold. The knaves of the wheels were silver, turning round the axle upon either side. The car itself was made with plated bands of gold and silver, and it had a double top-rail running all round it. From the body of the car there went a pole of silver, on to the end of which she bound the golden yoke, with the bands of gold that were to go under the necks of the horses. Then Juno put her steeds under the yoke, eager for battle and the war-cry. Meanwhile Minerva flung her richly embroidered vesture, made with her own hands, on to her father's threshold, and donned the shirt of Jove, arming herself for battle. She threw her tasseled aegis about her shoulders, wreathed round with rout as with a fringe, and on it were strife, and strength, and panic whose blood runs cold. Moreover there was the head of the dread monster Gorgon, grim and awful to behold, portent of aegis bearing Jove. On her head she set her helmet of gold, with four plumes, and coming to a peak both in front and behind, decked with the emblems of a hundred cities. Then she stepped into her flaming chariot, and grasped the spear, so stout and sturdy and strong, with which she quells the ranks of heroes who have displeased her. Juno lashed the horses on, and the gates of heaven bellowed as they flew open of their own accord, gates over which the hours preside, in whose hands are heaven and Olympus, either to open the dense cloud that hides them, or to close it. Through these the goddesses drove their obedient steeds, and found the son of Saturn sitting all alone on the topmost ridges of Olympus. There Juno stayed her horses, and spoke to Jove the son of Saturn, lord of all. "'Father Jove,' said she, "'are you not angry with Mars for these high doings? How great and goodly a host of the Achaeans he has destroyed, to my great grief, and without either right or reason, while the Cyprian and Apollo are enjoying it all at their ease, and setting this unrighteous madman on to do further mischief. I hope, Father Jove, that you will not be angry if I hit Mars hard, and chase him out of the battle. And Jove answered, 
set Minerva onto him, for she punishes him more often than anyone else does. Juno did as he had said. She lashed her horses, and they flew forward nothing loth midway betwixt earth and sky. As far as a man can see when he looks out upon the sea from some high beacon, so far can the loud neighing horses of the gods spring at a single bound. When they reached Troy, and the place where its two flowing streams, Samois and Scamander, meet, there Juno stayed them and took them from the chariot. She hid them in a thick cloud, and Samois made ambrosia spring up for them to eat. The two goddesses then went on, flying like turtle doves in their eagerness to help the Argives. When they came to the part where the bravest and most in number were gathered about mighty Diomed, fighting like lions or wild boars of great strength and endurance, there Juno stood still and raised a shout like that of brazen-voiced Stentor, whose cry was as loud as that of fifty men together. Argives, she cried, shame on cowardly creatures, brave in semblance only. As long as Achilles was fighting, if his spear was so deadly that the Trojans dared not show themselves outside the Dardanian gates, but now they sally far from the city, and fight even at your ships. With these words she put heart and soul into them all, while Minerva sprang to the side of the son of Tydeus, whom she found near his chariot and horses, cooling the wound that Pandarus had given him. For the sweat caused by the hand that bore the weight of his shield irritated the hurt. His arm was weary with pain, and he was lifting up the strap to wipe away the blood. The goddess laid her hand on the yoke of his horses and said, the son of Tydeus is not such another as his father. Tydeus was a little man, but he could fight, and rushed madly into the fray even when I told him not to do so. When he went all unattended as envoy to the city of Thebes among the Cadmians, I bade him feast in their houses and be at peace, but with that high spirit which was ever present with him, he challenged the youth of the Cadmians, and at once beat them in all that he attempted, so mightily did I help him. I stand by you too to protect you, and I bid you be instant in fighting the Trojans, but either you are tired out, or you are afraid and out of heart, and in that case I say that you are no true son of Tydeus, the son of Oeneus. Diomed answered, I know you, goddess, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, and will hide nothing from you. I am not afraid nor out of heart, nor is there any slackness in me. I am only following your own instructions. You told me not to fight any of the blessed gods, but if Jove's daughter Venus came into battle, I was to wound her with my spear. Therefore I am retreating, and bidding the other Argives gather in this place, for I know that Mars is now lording it in the field. Diomed, son of Tydeus, replied Minerva, man after my own heart, fear neither Mars nor any other of the immortals, for I will befriend you. Nay, drive straight at Mars and smite him in close combat. Fear not this raging madman, villain incarnate, first on one side and then on the other. But now he was holding talks with Juno and myself, saying he would help the Argives and attack the Trojans. Nevertheless, he is with the Trojans, and has forgotten the Argives. With this she caught hold of Sthenelus, and lifted him off the chariot on to the ground. In a second he was on the ground, whereupon the goddess mounted the car and placed herself by the side of Diomed. The oaken axle groaned aloud under the burden of the awful goddess and the hero. Pallas Minerva took the whip and reins, and drove straight at Mars. He was in the act of stripping huge Periphus, son of Ochysius and bravest of the Aetolians. Bloody Mars was stripping him of his armor, and Minerva donned the helmet of Hades that he might not see her. When, therefore, he saw Diomed, he made straight for him and let Periphus lie where he had fallen. As soon as they were at close quarters, he let fly with his bronze spear over the reins and yoke, thinking to take Diomed's life, but Minerva caught the spear in her hand and made it fly harmlessly over the chariot. Diomed then threw, and Pallas Minerva drove the spear into the pit of Mars's stomach, where his undergirdle went round him. There Diomed wounded him, tearing his fair flesh, and then drawing his spear out again. Mars roared as loudly as nine or ten thousand men in the thick of a fight, and the Achaeans and Trojans were struck with panic, so terrible was the cry he raised. As a dark cloud in the sky when it comes on to blow after heat, even so did Diomed, son of Tydeus, see Mars ascend into the broad heavens. With all speed he reached high Olympus, home of the gods, and in great pain sat down beside Jove, the son of Saturn. He showed Jove the immortal blood that was flowing from his wound, and spoke piteously, saying, Father Jove, are you not angered by such doings? We gods are continually suffering in the most cruel manner at one another's hands while helping mortals. 
and we all owe you a grudge for having begotten that mad termagant of a daughter, who is always committing outrage of some kind. We other gods must all do as you bid us, but her you neither scold nor punish. You encourage her because the pestilent creature is your daughter. See how she has been inciting proud Diomed to vent his rage on the immortal gods. First he went up to the Cyprian, and wounded her in the hand near her wrist, and then he sprang upon me, too, as though he were a god. Had I not run for it, I must either have lain there for long enough in torments among the ghastly corpses, or else have been eaten alive with spears till I had no more strength left in me. Jove looked angrily at him, and said, Do not come whining here, sir, facing both ways. I hate you worst of all the gods in Olympus, for you were ever fighting and making mischief. You have the intolerable and stubborn spirit of your mother Juno. It is all I can do to manage her, and it is her doing that you are now in this plight. Still, I cannot let you remain longer in such great pain. You are my own offspring, and it was by me that your mother conceived you. If, however, you had been the son of any other god, you are so destructive that by this time you should have been lying lower than the titans. He then bade Paeon heal him, whereon Paeon spread pain-killing herbs upon his wound and cured him, for he was not of mortal mould. As the juice of the fig-tree curdles milk, and thickens it in a moment, though it is liquid, even so instantly did Paeon cure fierce Mars. Then Hebe washed him, and clothed him in goodly raiment, and he took his seat by his father Jove, all glorious to behold. But Juno of Argos, and Minerva of Alalcomen, now that they had put a stop to the murderous doings of Mars, went back again to the house of Jove. End of Book 5「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri. The Iliad by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book Six. Glaucus and Diomede. The Story of Bellerophon. Hector and Andromache. The fight between Trojans and Achaeans was now left to rage as it would, and the tide of war surged hither and thither over the plain as they aimed their bronze-shod spears at one another between the streams of Simois and Xanthus. First Ajax, son of Telamon, tower of strength to the Achaeans, broke a phalanx of the Trojans, and came to the assistance of his comrades by killing Achamas, son of Eusorus, the best man among the Thracians, being both brave and of great stature. The spear struck the projecting peak of his helmet, its bronze point then went through his forehead into the brain, and darkness veiled his eyes. Then Diomede killed Exilus, son of Teuthranus, a rich man who lived in the strong city of Erisbe, and was beloved by all men, for he had a house by the roadside, and entertained every one who passed, howbeit not one of his guests stood before him to save his life. And Diomede killed both him and his squire Calesius, who was then his charioteer. So the pair passed beneath the earth. Euryalus killed Dresus and Opheltius, and then went in pursuit of Asipus and Pedasus, whom the naiad nymph Abarborea had borne to noble Bucolion. Bucolion was eldest son to Laodamon, but he was a bastard. While tending his sheep he had converse with the nymph, and she conceived twin sons. These the son of Mecisteus now slew, and he stripped the armour from their shoulders. Polypoetes then killed Astyalus, Ulysses, Pedites of Percote, and two Sir Aretean. Ablerus fell by the spear of Nestor's son Antilochus, and Agamemnon, king of men, killed Elatus, who dwelt in Pedasus by the banks of the river Satinoeus. Latus killed Phylacus as he was flying, and Eurypylus slew Melanthus. Then Menelaus of the loud war-cry took Adrestus alive, for his horses ran into a tamarisk bush, as they were flying wildly over the plain, and broke the pole from the car. They went on towards the city along with the others in full flight, but Adrestus rolled out, and fell in the dust flat on his face by the wheel of his chariot. Menelaus came up to him, spear in hand, but Adrestus caught him by the knees, begging for his life. "'Take me alive,' he cried, son of Atreus, and you shall have a full ransom for me. My father is rich, and has much treasure of gold, bronze, and wrought iron laid by in his house. 
From this store he will give you a large ransom, should he hear of my being alive and at the ships of the Achaeans. Thus did he plead, and Menelaus was for yielding and giving him to a squire to take to the ships of the Achaeans. But Agamemnon came running up to him and rebuked him. My good Menelaus, said he, this is no time for giving quarter. Has then your house fared so well at the hands of the Trojans? Let us not spare a single one of them, not even the child unborn and in its mother's womb. Let not a man of them be left alive, but let all in Ilias perish, unheeded and forgotten. Thus did he speak, and his brother was persuaded by him, for his words were just. Menelaus therefore thrust Adrestus from him, whereon King Agamemnon struck him in the flank, and he fell. Then the son of Atreus planted his foot upon the breast to draw his spear from the body. Meanwhile Nestor shouted to the Argive, saying, My friends, Danaan warriors, servants of Mars, let no man lag that he may spoil the dead, and bring back much booty to the ships. Let us kill as many as we can. The bodies will lie upon the plain, and you can despoil them later at your leisure. With these words he put heart and soul into them all. And now the Trojans would have been routed and driven back into Ilias had not Priam's son Helenus, wisest of augurs, said to Hector and Aeneas, Hector and Aeneas, you two are the mainstays of the Trojans and Lycians, for you are foremost at all times, alike in fight and counsel. Hold your ground here, and go about among the host to rally them in front of the gates, or they will fling themselves into the arms of their wives, to the great joy of our foes. Then, when you have put heart into all our companies, we will stand firm here and fight the Danaeans, however hard they press us, for there is nothing else to be done. Meanwhile, do you, Hector, go to the city and tell our mother what is happening. Tell her to bid the matrons gather at the temple of Minerva in the Acropolis. Let her then take her key and open the doors of the sacred building. There, upon the knees of Minerva, let her lay the largest, fairest robe she has in her house, the one she sets most store by. Let her, moreover, promise to sacrifice twelve yearling heifers that have never yet felt the goad in the temple of the goddess, if she will take pity on the town, with the wives and little ones of the Trojans, and keep the son of Tydeus from falling on the goodly city of Ilius, for he fights with fury and fills men's souls with panic. I hold him mightiest of them all. We did not fear even their great champion Achilles, son of a goddess though he be, as we do this man. His rage is beyond all bounds, and there is none can vie with him in prowess. Hector did as his brother bade him. He sprang from his chariot, and went about everywhere among the host, brandishing his spears, urging the men on to fight, and raising the dread cry of battle. Thereon they rallied, and again faced the Achaeans, who gave ground and ceased their murderous onset, for they deemed that some one of the immortals had come down from starry heaven to help the Trojans, so strangely had they rallied. And Hector shouted to the Trojans, Trojans and allies, be men, my friends, and fight with might and main, while I go to Ilias and tell the old men of our council and our wives to pray to the gods, and vow hecatombs in their honour. With this he went his way, and the black rim of hide that went round his shield beat against his neck and his ankles. Then Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, and the son of Tydeus, went into the open space between the hosts to fight in single combat. When they were close up to one another, Diomede of the loud war-cry was the first to speak. "'Who, my good sir,' said he, "'who are you among men? I have never seen you in battle until now, but you are daring beyond all others if you abide my onset. Woe to those fathers whose sons face my might! If, however, you are one of the immortals, and have come down from heaven, I will not fight you. For even valiant Lycurgus, son of Dryas, did not live long when he took to fighting with the gods. He it was drove the nursing women who were in charge of frenzied Bacchus through the land of Nysa, and they flung their thyrsi on the ground as murderous Lycurgus beat them with his ox-goad. Bacchus himself plunged terror-stricken into the sea, and Thetis took him to her bosom to comfort him, for he was scared by the fury with which the man reviled him. Thereon the gods who live at ease were angry with Lycurgus, and the son of Saturn struck him blind, nor did he live much longer after he had become hateful to the immortals. Therefore I will not fight with the blessed gods, but if you are of them that eat the fruit of the ground, draw near, and meet your doom. And the son of Hippolochus answered, Son of Tydeus, why ask me of my lineage? Men come and go as leaves year by year upon the trees. 
those of autumn the wind sheds upon the ground, but when spring returns the forest buds forth with fresh vines. Even so is it with the generations of mankind. The new spring up as the old are passing away. If then you would learn my descent, it is one that is well known to many. There is a city in the heart of Argos, pasture land of horses called Ephira, where Sisyphus lived, who was the craftiest of all mankind. He was the son of Aeolus, and had a son named Glaucus, who was father to Bellerophon, whom heaven endowed with the most surpassing comeliness and beauty. But Proetus devised his ruin, and being stronger than he, drove him from the land of the Argives over which Jove had made him ruler. For Antea, wife of Proetus, lusted after him, and would have had him lie with her in secret. But Bellerophon was an honourable man, and would not, so she told lies about him to Proetus. Proetus said she kill Bellerophon or die, for he would have had converse with me against my will. The king was angered, but shrank from killing Bellerophon, so he sent him to Lycia with lying letters of introduction, written on a folded tablet and containing much ill against the bearer. He bade Bellerophon show these letters to his father-in-law, to the end that he might thus perish. Bellerophon therefore went to Lycia, and the gods conveyed him safely. When he reached the river Xanthus, which is in Lycia, the king received him with all good will, feasted him nine days, and killed nine heifers in his honour. But when rosy-fingered morn appeared upon the tenth day, he questioned him, and desired to see the letter from his son-in-law Proetus. When he had received the wicked letter, he first commanded Bellerophon to kill that savage monster, the Chimera, who was not a human being, but a goddess, for she had the head of a lion and the tail of a serpent, while her body was that of a goat, and she breathed forth flames of fire. But Bellerophon slew her, for he was guided by signs from heaven. He next fought the far-famed Solomy, and this, he said, was the hardest of all his battles. Thirdly, he killed the Amazons, women who were the peers of men, and as he was returning thence the king devised yet another plan for his destruction. He picked the bravest warriors in all Lycia, and placed them in ambuscade. But not a man ever came back, for Bellerophon killed every one of them. Then the king knew that he must be the valiant offspring of a god, so he kept him in Lycia, gave him his daughter in marriage, and made him of equal honour in the kingdom with himself, and the Lycians gave him a piece of land, the best in all the country, fair with vineyards and tilled fields, to have and to hold. The king's daughter bore Bellerophon three children, Isander, Hippolochus, and Laodamia. The lord of council lay with Laodamia, and she bore him noble Sarpedon. But when Bellerophon came to be hated by all the gods, he wandered all desolate and dismayed upon the Aelian plain, gnawing at his own heart, and shunning the path of men. Mars, insatiate of battle, killed his son Isander while he was fighting the Solomy. His daughter was killed by Diana of the Golden Reins, for she was angered with her. But Hippolochus was father to myself, and when he sent me to Troy he urged me again and again to fight ever among the foremost and outvie my peers, so as not to shame the blood of my fathers, who were the noblest in Ephira and in all Lycia. This, then, is the descent I claim. Thus did he speak and the heart of Diomede was glad. He planted his spear in the ground, and spoke to him with friendly words. Then he said, You are an old friend of my father's house. Great Aeneas once entertained Bellerophon for twenty days, and the two exchanged presents. Aeneas gave a belt rich with purple, and Bellerophon a double cup, which I left at home when I sent out for Troy. I do not remember Tydeus, for he was taken from us while I was yet a child, when the army of the Achaeans was cut to pieces before Thebes. Henceforth, however, I must be your host in Middle Argos, and you mine in Lycia, if I should ever go there. Let us avoid one another's spears even during a general engagement. There are many noble Trojans and allies whom I can kill, if I overtake them and heaven delivers them into my hand. So again with yourself. There are many Achaeans whose lives you may take if you can. We too, then, will exchange armour, that all present may know of the old ties that subsist between us. With these words they sprang from their chariots, grasped one another's hands, and plighted friendship. But the son of Saturn made Glaucus take leave of his wit, for he exchanged golden armour for bronze, the worth of a hundred head of cattle, for the worth of nine. Now when Hector reached the Scaean gates and the oak tree, the wives and daughters of the Trojans came running towards him to ask after their sons, brothers, kinsmen, and husbands. 
He told them to set about praying to the gods, and many were made sorrowful as they heard him. Presently he reached the splendid palace of King Priam, adorned with colonnades of hewn stone. In it there were fifty bedchambers, all of hewn stone, built near one another, where the sons of Priam slept, each with his wedded wife. Opposite these, on the other side of the courtyard, there were twelve upper rooms, also of hewn stone for Priam's daughters, built near one another, where his sons-in-law slept with their wives. When Hector got there, his fond mother came to him with Laodice, the fairest of her daughters. She took his hand within her own, and said, "'My son, why have you left the battle to come hither? Are the Achaeans, woe betide them, pressing you hard about the city, that you have thought fit to come and uplift your hands to Jove from the citadel?' Wait till I can bring you wine, that you may make offering to Jove and to the other immortals, and may then drink and be refreshed. Wine gives a man fresh strength when he is wearied, as you now are with fighting on behalf of your kinsmen. And Hector answered, Honoured mother, bring no wine, lest you unman me, and I forget my strength. I dare not make a drink offering to Jove with unwashed hands. One who is bespattered with blood and filth may not pray to the son of Saturn. Get the matrons together, and go with offerings to the temple of Minerva, driver of the spoil. There, upon the knees of Minerva, lay the largest and fairest robe you have in your house, the one you set most store by. Promise, moreover, to sacrifice twelve yearling heifers that have never yet felt the goad, in the temple of the goddess, if she will take pity on the town, with the wives and little ones of the Trojans, and keep the son of Tydeus from off the goodly city of Ilias, for he fights with fury, and fills men's souls with panic. Go then to the temple of Minerva, while I seek Paris, and exhort him, if he will hear my words. Would that the earth might open her jaws and swallow him, for Jove bred him to be the bane of the Trojans, and of Priam and Priam's sons. Could I but see him go down into the house of Hades, my heart would forget its heaviness. His mother went into the house, and called her waiting women, who gathered the matrons throughout the city. She then went down into her fragrant storeroom, where her embroidered robes were kept, the work of Sidonian women, whom Alexandrus had brought over from Sidon when he sailed the seas upon that voyage during which he carried off Helen. Hecuba took out the largest robe, and the one that was most beautifully enriched with embroidery, as an offering to Minerva. It glittered like a star, and lay at the very bottom of the chest. With this she went on her way, and many matrons with her. When they reached the temple of Minerva, lovely Theano, daughter of Cisseus and wife of Antinor, opened the doors, for the Trojans had made her priestess of Minerva. The women lifted up their hands to the goddess with a loud cry, and Theano took the robe to lay it upon the knees of Minerva, praying the while to the daughter of great Jove. "'Holy Minerva,' she cried, "'protectoress of our city, mighty goddess, break the spear of Diomed and lay him low before the Scaean gates. Do this, and we will sacrifice twelve heifers that have never yet known the goad in your temple, if you will have pity upon the town, with the wives and the little ones of the Trojans.' Thus she prayed. But Pallas Minerva granted not her prayer. While they were thus praying to the daughter of great Jove, Hector went to the fair house of Alexandrus, which he had built for him by the foremost builders in the land. They had built him his house, storehouse, and courtyard near those of Priam and Hector on the Acropolis. Here Hector entered, with a spear eleven cubits long in his hand. The bronze point gleamed in front of him, and was fastened to the shaft of the spear by a ring of gold. He found Alexandrus within the house, busied about his armor, his shield and cuirass, and handling his curved bow. There, too, sat Argive Helen with her women, setting them their several tasks, and as Hector saw him he rebuked him with words of scorn. "'Sir,' said he, "'you do ill to nurse this rancor. The people perish fighting round this our town.' You would yourself chide one whom you saw shirking his part in the combat. Up, then, or ere long the city will be in a blaze. And Alexandrus answered, Hector, your rebuke is just. Listen, therefore, and believe me when I tell you that I am not here so much through rancor or ill-will towards the Trojans, as from a desire to indulge my grief. My wife was even now gently urging me to battle, and I hold it better that I should go. <clears throat> For victory is ever fickle. Wait, then, while I put on my armor, or go first, and I will follow. I shall be sure to overtake you. Hector made no answer, but Helen tried to soothe him. Brother, said she, to my abhorred and sinful self, 
Would that a whirlwind had caught me up on the day my brother brought me forth, and had borne me to some mountain or to the waves of the roaring sea that should have swept me away ere this mischief had come about. But since the gods have devised these evils, would at any rate that I had been wife to a better man, to one who could smart under dishonour and men's evil speeches? This fellow was never yet to be depended upon, nor never will be, and he will surely reap what he has sown. Still, brother, come in and rest upon this seat, for it is you who bear the brunt of that toil that has been caused by my hateful self and by the sin of Alexandrus, both of whom Jove has doomed to be a theme of song among those that shall be born hereafter. And Hector answered, Bid me not be seated, Helen, for all the good will you bear me. I cannot stay. I am in haste to help the Trojans, who miss me greatly when I am not among them. But urge your husband, and of his own self also let him make haste to overtake me before I am out of the city. I must go home to see my household, my wife and my little son, for I know not whether I shall ever again return to them, or whether the gods will cause me to fall by the hands of the Achaeans. Then Hector left her, and forthwith was at his own house. He did not find Andromache for she was on the wall with her child and one of her maids, weeping bitterly. Seeing then that she was not within, he stood on the threshold of the women's rooms, and said, Women, tell me, and tell me true, where did Andromache go when she left the house? Was it to my sisters, or to my brother's wives? Or is she at the temple of Minerva, where the other women are propitiating that awful goddess? His good housekeeper answered, Hector, since you bid me tell you truly, she did not go to your sisters, nor to your brother's wives nor yet to the temple of Minerva, where the other women are propitiating the awful goddess. But she is on the high wall of Ilius, for she had heard the Trojans were being hard-pressed, and that the Achaeans were in great force. She went to the wall in frenzied haste, and the nurse went with her carrying the child. Hector hurried from the house when she had done speaking, and went down the streets by the same way that he had come. When he had gone through the city, and had reached the Scaean gates through which he would go out on to the plain, his wife came running toward him, Andromache, daughter of great Aetion, who ruled in Thebes under the wooded slopes of Mount Placus, and was king of the Sicilians. His daughter had married Hector, and now came to meet him with a nurse who carried his little child in her bosom, a mere babe, Hector's darling son, and lovely as a star. Hector had named him Scamandrius, but the people called him Astyanax, for his father stood alone as chief guardian of Ilius. Hector smiled as he looked upon the boy, but did not speak, and Andromache stood beside him, weeping, and taking his hand in her own. "'Dear husband,' said she, "'your valour will bring you to destruction. Think on your infant son, and on my hapless self, who ere long shall be your widow, for the Achaeans will set upon you in a body and kill you. It would be better for me should I lose you to lie dead and buried, for I shall have nothing left to comfort me when you are gone, save only sorrow. I have neither father nor mother now. Achilles slew my father when he sacked Thebe, the goodly city of the Sicilians. He slew him, but did not for very shame despoil him. When he had burned him in his wondrous armour, he raised a barrow over his ashes, and the mountain nymphs, daughters of Aegis-bearing Jove, planted a grove of elms about his tomb. I had seven brothers in my father's house, but on the same day they all went within the house of Hades. Achilles killed them, as they were with their sheep and cattle. My mother, her who had been queen of all the land under Mount Bacchus, he brought hither with the spoil, and freed her for a great sum. But the archer-queen Diana took her in the house of your father. Nay, Hector, you who to me are father, mother, brother, and dear husband, have mercy upon me. Stay here upon this wall, make not your child fatherless, and your wife a widow. As for the host, place them near the fig-tree, where the city can be best scaled, and the wall is weakest. Thrice have the bravest of them come thither and assailed it, under the two Ajaxes, Idomeneus, the sons of Atreus, and the brave son of Tydeus, either of their own bidding, or because some soothsayer had told them. And Hector answered, Wife, I too have thought on all this. But with what face should I look upon the Trojans, men or women, if I shirked battle like a coward? I cannot do so. I know nothing save to fight bravely in the forefront of the Trojan host, and win renown alike for my father and myself. Well do I know that the day will surely come when mighty Ilias shall be destroyed with Priam and Priam's people. But I grieve for none of these, not even for Hecuba, nor King Priam, nor for my brothers, many and brave who may fall in the dust before their foes. 
for none of these do I grieve as for yourself, when the day shall come on which one of the Achaeans shall rob you for ever of your freedom, and bear you weeping away. It may be that you will have to ply the loom in Argos at the bidding of a mistress, or to fetch water from the springs Messeus or Hyperia, treated brutally by some cruel taskmaster. Then will one say who sees you weeping, She was wife to Hector, the bravest warrior among the Trojans during the war before Ilius. On this your tears will break forth anew for him who would have put away the day of captivity for you. May I lie dead under the barrow that is heaped over my body, ere I hear you cry as they carry you into bondage. He stretched his arms toward his child, but the boy cried, and nestled in his nurse's bosom, scared at the sight of his father's armor, and at the horsehair bloom that nodded fiercely from his helmet. His father and mother laughed to see him, but Hector took the helmet from his head and laid it all gleaming upon the ground. Then he took his darling child, kissed him, and dandled him in his arms, praying over him the while to Jove and to all the gods. Jove, he cried, grant that this my child may be even as myself chief among the Trojans. Let him be not less excellent in strength, and let him rule Ilias with his might. Then may one say of him as he comes back from battle, The son is far better than the father. May he bring back the blood-stained spoils of him whom he has laid low, and let his mother's heart be glad. With this he laid the child again in the arms of his wife, who took him to her own soft bosom, smiling through her tears. As her husband watched her, his heart yearned towards her, and he caressed her fondly, saying, My own wife, do not take these things too bitterly to heart. No one can hurry me down to Hades before my time. But if a man's hour is come, be he brave or be he coward, there is no escape for him when he has once been born. Go then within the house, and busy yourself with your daily duties, your loom, your distaff, and the ordering of your servants. For war is man's matter, and mine above all others of them that have been born in Ilias. He took his plumed helmet from the ground, and his wife went back again to her house, weeping bitterly and often looking back towards him. When she reached her home she found her maidens within, and bade them all join her in her lament. So they mourned Hector in his own house, though he was yet alive, for they deemed that they should never see him return safe from battle, and from the furious hands of the Achaeans. Paris did not remain long in his house. He donned his goodly armor overlaid with bronze, and hasted through the city as fast as his feet could take him. As a horse, stabled and fed, breaks loose and gallops gloriously over the plain to the place where he is wont to bathe in the fair-flowing river, he holds his head high, and his mane streams upon his shoulders as he exults in his strength, and flies like the wind to the haunts and feeding-ground of mares. Even so went forth Paris from high Pergamus, gleaming like sunlight in his armor, and he laughed aloud as he sped swiftly on his way. Forthwith he came upon his brother Hector, who was then turning away from the place where he had held converse with his wife, and he was himself the first to speak. Sir, said he, I fear that I have kept you waiting when you are in haste, and have not come as quickly as you bade me. My good brother, answered Hector, you fight bravely, and no man with any justice can make light of your doings in battle, but you are careless and willfully remiss. It grieves me to the heart to hear the ill that the Trojans speak about you, for they have suffered much on your account. Let us be going, and we will make things right hereafter, should Jove vouchsafe us to set the cup of our deliverance before ever-living gods of heaven in our own homes, when we have chased the Achaeans from Troy. End of Book Six Book Seven of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hector and Ajax fight. Hector is getting worsted when night comes on and parts them. They exchange presents, the burial of the dead, and the building of the wall round their ships by the Achaeans. The Achaeans buy their wine of Agamemnon and Menelaus. With these words Hector passed through the gates, and his brother Alexandros with him, both eager for the fray. As when heaven sends a breeze to sailors who have long looked for one in vain, and have labored at their oars till they are faint with toil, even so welcome was the sight of these two heroes to the Trojans. Thereon Alexandrus killed Menestheus, the son of Erythos, 
He lived in Arne, and was the son of Erethos, the mace-man, and of Philomedusa. Hector threw a spear at Oeneus, and struck him dead with a wound in the neck under the bronze rim of his helmet. Glaucus, moreover, son of Hippolochus, captain of the Lycians, in hard hand-to-hand -hand fight, smote Iphinos, son of Dexius, on the shoulder, as he was springing onto his chariot behind his fleet mares. So he fell to the earth from the car, and there was no life left in him. When, therefore, Minerva saw these men making havoc of the Argives, she darted down to Ilius from the summits of Olympus, and Apollo, who was looking on from Pergamus, went out to meet her, for he wanted the Trojans to be victorious. The pair met by the oak tree, and King Apollo, son of Jove, was first to speak. "'What would you have,' he said, daughter of great Jove, "'that your proud spirit has sent you hither from Olympus? "'Have you no pity upon the Trojans? "'And would you incline the scales of victory in favour of the Danans? "'Let me persuade you, for it will be better thus. "'Stay the combat for to-day, "'but let them renew the fight hereafter "'till they compass the doom of Ilius, "'since you, goddess, have made up your mind to destroy the city.' "'And Minerva answered, "'So be it, far darter. It was in this mind that I came down from Olympus to the Trojans and Achaeans. Tell me, then, how do you propose to end this present fighting? Apollo, son of Jove, replied, Let us incite great Hector to challenge one of the Danans in single combat. On this the Achaeans will be shamed into finding a man who will fight him. Minerva assented, and Helenus, son of Priam, divined the counsel of the gods. He therefore went up to Hector and said, Hector, son of Priam, Peer of gods in council, I am your brother. Let me then persuade you. Bid the other Trojans and Achaeans, all of them, take their seats, and challenge the best man among the Achaeans to meet you in single combat. I have heard the voice of the ever-living gods, and the hour of your doom is not yet come. Hector was glad when he heard this saying, and went in among the Trojans, grasping his spear in the middle to hold them back, and they all sat down. Agamemnon, also bade the Achaeans be seated, but Minerva and Apollo, in the likeness of vultures, perched on Father Jove's high oak tree, proud of their men, and the ranks sat close ranged together, bristling with shield and helmet and spear. As when the rising west wind furs the face of the sea, and the waters grow dark beneath it, so sat the companies of the Trojans and Achaeans upon the plain. And Hector spoke thus, Hear me, Trojans and Achaeans, that I may speak even as I am minded, Jove, on his high throne, has brought our oaths and covenants to nothing, and foreshadows ill for both of us, till you either take the towers of Troy, or are yourselves vanquished at your ships. The princes of the Achaeans are here present in the midst of you. Let him, then, that will fight me stand forward as your champion against Hector. Thus, I say, and may Jove be witness between us. If your champion slay me, let him strip me of my armor and take it to your ships. But let him send my body home, that the Trojans and their wives may give me my dues of fire when I am dead. In like manner, if Apollo vouchsafe me glory, and I slay your champion, I will strip him of his armor, and I will take it to the city of Ilius, where I will hang it in the temple of Apollo. But I will give up his body, that the Achaeans may bury him at their ships, and build him a mound by the wide waters of the Hellespont. Then will one say hereafter, as he sails his ship over the sea, This is the monument of one who died long since, a champion who was slayed by mighty Hector. Thus will one say, and my fame shall not be lost. Thus did he speak, but they all held their peace, ashamed to decline the challenge, yet fearing to accept it, till at last Menelaus rose and rebuked them, for he was angry. Alas, he cried, vain braggarts, woman forsooth, not man. Double-dyed, indeed, will be the stain upon us, if no man of the Danans will now face Hector. May you be turned every man of you into earth and water, as you sit, spiritless and inglorious, in your places. I will myself go out against this man, but the upshot of the fight will be from on high in the hands of the immortal gods. With these words he put on his armor, and then, O Menelaus, your life would have come to an end at the hands of Hector, for he was a far better man had not the princes of the Achaeans sprung upon you and checked you. King Agamemnon caught him by the right hand and said, Menelaus, you are mad. A truce to this is folly. Be patient in spite of passion. 
do not think of fighting a man so much stronger than yourself as Hector, son of Priam, who is feared by many another as well as you. Even Achilles, who is far more doughty than you are, shrank from meeting him in battle. Sit down your own people, and the Achaeans will send some other champion to fight Hector. Fearless and fond of battle though he be, I ween his knees will bend gladly under him if he comes out alive from the hurly-burly of this fight. With these words of reasonable counsel he persuaded his brother, whereon his squires gladly stripped the armor from off his shoulders. Then Nestor rose and spoke. Of a truth, he said, the Achaean land is fallen upon evil times. The old knight Peleus, counsellor and orator among the Myrmidons, loved when I was in his house to question me concerning the race and lineage of all the Argives. How would it not grieve him could he hear of them now as quelling before Hector? Many a time would he lift his hands in prayer that his soul might leave his body and go down within the house of Hades. Would by father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo that I was still young and strong as when the Pylians and Arcadians were gathered in fight by the rapid river Caledon under the walls of Phia and round about the waters of the river Yardanus. The godlike hero Ereuthalion stood forward as their champion, with the armor of King Ariathos upon his shoulders. Ariathos, who men and women surnamed the Mace Man, because he fought neither with bow nor spear, but broke the battalions of the foe with his iron mace. Lycurgus killed him, not in fair fight, but by entrapping him in a narrow way where his mace served him in no stead. For Lycurgus was too quick for him, and speared him through the middle, so he fell to earth on his back. Lycurgus then spoiled him of the armor which Mars had given him, and bore it in battle thence forward. But when he grew old and stayed at home, he gave it to his faithful squire Ereuthalion, who in the same armor challenged the foremost men among us. But my high spirit bade me fight him, though none other would venture. I was the youngest man of them all, but when I fought him, Minerva vouchsafed me victory. He was the biggest and strongest man I ever killed, and conquered much ground as he laid sprawled upon the earth. Would that I were still young and strong as I was then, for the son of Priam would then soon find one who would face him. Foremost among the whole host though you be, have none of you any stomach for fighting Hector. Thus did the old man rebuke them, and forthwith nine men started to their feet. Foremost of all uprose King Agamemnon, and after him brave Diomed, the son of Tydeus. Next were the two Ajaxes, men clothed in valor as with a garment, and then Idomeneus, and Myrianes his brother in arms. After these Eurypylus, son of Oimon, Thoas, son of Andreamon, and Ulysses also rose. Then Nestor, knight of Gerene, again spoke, saying, Cast lots among you to see who will be chosen. If he comes alive out of this fight, he will have done good service alike to his own soul and to the Achaeans. Thus he spoke, and when each of them had marked his lot, and had thrown it into the helmet of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, the people lifted their hands in prayer. And thus would one of them say as he looked into the vault of heaven, Father Jove, grant that the lot fall on Ajax, or on the son of Tydeus, or upon the king of rich Mycenae himself. As they were speaking, Nestor, knight of Gerene, shook the helmet, and from it there fell the very lot which they wanted, the lot of Ajax. The herald bore it about and showed it to all the chieftains of the Achaeans, going from left to right, but they none of them owned it. When, however, in due course he reached the man who had written upon it and had put it into the helmet, the brave Ajax held out his hand, and the herald gave him the lot. When Ajax saw his mark he knew it and was glad. He threw it to the ground and said, My friends, the lot is mine, and I rejoice, for I shall vanquish Hector. I will put on my armor. Meanwhile, pray to King Jove in silence among yourselves that the Trojans may not hear you, or aloud if you will, for we fear no man. None shall overcome me, neither by force nor cunning, for I was born and bred in Salamis, and can hold my own in all things. With this they fell praying to King Jove, the son of Saturn, and thus would one of them say as he looked into the vault of heaven, Father Jove that rulest from Ida, most glorious in power, vouchsafe victory to Ajax, and let him win great glory. But if you wish well to Hector also, and would protect him, grant to each of them equal fame and prowess. Thus they prayed, and Ajax armed himself in his suit of gleaming bronze. 
When he was in full array, he sprang forward as monstrous Mars when he takes part among men whom Jove has set fighting with one another. Even so did huge Ajax, bulwark of the Achaeans, spring forward with a grim smile on his face as he brandished his long spear and strode onward. The Argives were elated as they beheld him, but the Trojans trembled in every limb, and the heart even of Hector beat quickly. But he could not now retreat and withdraw into the ranks behind him, for he had been the challenger. Ajax came up, bearing his shield in front of him like a wall, a shield of bronze with seven folds of oxhide, the work of Tycheus, who lived in Hylae and was by far the best worker in leather. He had made it with the hides of seven full-fed bulls, and over these he had set an eighth layer of bronze. Holding his shield before him, Ajax, son of Telamon, came close up to Hector, and menaced him, saying, Hector, you shall now learn, man to man, what kind of champions the Danans have among them, even besides the lion-hearted Achilles, cleaver of the ranks of men. He now abides at the ships in anger with Agamemnon, shepherd of his people, but there are many of us who are well able to face you. Therefore begin the fight. And Hector answered, Noble Ajax, son of Telamon, captain of the host, treat me not as though I were some puny boy or woman that cannot fight. I have long been used to the blood and butcheries of battle. I am quick to turn my leathered shield either to the right or left, for this I deem the main thing in battle. I can charge among the chariots and horsemen, and in hand-to-hand -hand fighting can delight the heart of Mars. Howbeit I would not take such a man as you off his guard, but I will smite you openly if I can. He poised his spear as he spoke, and hurled it from him. It struck the sevenfold shield in its outermost layer, the eighth which was of bronze, and went through six of the layers, but in the seventh hide it stayed. Then Ajax threw his in turn, and struck the round shield of the son of Priam. The terrible spear went through his gleaming shield, and pressed onward through his cuirass of cunning workmanship. It pierced the shirt against his side, but he swerved and thus saved his life. They then each of them drew out the spear from his shield, and fell on one another like savage lions or wild boars of great strength and endurance. The son of Priam struck the middle of Ajax's shield, but the bronze did not break, and the point of his dart was turned. Ajax then sprang forward and pierced the shield of Hector. The spear went through it and staggered him as he sprang forward to attack. It gashed his neck, and the blood came pouring out from the wound. But even so, Hector did not cease fighting. He gave ground, and with his brawny hand seized a stone, rugged and huge, that was lying upon the plain. With this he struck the shield of Ajax on the boss that was in the middle, so that the bronze rang again. But Ajax in his turn caught up a far larger stone, swung it aloft, and hurled it with prodigious force. This millstone of a rock broke Hector's shield inwards, and threw him down on his back, the shield crushing him under it. But Apollo raised him at once. Thereon they would have hacked at one another in close combat with their sword, had not the heralds, messengers of the gods and men, come forward, one from the Trojans and the other from the Achaeans. Talthebius and Idaeus, both of them honorable men, these parted them with their staves, and the good herald Idaeus said, My sons, fight no longer, you are both of you valiants, and both are dear to Jove. We know this, but night is falling, and the behests of night may not be well gainsaid. Ajax, son of Telamon, answered, Idaeus, bid Hector say so, for it was he that challenged our princes. Let him speak first, and I will accept his saying. Then Hector said, Ajax, heaven has vouchsafed you stature and strength and judgment, and in wielding the spear you excel all others of the Achaeans. Let us for this day cease fighting. Hereafter we will fight anew till heaven decide between us, and give victory to one or the other. Night is now falling, and the behests of night may not be well gainsaid. Gladden, then, the hearts of the Achaeans at your ships, and more especially those of your own followers and clansmen, while I, in the great city of King Priam, bring comfort to the Trojans and their women, who vie with one another in their prayers on my behalf. Let us, moreover, exchange presents, that it may be said among the Achaeans and the Trojans, they fought with might and main, but were reconciled and parted in friendship. On this he gave Ajax a silver-studded sword, with its sheath and leather baldric, and in return Ajax gave him a girdle dyed with purple. Thus they parted, and one going to the host of the Achaeans, and the other to that of the Trojans, who rejoiced when they saw their hero come to them safe and unharmed from the strong hands of the mighty Ajax. They led him therefore to the city as one who had been saved beyond their hopes. On the other side, the Achaeans brought Ajax elated with victory to Agamemnon. 
When they reached the quarters of the son of Atreus, Agamemnon sacrificed for them a five-year-old bull in honor of Jove, the son of Saturn. They flayed his carcass, made it ready, and divided it into joints. These they cut carefully into smaller pieces, putting them on the spits, roasting them sufficiently, and then drawing them off. When they had done all this, and had prepared the feast, they ate it, and every man had his full and equal share, so that they were satisfied, and King Agamemnon gave Ajax some slices cut lengthways down the loin, as a mark of special honor. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, old Nestor, whose counsel was ever truest, began to speak. With all sincerity and good will, therefore, he addressed them thus. Son of Atreus and other chieftains, inasmuch as many of the Achaeans are now dead, whose blood Mars has shed by the banks of the Scamander, and their souls have gone down to the house of Hades, it will be well when morning comes that we should cease fighting. We will then wheel our dead together with oxen and mules, and burn them not far from the ships, that when we sail hence we may take the bones of our comrades home to their children. Hard by the funeral pier we will build a barrow that shall be raised from the plain for all in common. Near this let us set about building a high wall to shelter ourselves and our ships, and let it have well-made gates, that there may be a way through them for our chariots. Close outside we will dig a deep trench all around it to keep off both horse and foot, that the Trojan chieftains may not bear hard upon us. Thus he spoke, and the princes shouted in applause. Meanwhile the Trojans held a council, angry and full of discord, on the Acropolis by the gates of King Priam's palace. And wise Antenor spoke. Hear me, he said, Trojans and Dardanians and allies, that I may speak even as I am minded. Let us give up our give Helen and her wealth to the sons of Atreus, for we are now fighting in violation of our solemn covenants, and shall not prosper till we have done as I say. He then sat down, and Alexandrus, husband of the lovely Helen, rose to speak. Antenor, he said, your words are not to my liking. You can find a better saying than this, if you will, if, however, you have spoken in good earnest. Then indeed has heaven robbed you of your reason. I will speak plainly, and hereby notify to the Trojans that I will not give up the woman. But the wealth that I brought home with her from Argos I will restore, and I will add yet further of my own. On this, when Paris had spoken and taken his seat, Priam of the race of Dardanus, peer of the gods in council, rose and with all sincerity and good will addressed them thus. Hear me, Trojans, Dardanians, and allies, that I may speak even as I am minded. Get your suppers now, as hitherto throughout the city, but keep your watches and be wakeful. At daybreak let Idaeus go to the ships, and tell Agamemnon and Menelaus, sons of Atreus, the saying of Alexandrus, through whom this quarrel has come about. And let him also be instant with them that they now cease fighting till we burn our dead. Hereafter we will fight anew, till heaven decide between us and give victory to one or the other. Thus did he speak, and they did even what he said. They took their supper in their companies, and at daybreak Idaeus went his way to the ships. He found the Danaeans, servants of Mars, in council at the stern of Agamemnon's ship, and took his place in the midst of them. Sons of Atreus, he said, and princes of the Achaean host, Priam and the other Trojans have sent me to tell you of the sayings of Alexandros, through whom this quarrel has come about, if so be that you may find it acceptable. All the treasure he took with him in his ships to Troy, would be he had sooner perished, he will restore, and will add yet further of his own. But he will not give up the wedded wife of Menelaus, though the Trojans would have him do so. Priam bade me inquire further, if you will cease fighting till we burn our dead, hereafter we will fight anew, till heaven decide between us and give victory to one or to the other. They all held their peace, but presently Diomed of the loud war cry, saying, let there be no taking, neither treasure nor yet Helen, for even a child may see that the doom of the Trojans is at hand. The sons of the Achaeans shouted their applause at the words that Diomed had spoken, and thereon Agamemnon said to Idaeus, Idaeus, you have heard the answer the Achaeans make you, and I with them. But as concerning the dead, I give you leave to bury them. For when men are once dead, there should be no grudging them the rites of fire. Let Jove, the mighty husband of Juno, be witness to this covenant. As he spoke, he upheld his scepter in the sight of the gods, and Idaeus went back to his strong city of Ilias. The Trojans and Dardanians were gathering in council, waiting his return. When he came, he stood in their midst and delivered his message. 
As soon as they heard it, they set about their twofold labor, some gathering corpses, others bringing wood. The Argives, on their part, also hastened from their ships, some to gather corpses, and others to bring in wood. The sun was beginning to beat upon the field, fresh risen into the vault of heaven from the slow still currents of deep Oceanus when the two armies met. They could hardly recognize their dead, but they washed the clotted gore from off them, shed tears over them, and lifted them upon their wagons. Priam had forbidden the Trojans to wail aloud, so they heaped their dead sadly and silently upon the pyre, and having burned them, went back to the city of Ilius. The Achaeans in like manner heaped their dead sadly and silently on the pyre, and having burned them, went back to their ships. Now in the twilight, when it was not yet dawn, chosen bands of the Achaeans were gathering round the pyre, and built one barrow that was raised in common for all. And hard by this they built a high wall to shelter themselves in their ships. They gave it strong gates, that there might be a way through them for their chariots, and close outside it they dug a trench, deep and wide, and they planted it within with stakes. Thus did the Achaeans toil, and the gods, seated by the side of Jove the Lord of Lightning, marveled at their great work. But Neptune, Lord of the Earthquake, spoke, saying, Father Jove, what mortal in the whole world will again take the gods into his counsel? See you not how the Achaeans have built a wall about their ships and driven a trench around it, without offering hectatomes for the gods? The fame of this wall will reach as far as dawn itself, and men will no longer think anything of the one which Phoebus Apollo and myself built with so much labor for Laomon. Jove was displeased, and answered, What, O shaker of the earth, are you talking about? A god less powerful than yourself might be alarmed at what they are doing. But your fame reaches as far as dawn itself, Surely when the Achaeans have gone home with their ships, you can shatter their wall and fling it into the sea. You can cover the beach with sand again, and the great wall of the Achaeans will then be utterly effaced. Thus did they converse, and by sunset the work of the Achaeans was complete. They had slaughtered oxen in their tents, and got their supper. Many ships had come with wine from Lemnos, sent by Oinus, the son of Jason, born to him by Hypsipyle. The son of Jason freighted them with ten thousand measures of wine, which they sent specially to the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon, and Menelaus. From this supply the Achaeans bought their wine, some with bronze, some with iron, some with hides, some with whole heifers, and some again with captives. They spread a goodly banquet, and feasted the whole night through, as also did the Trojans and their allies in the city. But all the time Jove boded ill and roared with his portentous thunder. Pale fear got hold upon them and they spilled the wine from their cups on to the ground. Nor did any dare to drink till he had made offerings to the most mighty son of Saturn. Then they laid themselves down to rest, and enjoyed the boon of sleep. End of Book 7 of the Iliad Book 8 of the Iliad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Iliad by Homer Book Eight: The Victory of the Trojans Now when morning, clad in her robe of saffron, had begun to suffuse light over the earth, Jove called the gods in council on the topmost crest of serrated Olympus. Then he smoke, and all the other gods gave ear. Hear me, said he, gods and goddesses, that I may speak even as I am minded. Let none of you, neither goddess nor god, try to cross me, but obey me every one of you that I may bring this matter to an end. If I see any one acting a part, and helping either Trojans or Danaeans, he shall be beaten inordinately ere he come back again to Olympus, or I will hurl him down into the dark Tartarus far into the deepest pit under the earth, where the gates are iron and the floor bronze, as far beneath Hades as heaven is high above the earth, that you may learn how much the mightiest I am among you. Try me and find out for yourselves. Hangs me a golden chain from heaven, and lay hold of it all of you, gods and goddesses together, Tug as you will, you will not drag Jove the supreme counsellor from heaven to earth.
but were I to pull at it myself, I should draw you up with earth and sea into the bargain. Then would I bind the chain about some pinnacle of Olympus, and leave you all dangling in the mid-firmament. So far am I above all others, either of gods or men." They were frightened, and all of them held their peace, for he had spoken masterfully. But at last Minerva answered, "'Father, son of Saturn, king of kings, we all know that your might is not to be gainsaid, but we are also sorry for the Danaan warriors, who are perishing and coming to a bad end. We will, however, since you so bid us, refrain from actual fighting, but we will make serviceable suggestions to the Argives that they may not all of them perish in your displeasure." Job smiled at her, and answered, "'Take heart, my child, Trito-born. I am not really in earnest, and I wish to be kind to you." With this he yoked his fleet horses, with hoofs of bronze and manes of glittering gold. He girded himself also with gold about the body, seized his gold whip, and took his seat in his chariot. Thereon he lashed his horses, and they flew forward, nothing loth, midway twixt earth and starry heaven. After a while he reached many fountained Ida, mother of wild beasts, and Gargarus, where are his grove and fragrant altar. There the father of gods and men stayed his horses, took them from the chariot, and hid them in a thick cloud. Then he took his seat all glorious upon the topmost crests looking down upon the city of Troy, and the ships of the Achaeans. The Achaeans took their morning meal hastily at the ships, and afterwards put on their armour. The Trojans, on the other hand, likewise armed themselves throughout the city, fewer in numbers, but nevertheless eager perforce to do battle for their wives and children. All the gates were flung wide open, and horse and foot sallied forth with a tramp as of a great multitude. When they were got together in one place, shield clashed with shield, and spear with spear, in the conflict of mail-clad men. Mighty was the din as the bossed shields pressed hard on one another. Death, cry, and shout of triumph of slain and slayers, and the earth ran red with blood. Now so long as the day waxed, and it was still morning, their weapons beat against one another, and the people fell. But when the sun had reached mid-heaven, the sire of all balanced his golden scales, and put two fates of death within them, one for the Trojans, and the other for the Achaeans. He took the balance by the middle, and when he lifted it up, the day of the Achaeans sank. The death-fraught scale of the Achaeans settled down upon the ground, while that of the Trojans rose heavenwards. Then he thundered aloud from Ida and sent the glare of his lightning upon the Achaeans. When they saw this, pale fear fell upon them, and they were sore afraid. Idomeneus dared not stay, nor yet Agamemnon, nor did the two Ajaxes, servants of Mars, hold their ground. Nestor, knight of Gerene, alone stood firm, bulwark of the Achaeans. Not of his own will, but one of his horses was disabled. Alexandrus, husband of lovely Helen, had hit it with an arrow just on the top of its head, where the mane begins to grow away from the skull, a very deadly place. The horse bounded in his anguish as the arrow pierced his brain, and his struggles threw others into confusion. The old man immediately began cutting the traces with his sword, but Hector's fleet horses bore down upon him through the rout with their bold charioteer, even Hector himself and the old man would have perished there and then, had not Diomed been quick to mark, and with a loud cry called Ulysses to help him. Ulysses, he cried, noble son of Laertes, where are you flying to, with your back turned like a coward? See that you are not struck with a spear between the shoulders. Stay here and help me to defend Nestor from this man's furious onset. Ulysses would not give ear, but sped onward to the ships of the Achaeans and the son of Tydeus, flinging himself alone into the thick of the fight, took his stand before the horses of the son of Neleus. Sir, said he, these young warriors are pressing you hard. Your force is spent, and age is heavy upon you. Your squire is naught, and your horses are slow to move. 
Mount my chariot, and see what the horses of Tros can do, how cleverly they can scud hither and thither over the plain, either in flight or in pursuit. I took them from the hero Aeneas. Let our squires attend to your own steeds, but let us drive mine straight at the Trojans, that Hector may learn how furiously I too can wield my spear. Nestor, knight of Gerene, hearkened to his words. Thereon the doughty squires, Sthenelus and kind-hearted Eurymedon, saw to Nestor's horses, while the two both mounted Diomed's chariot. Nestor took the reins in his hands, and lashed the horses on. They were soon close up with Hector, and the son of Tydeus aimed a spear at him as he was charging full speed towards them. He missed him, but struck his charioteer and squire, Eniopius, son of noble Thebaeus, in the breast by the nipple, while the reins were in his hands, so that he died there and then, and the horses swerved as he fell headlong from the chariot. Hector was greatly grieved at the loss of his charioteer, but let him lie for all his sorrow, while he went in quest of another driver. Nor did his steeds have to go long without one, for he presently found brave Archetolemus, the son of Iphitus, and made him get up behind the horses, giving the reins into his hand. All had then been lost, and no help for it, for they would have been penned up in Ilias like sheep, had not the sire of gods and men been quick to mark, and hurled a fiery flaming thunderbolt which fell just in front of Diomed's horses with a flare of burning brimstone. The horses were frightened, and tried to back beneath the car, while the reins dropped from Nestor's hands. Then he was afraid, and said to Diomed, Son of Tydeus, turn your horses in flight. See you not that the hand of Jove is against you? To-day he vouchsafes victory to Hector. To-morrow, if it so please him, he will again grant it to ourselves. No man, however brave, may thwart the purpose of Jove, for he is far stronger than any. Diomed answered, All that you have said is true. There is a grief, however, which pierces me to the very heart, for Hector will talk among the Trojans and say, The son of Tydeus fled before me to the ships. This is the vaunt he will make, and may earth then swallow me. Son of Tydeus, replied Nestor, what mean you? Though Hector say that you were a coward, the Trojans and Dardanians will not believe him, nor yet the wives of the mighty warriors whom you have laid low. So saying, he turned the horses back through the thick of the battle, and with a cry that rent the air, the Trojans and Hector rained their darts after them. Hector shouted to him, and said, Son of Tydeus! The Danaeans have done you honour hitherto as regards your place at table, the meals they give you, and the filling of your cup with wine. Henceforth they will despise you, for you are become no better than a woman. Be off, girl and coward that you are! You shall not scale our walls through any flinching upon my part, neither shall you carry off our wives in your ships, for I shall kill you with my own hand." The son of Tydeus was in two minds, whether or no, to turn his horses round again and fight him. Thrice did he doubt, and thrice did Jove thunder from the heights of Ida, in token to the Trojans that he would turn the battle in their favour. Hector then shouted to them, and said, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians, lovers of close fighting, be men, my friends, and fight with might and with main. I see that Jove is minded to vouchsafe victory and great glory to myself, while he will deal destruction upon the Danaeans. Fools for having thought of building this weak and worthless wall! It shall not stay my fury. My horses will spring lightly over their trench, and when I am at their ships, forget not to bring me fire that I may burn them, while I slaughter the Argives, who will be all dazed and bewildered by the smoke." And he cried to his horses, Xanthus and Podargus, and you, Aethon, and goodly Lampus, pay me for your keep now, and for all the honey-sweet corn with which Andromache, daughter of great Aetion, has fed you, and for which she has mixed wine and water for you to drink whenever you would, before doing so even for me, who am her own husband. Haste in pursuit, that we may take the shield of Nestor, 
the fame of which ascends to heaven, for it is of solid gold, arm-rods and all, and that we may strip from the shoulders of Diomed the cuirass which Vulcan made him. Could we take these two things, the Achaeans would set sail in their ships this selfsame night. Thus did he vaunt, but Queen Juno made high Olympus quake as she shook with rage upon her throne. Then said she to the mighty god of Neptune, What now, wide-ruling lord of the earthquake, can you find no compassion in your heart for the dying Danaeans, who bring you many a welcome offering to Helis and to Aegae? Wish them well, then, if all of us who are with the Danaeans were to drive the Trojans back, and keep Jove from helping them, he would have to sit there sulking alone on Ida. King Neptune was greatly troubled, and answered, Juno, rash of tongue, what are you talking about? We other gods must not set ourselves against Jove, for he is far stronger than we are. Thus did they converse, but the whole space enclosed by the ditch, from the ships even to the wall, was filled with horses and warriors, who were pent up there by Hector, son of Priam, now that the hand of Jove was with him. He could even have set fire to the ships and burned them, had not Queen Juno put it into the mind of Agamemnon, to bestir himself and to encourage the Achaeans. To this end he went round the ships and tents, carrying a great purple cloak, and took his stand by the huge black hull of Ulysses' ship, which was middlemost of all. It was from this place that his voice would carry farthest, on the one hand towards the tents of Ajax, son of Telamon, and on the other towards those of Achilles, for these two heroes, well assured of their own strength, had valorously drawn up their ships at the two ends of the line. From this spot, then, with a voice that could be heard afar, he shouted to the Danaeans, saying, Argives! Shame on you cowardly creatures, brave in semblance only! Where are now our vaunts that we should prove victorious, the vaunts we made so vaingloriously in Lemnos, when we ate the flesh of horned cattle and filled our mixing-bowls to the brim? You vowed that you would each of you stand against a hundred or two hundred men, and now you prove no match even for one, for Hector, who will be ere long setting our ships in a blaze. Father Jove, did you ever so ruin a great king and rob him so utterly of his greatness? Yet, when to my sorrow I was coming hither, I never let my ship pass your altars without offering the fat and thigh bones of heifers upon every one of them, so eager was I to sack the city of Troy. Vouchsafe me then this prayer, suffer us to escape at any rate with our lives, and let not the Achaeans be so utterly vanquished by the Trojans. Thus did he pray, and Father Jove, pitying his tears, vouchsafed him that his people should live, not die. Forthwith he sent them an eagle, most unfailingly portentous of all birds, with a young fawn in its talons. The eagle dropped the fawn by the altar on which the Achaeans sacrificed to Jove the lord of omens. When, therefore, the people saw that the bird had come from Jove, they sprang more fiercely upon the Trojans, and fought more boldly. There was no man of all the many Danaeans who could then boast that he had driven his horses over the trench and gone forth to fight, sooner than the son of Tydeus. Long before any one else could do so, he slew an armed warrior of the Trojans, Agilus the son of Phradmon. He had turned his horses in flight, but the spear struck him in the back, midway between his shoulders, and went right through his chest, and his armor rang rattling round him as he fell forward from his chariot. After him came Agamemnon and Menelaus, sons of Atreus, the two Ajaxes clothed in valor as with a garment. Idomeneus and his companion-in-arms Meriones, peer of murderous Mars, and Eurypylus, the brave son of Euaemon. Ninth came Teuser with his bow, and took his place under cover of the shield of Ajax, son of Telamon. When Ajax lifted his shield, Teuser would peer round, and when he had hit any one in the throng, the man would fall dead. 
Then Teucer would hie back to Ajax as a child to its mother, and again duck down under his shield. Which of the Trojans did brave Teucer first kill? Orsilochus, and then Ormenus, and Ophelestes, Dator, Chromius, and godlike Lycomphites, Amopion son of Polyamon, and Melanippus. These in turn did he lay low upon the earth, and King Agamemnon was glad when he saw him making havoc of the Trojans with his mighty bow. He went up to him and said, Teucer, man after my own heart, son of Telamon, captain among the host, shoot on, and be at once the saving of the Danaeans and the glory of your father Telamon, who brought you up and took care of you in his own house when you were a child, bastard though you were. Cover him with glory, although he is far off. I will promise, and I will assuredly perform, if Aegis bearing Jove and Minerva grant me to sack the city of Ilius, you shall have the next best meed of honour after my own, a tripod, or two horses with their chariot, or a woman who shall go up into your bed. And Teucer answered, Most noble son of Atreus, you need not urge me. From the moment we began to drive them back to Ilius, I have never ceased, so far as in me lies, to look out for men whom I can shoot and kill. I have shot eight barbed shafts, and all of them have been buried in the flesh of warlike youths, but this mad dog I cannot hit. As he spoke he aimed another arrow straight at Hector, for he was bent on hitting him. Nevertheless he missed him, and the arrow hit Priam's brave son, Gorgithion in the breast. His mother, fair Castaniera, lovely as a goddess, had been married from a Syme, and now he bowed his head as a garden poppy in full bloom when it is weighed down by showers in spring. Even thus heavy bowed his head beneath the weight of his helmet. Again he aimed at Hector, for he was longing to hit him, and again his arrow missed, for Apollo turned it aside but he hit Hector's brave charioteer Archetolemus in the breast, by the nipple, as he was driving furiously into the fight. The horses swerved aside as he fell headlong from the chariot, and there was no life left in him. Hector was greatly grieved at the loss of his charioteer, but for all his sorrow he let him lie where he fell, and bade his brother Sebriones, who was hard by, take the reins. Sebriones did as he had said. Hector thereon with a loud cry sprang from his chariot to the ground, and seizing a great stone made straight for Teucer with intent to kill him. Teucer had just taken an arrow from his quiver, and had laid it upon the bowstring, but Hector struck him with the jagged stone as he was taking aim, and drawing the string to his shoulder. He hit him just where the collarbone divides the neck from the chest, a very deadly place and broke the sinew of his arm so that his wrist was less, and the bow dropped from his hand as he fell forward on his knees. Ajax saw that his brother had fallen, and running towards him bestrode him and sheltered him with his shield. Meanwhile his two trusty squires, Mecisteus, son of Echius, and Alastor, came up and bore him to the ships groaning in his great pain. Jove now again put heart into the Trojans, and they drove the Achaeans to their deep trench with Hector in all his glory at their head, as a hound grips a wild boar or lion in flank or buttock when he gives him chase, and watches warily for his wheeling, even so did Hector follow close upon the Achaeans, ever killing the hindmost as they rushed panic-stricken onwards. When they had fled through the set stakes and trench, and many Achaeans had been laid low at the hands of the Trojans, they halted at their ships, calling upon one another and praying every man instantly as they lifted up their hands to the gods. But Hector wheeled his horses this way and that, his eyes glaring like those of Gorgo or murderous Mars. Juno, when she saw them, had pity upon them, and at once said to Minerva, Alas, child of Aegis bearing Jove, shall you and I take no more thought for the dying Danaeans, though it be the last time we ever do so? See how they perish, and come to a bad end before the onset of but a single man. 
Hector the son of Priam rages with intolerable fury, and has already done great mischief. Minerva answered, Would, indeed, this fellow might die in his own land, and fall by the hands of the Achaeans. But my father Jove is mad with spleen, ever foiling me, ever headstrong and unjust. He forgets how often I saved his son, when he was worn out by the labours Eurystheus had laid on him. He would weep till his cry came up to heaven, and then Jove would send me down to help him. If I had had the sense to foresee all this, when Eurystheus sent him to the house of Hades, to fetch the hell-hound from Erebus, he would never have come back alive out of the deep waters of the river Styx. And now Jove hates me, while he lets Thetis have her way because she kissed his knees and took hold of his beard when she was begging him to do honour to Achilles. I shall know what to do next time he begins calling me his grey-eyed darling. Get our horses ready, while I go within the house of Aegis-bearing Jove and put on my armour. We shall then find out whether Priam's son Hector will be glad to meet us in the highways of battle, or whether the Trojans will glut hounds and vultures with the fat of their flesh as they be dead by the ships of the Achaeans. Thus did she speak, and white-armed Juno, daughter of great Saturn, obeyed her words. She set about harnessing her gold-bedizened steeds, while Minerva, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, flung her richly vesture, made with her own hands, on to the threshold of her father, and donned the shirt of Jove, arming herself for battle. Then she stepped into her flaming chariot, and grasped the spear so stout and sturdy and strong with which she quells the ranks of heroes who would have displeased her. Juno lashed her horses, and the gates of heaven bellowed as they flew open of their own accord, gates over which the hours preside, in whose hands are heaven and Olympus, either to open the dense cloud that hides them, or to close it. Through these the goddesses drove their obedient steeds. But Father Jove, when he saw them from Ida, was very angry, and sent winged Iris with a message to them. Go, said he, fleet Iris, turn them back, and see that they do not come near me, for if we come to fighting there will be mischief. This is what I say, and this is what I mean to do. I will lame their horses for them. I will hurl them from their chariot, and will break it in pieces. It will take them all ten years to heal the wounds my lightning shall inflict upon them. My grey-eyed daughter will then learn what quarrelling with her father means. I am less surprised and angry with Judo, for whatever I say she always contradicts me. With this Iris went her way, fleet as the wind from the heights of Ida to the lofty summits of Olympus. She met the goddesses at the outer gates of its many valleys, and gave them her message. What, said she, are you about? Are you mad? The son of Saturn forbids going. This is what he says, and this is what he means to do. He will lame your horses for you, he will hurl you from your chariot, and will break it in pieces. It will take you all ten years to heal the wounds his lightning will inflict upon you. That you may learn, grey-eyed goddess, what quarrelling with your father means. He is less hurt and angry with Juno, for whatever he says she always contradicts him. But you, bold hussy, will you really dare to raise your huge spear in defiance of Jove? With this she left them, and Juno said to Minerva, of a truth, child of Aegis-bearing Jove, I am not for fighting men's battles further in defiance of Jove. Let them live or die as luck will have it, and let Jove mete out his judgments upon the Trojans and Danaeans according to his own pleasure. She turned her steeds. The hours presently unyoked them, made them fast to their ambrosial majors, and leaned the chariot against the end wall of the courtyard. The two goddesses then sat down upon their golden thrones, amid the company of the other gods, but they were very angry. Presently Father Jove drove his chariot to Olympus, and entered the assembly of gods. 
the mighty lord of the earthquake unyoked his horses for him, set the car upon its stand, and threw a cloth over it. Jove then sat down upon his golden throne, and Olympus reeled beneath him. Minerva and Juno sat alone, apart from Jove, and neither spoke nor asked him questions. But Jove knew what they meant, and said, Minerva and Juno, why are you so angry? Are you fatigued with killing so many of your dear friends, the Trojans? Be this as it may, such is the might of my hands that all the gods in Olympus cannot turn me. You were both of you trembling all over, ere ever you saw the fight and its terrible doings. I tell you, therefore, and it would have surely been, I should have struck you with lightning, and your chariots would never have brought you back again to Olympus. Minerva and Juno groaned in spirit as they sat side by side, and brooded mischief for the Trojans. Minerva sat silent without a word, for she was in a furious passion, and bitterly incensed against her father. But Juno could not contain herself, and said, What, dread son of Saturn, are you talking about? We know how great your power is. Nevertheless we have compassion upon the Danaean warriors who are perishing and coming to a bad end. We will, however, since you so bid us, refrain from actual fighting, but we will make serviceable suggestions to the Argives, that they may not all of them perish in your displeasure. And Jove answered, To-morrow morning, Juno, if you choose to do so, you will see the son of Saturn destroying large numbers of the Argives, for fierce Hector shall not cease fighting till he has roused the son of Peleus, when they are fighting in dire straits at their ship's sterns about the body of Patroclus. Like it or no, this is how it is decreed. For aught I care you may go to the lowest depths beneath earth and sea, where Iapetus and Saturn dwell in lone Tartarus, with neither ray of light nor breath of wind to cheer them. You may go on and on till you get there, and I shall not care one whit for your displeasure. You are the greatest vixen living." Juno made him no answer. The sun's glorious orb now sank into Oceanus, and drew down night over the land. Sorry, indeed, were the Trojans when light failed them, but welcome, and thrice prayed for, did darkness fall upon the Achaeans. Then Hector led the Trojans back from the ships, and held a council on the open space near the river, where there was a spot clear of corpses. They left their chariots, and sat down on the ground to hear the speech he made them. He grasped a spear eleven cubits long, the bronze point of which gleamed in front of it, while the ring round its spearhead was of gold. Spear in hand he spoke. "'Hear me,' said he, "'Trojans, Dardanians, and allies. I deemed but now that I should destroy the ships and all the Achaeans with them, ere I went back to Ilius. But darkness came on too soon. It was this alone that saved them and their ships upon the seashore. Now, therefore, let us obey the behests of night, and prepare our suppers. Take your horses out of their chariots, and give them their feeds of corn. Then make speed to bring sheep and cattle from the city. Bring wine also, and corn for your horses, and gather much wood, that from dark till dawn we may burn watchfires whose flare may reach to heaven. For the Achaeans may try to fly beyond the sea by night, and they must not embark scatheless and unmolested. Many a man among them must take a dart with him to nurse at home, hit with spear or arrow as he is leaping on board his ship, that others may fear to bring war and weeping upon the Trojans. Moreover, let the heralds tell it about the city that the growing youths and grey-bearded men are to camp upon its heaven-built walls. Let the women, each of them, light a great fire in her house, and let watch be safely kept lest the town be entered by surprise while the host is outside. See to it, brave Trojans, as I have said, and let this suffice for the moment. At daybreak I will instruct you further. I pray and hope to Jove and to the gods that we may then drive those fate-sped hounds from our land, for tis the fates that have borne them and their ships hither. This night, therefore, let us keep watch. 
but with early morning let us put on our armor and rouse fierce war at the ships of the Achaeans. I shall then know whether brave Diomed the son of Tydeus will drive me back from the ships to the wall, or whether I shall myself slay him and carry off his blood-stained spoils. Tomorrow let him show his mettle. Abide my spear, if he dare. I ween that at break of day he shall be among the first to fall, and many another of his comrades round him. Would that I were as sure of being immortal and never growing old, and of being worshipped like Minerva and Apollo, as I am that this day will bring evil to the Argives. Thus spoke Hector, and their Trojans shouted applause. They took their sweating steeds from under the yoke, and made them fast each by his own chariot. They made haste to bring sheep and cattle from the city. They brought wine also, and corn from their houses, and gathered much wood. They then offered unblemished hecatombs to the immortals, and the wind carried the sweet savour of sacrifice to heaven. But the blessed gods partook not thereof, for they bitterly hated Ilias with Priam and Priam's people. Thus high in hope they sat through the livelong night by the highways of war, and many a watchfire did they kindle. As when the stars shine clear, and the moon is bright, there is not a breath of air, not a peak nor glade nor jutting headland, but it stands out in the ineffable radiance that breaks from the serene of heaven. The stars can all of them be told, and the heart of the shepherd is glad. Even thus shone the watchfires of the Trojans before Ilius, midway between the ships and the river Xanthus. A thousand campfires gleamed upon the plain, and in the glow of each there sat fifty men, while the horses, champing oats and corn beside their chariots, waited till dawn should come. End of Book Eight Book Nine of the Iliad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iliad by Homer. Translated by Samuel Butler. Book Nine. Recording by Michael Hellion. THE EMBASSY TO ACHILLES Thus did the Trojans watch, but Panic, comrade of blood-stained rout, had taken fast hold of the Achaeans, and their princes were all of them in despair. As when the two winds that blow from Thrace, the north and the northwest, spring up of a sudden and rouse the fury of the main, in a moment the dark waves uprear their heads and scatter their sea-rack in all directions. Even thus troubled were the hearts of the Achaeans. The son of Atreus, in dismay, bade the heralds call the people to a council, man by man, but not to cry the matter aloud. He made haste also himself to call them, and they sat sorry at heart in their assembly. Agamemnon shed tears as it were a running stream or cataract on the side of some sheer cliff, and thus, with many a heavy sigh, he spoke to the Achaeans. My friends, said he, princes and counsellors of the Argives, the hand of heaven has been laid heavily upon me. Cruel Jove gave me his solemn promise that I should sack the city of Troy before returning, but he has played me false, and is now bidding me go ingloriously back to Argos with the loss of much people. Such is the will of Jove, who has laid many a proud city in the dust as he will yet lay others, for his power is above all. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say, and sail back to our own country, for we shall not take Troy. Thus he spoke, and the sons of the Achaeans for a long while sat sorrowful there, but they all held their peace, till at last Diomede of the loud battle cry made answer, saying, Son of Atreus, I will chide your folly, as is my right in counsel. 
be not then aggrieved that I should do so. In the first place you attacked me before all the Danaans, and said I was a coward and no soldier. The Argives, young and old, know that you did so. But the son of scheming Saturn endowed you by halves only. He gave you honor as the chief ruler over us. But valor, which is the highest both right and might, he did not give you. Sir, think you that the sons of the Achaeans are indeed as unwarlike and cowardly as you say they are? If your own mind is set upon going home, go. The way is open to you. The many ships that followed you from Mycenae stand ranged upon the seashore, but the rest of us stay here till we have sacked Troy. Nay, though these two should turn homeward with their ships, Sthenelus and myself will still fight on till we reach the goal of Ilius, for heaven was with us when we came. The sons of the Achaeans shouted applause at the words of Diomede, and presently Nestor rose to speak. Son of Tydeus, said he, in war your prowess is beyond question, and in council you excel all who are of your own years. No one of the Achaeans can make light of what you say, nor gainsay it. But you have not yet come to the end of the whole matter. You are still young. You might be the youngest of my own children. Still, you have spoken wisely, and have counseled the chief of the Achaeans not without discretion. Nevertheless, I am older than you, and I will tell you everything. Therefore, let no man, not even King Agamemnon, disregard my saying, for he that foments civil discord is a clanless, hearthless outlaw. Now, however, let us obey the behests of night and get our suppers, but let the sentinels, every man of them, camp by the trench that is without the wall. I am giving these instructions to the young men. When they have been attended to, do you, son of Atreus, give your orders, for you are the most royal among us all. Prepare a feast for your counsellors. It is right and reasonable that you should do so. There is abundance of wine in your tents, which the ships of the Achaeans bring from Thrace daily. You have everything at your disposal wherewith to entertain guests, and you have many subjects. When many are got together, you can be guided by him whose counsel is wisest. And sorely do we need shrewd and prudent counsel, for the foe has lit his watchfires hard by our ships. Who can be other than dismayed? This night will either be the ruin of our host, or save it. Thus did he speak, and they did even as he had said. The sentinels went out in their armor under command of Nestor's son Thrasymedes, a captain of the host, and the bold warriors Escalaphus and Yalmanus. There were also Meriones, Aphareus, and Deopyrus, and the son of Creon, noble Lycomedes. There were seven captains of the sentinels, and with each there went a hundred youths armed with long spears. They took their places midway between the trench and the wall, and when they had done so, they lit their fires and got every man his supper. The son of Atreus then bade many counsellors of the Achaeans to his quarters prepared in a great feast in their honour. They laid their hands on the good things that were before them, and as soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, old Nestor, whose counsel was ever truest, was the first to lay his mind before them. He, therefore, with all sincerity and good will, addressed them thus. With yourself, most noble son of Atreus, king of men, Agamemnon, will I both begin my speech and end it, for you are king over much people. Jove, moreover, has vouchsafed you to wield the scepter and to uphold righteousness, that you may take thought for your people under you. Therefore it behooves you above all others both to speak and to give ear, and to out the counsel of another who shall have been minded to speak wisely. All turns on you and on your commands. Therefore I will say what I think will be best. No man will be of a truer mind than that which has been mine from the hour when you, sir, angered Achilles by taking the girl Briseis from his tent against my judgment. I urged you not to do so, but you yielded to your own pride, and dishonored a hero whom heaven itself had honored, for you still hold the prize that had been awarded to him. Now, however, let us think how we may appease him, both with presents and fair speeches that may conciliate him. And King Agamemnon answered, Sir, you have reproved my folly justly. I was wrong. I own it. 
one whom heaven befriends is in himself a host, and Jove has shown that he befriends this man by destroying much people of the Achaeans. I was blinded with passion, and yielded to my worser mind. Therefore I will make amends, and will give him great gifts by way of atonement. I will tell them in the presence of you all. I will give him seven tripods that have never yet been on the fire, and ten talents of gold. I will give him twenty iron cauldrons, and twelve strong horses that have won races and carried off prizes. Rich indeed, both in land and gold, is he that has as many prizes as my horses have won me. I will give him seven excellent workwomen, lesbians, whom I chose for myself when he took Lesbos, all of surpassing beauty. I will give him these, and with them her whom I erewhile took from him, the daughter of Briseus, and I swear a great oath that I never went up into her couch, nor have been with her after the manner of men and women. All these things will I give him now, and if hereafter the gods vouchsafe me to sack the city of Priam, let him come when we Achaeans are dividing the spoil, and load his ship with gold and bronze to his liking. Furthermore, let him take twenty Trojan women, the loveliest after Helen herself. Then, when we reach Achaean Argos, wealthiest of all lands, he shall be my son-in-law, and I will show him like honor with my own dear son Orestes, who is being nurtured in all abundance. I have three daughters, Chrysothemis, Laodice, and Iphianassa. Let him take the one of his choice, freely and without gifts of wooing, to the house of Peleus. I will add such dower to boot as no man ever yet gave his daughter, and will give him seven well-established cities, Cardamele, Anope, and Hiri, where there is grass, Holy Fairy and the rich meadows of Anthea, Epia also, and the vine-clad slopes of Pedasus, all near the sea, and on the borders of sandy Pelos. The men that dwell there are rich in cattle and sheep. They will honor him with gifts as though he were a god, and be obedient to his comfortable ordinances. All this will I do, if he will now forgo his anger. Let him then yield. It is only Hades who is utterly ruthless and unyielding, and hence he is of all gods the one most hateful to mankind. Moreover, I am older and more royal than himself. Therefore, let him now obey me. Then Nestor answered, Most noble son of Atreus, king of men, Agamemnon, the gifts you offer are no small ones. Let us then send chosen messengers who will make go to the tent of Achilles, son of Peleus, without delay. Let those go whom I shall name. Let Phoenix, dear to Jove, lead the way. Let Ajax and Ulysses follow, and let the heralds Odeus and Eurybates go with them. Now bring water for our hands, and bid all keep silence while we pray to Jove, the son of Saturn, if so be that he may have mercy upon us. Thus did he speak, and his saying pleased them well. Men servants poured water over the hands of the guests, while pages filled the mixing bowls with wine and water, and handed it round after giving every man his drink offering. Then, when they had made their offerings, and had drunk each as much as he was minded, the envoy set out from the tent of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, and Nestor, looking first to one, and then to another, but most especially at Ulysses, was instant with them that they should prevail with the noble son of Peleus. They went their way by the shore of the sounding sea, and prayed earnestly to earth-encircling Neptune that the high spirit of the son of Aeacus might incline favorably towards them. When they reached the ships and tents of the Myrmidons, they found Achilles playing on a lyre, fair, of cunning workmanship, and its crossbar was of silver. It was part of the spoils which he had taken when he had sacked the city of Aeacian, and he was now diverting himself with it, and singing the feats of heroes. He was alone with Patroclus, who sat opposite to him and said nothing, waiting till he should cease singing. Ulysses and Ajax now came in, Ulysses leading the way, and stood before him. Achilles sprang from his seat with the lyre still in hand, and Patroclus, when he saw the strangers, rose also. Achilles then greeted them, saying, All hail and welcome! You must come upon some great matter, you, who for all my anger are still dearest to me of the Achaeans. 
With this he led them forward, and bade them sit on seats covered with purple rugs. Then he said to Patroclus, who was close by him, Son of Menetius, set a larger bowl upon the table, mix less water with the wine, and give every man his cup, for these are very dear friends who are now under my roof. Patroclus did as his comrade bade him. He set the chopping block in front of the fire, and on it he laid the loin of a sheep, the loin also of a goat, and the chine of a fat hog. Automedon held the meat while Achilles chopped it. He then sliced the pieces and put them on spits, while the son of Menetius made the fire burn high. When the flame had died down, he spread the embers, laid the spits on top of them, lifting them up and setting them upon the spit racks, and he sprinkled them with salt. When the meat was roasted, he set it on platters, and handed bread round the table in fair baskets, while Achilles dealt them their portions. Then Achilles took his seat facing Ulysses against the opposite wall, and bade his comrade Patroclus offer sacrifice to the gods. So he cast the offerings into the fire, and they laid their hands upon the good things that were before them. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Ajax made a sign to Phoenix, and when he saw this, Ulysses filled his cup with wine and pledged Achilles. Hail, said he, Achilles, we have had no scant of good cheer, neither in the tent of Agamemnon, nor yet here. There has been plenty to eat and drink, but our thoughts turn upon no such matter. Sir, we are in the face of great disaster, and without your help know not whether we shall save our fleet or lose it. The Trojans and their allies have camped hard by our ships and by the wall. They have lit watchfires throughout their host, and deem that nothing can now prevent them from falling on our fleet. Jove, moreover, has sent his lightning on their right. Hector, in all his glory, rages like a maniac. Confident that Jove is with him, he fears neither God nor man, but is gone raving mad, and prays for the approach of day. He vows that he will hew the high sterns of our ships in pieces, set fire to their hulls, and make havoc of the Achaeans while they are dazed and smothered in smoke. I much fear that heaven will make good his boasting, and it will prove our lot to perish at Troy far from our home in Argos. Up, then, and late though it be, save the sons of the Achaeans, who faint before the fury of the Trojans. You will repent bitterly hereafter if you do not for when the harm is done, there will be no curing it. Consider ere it be too late, and save the Danaeans from destruction. My good friend, when your father Peleus sent you from Phythia to Agamemnon, did he not charge you, saying, Son, Minerva and Juno will make you strong if they choose, but check your temper, for the better part is in good will. Eschew vain quarrelling, and the Achaeans old and young will respect you more for doing so. These were his words, but you have forgotten them. Even now, however, be appeased, and put away your anger from you. Agamemnon will make you great amends if you will forgive him. Listen, and I will tell you what he has said in his tent that he will give you. He will give you seven tripods that have never yet been on the fire, and ten talents of gold, twenty iron cauldrons, and twelve strong horses that have won races and carried off prizes. Rich indeed, both in land and gold, is he who has had as many prizes as these horses have won for Agamemnon. Moreover, he will give you seven excellent workwomen, lesbians, whom he chose for himself when you took Lesbos, all of surpassing beauty. He will give you these, and with them her whom he erewhile took from you, the daughter of Briseus, and he will swear a great oath. He has never gone up into her couch, nor been with her after the manner of men and women. All these things will he give you now down, and if hereafter the gods vouchsafe him to sack the city of Priam, you can come when we Achaeans are dividing the spoil, and load your ship with gold and bronze to your liking. You can take twenty Trojan women, the loveliest after Helen herself. Then, when we reach Achaean Argos, wealthiest of all lands, you shall be his son-in-law, and he will show you like honor with his own dear son Orestes, who is being nurtured in all abundance. Agamemnon has three daughters— Chrysothemis, Laodice, and Iphianassa. You may take the one of your choice, freely and without gifts of wooing, to the house of Peleus. He will add such dower to boot as no man ever yet gave his daughter, and will give you seven well-established cities, Cardamele, Enope, and Hiri, where there is grass, Holy Phereus, and the rich meadows of Anthea. 
Epia also, and the vine-clad slopes of Pedasus, all near the sea and on the borders of sandy Pelos. The men that dwell there are rich in cattle and sheep. They will honor you with gifts as though you were a god, and be obedient to your comfortable ordinances. All this will he do if you will now forego your anger. Moreover, though you hate both him and his gifts with all your heart, yet pity the rest of the Achaeans who are being harassed in all their host. They will honor you as a god, and you will earn great glory at their hands. You might even kill Hector. He will come within your reach, for he is infatuated, and declares that not a Danaean whom the ships have brought can hold his own against him. Achilles answered, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, I should give you formal notice plainly, and in all fixity of purpose, that there be no more of this cajoling, from whatsoever quarter it may come. Him do I hate even as the gates of hell who says one thing while he hides another in his heart. Therefore, I will say what I mean. I will be appeased neither by Agamemnon son of Atreus, nor by any of the other Danaeans, for I see that I have no thanks for all my fighting. He that fights fares no better than he that does not. Coward and hero are held in equal honor, and death deals like measure to him who works and to him who is idle. I have taken nothing by all my hardships, with my life ever in my hand, as a bird when she has found a morsel takes it to her nestlings, and herself fares hardly. Even so many a long night have I been wakeful, and many a bloody battle have I waged by day against those who are fighting for their women. With my ships I have taken twelve cities, and eleven round about Troy have I stormed with my men by land. I took great store of wealth from every one of them, but I gave all up to Agamemnon, son of Atreus. He stayed where he was by his ships, yet of what came to him he gave little and kept much himself. Nevertheless, he did distribute some meads of honor among the chieftains and kings, and these have them still. For me alone of the Achaeans did he take the woman in whom I delighted. Let him keep her and sleep with her. Why, pray, must the Argives needs fight the Trojans? What made the son of Atreus gather the host to bring them? Was it not for the sake of Helen? Are the sons of Atreus the only men in the world who love their wives? Any man of common right feeling will love and cherish her who is his own, as I this woman, with my whole heart, though she was but a fruitling of my spear. Agamemnon has taken her from me. He has played me false. I know him. Let him tempt me no further, for he shall not move me. Let him look to you, Ulysses, and the other princes to save his ships from burning. He has done much without me already. He has built a wall. He has dug a trench deep and wide all round it, and he has planted it with stakes. But even so he stays not the murderous might of Hector. So long as I fought the Achaeans, Hector suffered not the battle range far from the city walls. He would come to the ski and gates, and the oak tree, but no further. Once he stayed to meet me, and hardly did he escape my onset. Now, however, since I am in no mood to fight him, I will tomorrow offer sacrifice to Jove and to all the gods. I will draw my ships into the water, and then victual them duly. Tomorrow morning, if you care to look, you will see my ships on the Hellespont, and my men rowing out to sea with might and main. If great Neptune vouchsafes me a fair passage, in three days I shall be in Phythia. I have much there that I left behind me when I came here to my sorrow, and I shall bring back still further store of gold, of red copper, of fair women, and of iron, my share of the spoils that we have taken. But one prize, he who gave has insolently taken away. Tell him all as I now bid you. And tell him in public that the Achaeans may hate him, and beware of him, should he think that he can yet dupe others, for his effrontery never fails him. As for me, hound that he is, he dares not look me in the face. I will take no counsel with him, and I will undertake nothing in common with him. He has wronged me, and deceived me enough. He shall not cousin me further. Let him go his own way, for Jove has robbed him of his reason. I loathe his presence, and for himself care not one straw. He may offer me ten or even twenty times what he has now done. Nay, not though it be all that he has in the world, both now or ever shall have. He may promise me the wealth of Orchomenos, or of Egyptian Thebes, which is the richest city in the whole world, for it has a hundred gates through each of which two hundred men may drive at once with their chariots and horses. He may offer me gifts as the sands of the sea, or of the dust of the plain in multitude, 
but even so he shall not move me till I have been revenged in full for the bitter wrong he has done me. I will not marry his daughter. She may be fair as Venus, and skilful as Minerva, but I will have none of her. Let another take her, who may be a good match for her, and who rules a larger kingdom. If the gods spare me to return home, Peleus will find me a wife. There are Achaean women in Hellas and Phythia, daughters of kings that have cities under them. Of these I can take whom I will, and marry her. Many a time I was minded when at home in Phythia to woo and wed a woman who would make me a suitable wife, and to enjoy the riches of my old father Peleus. My life is more to me than all the wealth of Eleus, while it was yet at peace before the Achaeans went there, or than all the treasure that lies on the stone floor of Apollo's temple beneath the cliffs of Pitho. Cattle and sheep are to be had for harrying, and a man may buy both tripods and horses if he wants them, but when his life has once left him, it can neither be bought nor harried back again. My mother Thetis tells me that there are two ways in which I may meet my end. If I stay here and fight, I shall not return alive, but my name will live forever. Whereas if I go home, my name will die, but it will be long ere death shall take me. To the rest of you I say, Go home, for you will not take Ilias. Jove has held his hand over her to protect her, and her people have taken heart. Go, therefore, as in duty bound, and tell the princes of the Achaeans the message that I have sent them. Tell them to find some other plan for the saving of their ships and people. For so long as my displeasure lasts, the one that they have now hit upon may not be. As for Phoenix, let him sleep here that he may sail with me in the morning, if he so will. But I will not take him by force. They all held their peace dismayed at the sternness with which he had denied them, till presently the old knight Phoenix, in his great fear of the ships of the Achaeans, burst into tears and said, Noble Achilles, if you are now minded to return, and in the fierceness of your anger will do nothing to save the ships from burning, how, my son, can I remain here without you? Your father Peleus bade me to go with you when he sent you here as a mere lad from Phythia to Agamemnon. You knew nothing neither of war nor of the arts whereby men make their mark in council, and he sent me with you to train you in all excellence of speech and action. Therefore, my son, I will not stay here without you. No, not though heaven itself vouchsafe to strip my years from off me, and make me young as I was when I first left Hellas, the land of fair women. I was then flying the anger of Father Amentor, son of Ormenus, who was furious with me in the matter of his concubine, of whom he was enamoured to the wronging of his wife, my mother. My mother, therefore, prayed me without ceasing to lie with the woman myself, that so she hate my father, and in the course of time I yielded. But my father soon came to know, and cursed me bitterly, calling the dread Irinyes to witness. He prayed that no son of mine might ever sit upon knees, and the gods, Jove of the world below and awful Prosperini, fulfilled his curse. I took counsel to kill him, but some god stayed my rashness and bade me think on men's evil tongues and how I should be branded as the murderer of my father. Nevertheless, I could not bear to stay in my father's house with him so bitter against me. My cousins and my clansmen came about me and pressed me sorely to remain. Many a sheep and many an ox did they slaughter, and many a fat hog did they set down to roast before the fire. Many a jar, too, did they broach of my father's wine. Nine whole nights did they set a guard over me, taking it in turns to watch, and they kept a fire always burning, both in the cloister of the outer court and in the inner court at the doors of the room where I lay. But when the darkness of the tenth night came, I broke through the closed doors of my room and climbed the wall of the outer court after passing quickly and unperceived through the men on guard and the women servants. I then fled through Hellas till I came to fertile Phythia, mother of sheep, and to King Peleus, who made me welcome, and treated me as a father treats an only son who will be heir to all his wealth. He made me rich, and set me over much people, establishing me on the borders of Phythia, where I was chief ruler over the Dilopians. It was I, Achilles, who had the making of you. I loved you with all my heart, for you would eat neither at home, nor when you had gone out elsewhere, till I had first set you upon my knees, cut up a dainty morsel that you were to eat, and held the wine-cup to your lips. Many a time have you slobbered your wine in baby helplessness over my shirt. I had infinite trouble with you. But I knew that heaven had vouchsafed me no offspring of my own, and I made a son of you, Achilles, that in my hour of need you might protect me. Now, therefore, I say battle with your pride and beat it. 
Cherish not your anger for ever. The might and majesty of heaven are more than ours, but even heaven may be appeased. And if a man has sinned, he prays the gods and reconciles them to himself by his piteous cries and by frankincense, with drink offerings and the savor of burnt sacrifice. For prayers are as daughters to great Jove. Halt, wrinkled, with eyes askance, they follow in the footsteps of sin, who being fierce and fleet of foot, leaves them far behind, and ever baneful to mankind outstrips them even to the ends of the world. But nevertheless the prayers come hobbling and healing after. If a man has pity upon these daughters of Jove when they draw near him, they will bless him and hear him too when he is praying. But if he deny them, and will not listen to them, they go to Jove, the son of Saturn, and pray that he may presently fall into sin, to his ruing bitterly hereafter. Therefore, Achilles, give these daughters of Jove due reverence, and bow before them as all good men will bow. Were not the son of Atreus offering you gifts and promising others later, if he were still furious and implacable? I am not he that would bid you throw off your anger and help the Achaeans, no matter how great their need. But he is giving much now, and more hereafter. He has sent his captains to urge his suit, and he has chosen those of who of all the Argives are most acceptable to you. Make not then their words and their coming to be of none effect. Your anger has been righteous so far. We have heard in song how heroes of old time quarreled when they were aroused to fury, but they could still be won by gifts, and fair words could soothe them. I have an old story in my mind, a very old one, but you are all friends, and I will tell us. The Curides and the Aetolians were fighting and killing one another round Calydon, the Aetolians defending the city and the Curides trying to destroy it. For Diana of the Golden Throne was angry and did them hurt, because Oneus had not offered her his harvest first fruits. The other gods had all been feasted with hecatombs, but to the daughter of great Jove alone he had made no sacrifice. He had forgotten her, or somehow or other it had escaped him, and this was a grievous sin. Thereon the archer goddess in her displeasure sent a prodigious creature against him, a savage wild boar with great white tusks that did much harm to his orchard lands, uprooting apple trees in full bloom and throwing them to the ground. But Meliager, son of Oneus, got huntsmen and hounds from many cities and killed it, for it was so monstrous that not a few were needed, and many a man did it stretch upon his funeral pyre. On this the goddess set the Curites and the Aetolians fighting furiously about the head and skin of the boar. So long as Meliager was in the field, things went badly for the Curites, and for all their numbers they could not hold their ground under the city walls. But in the course of time, Meliager was angered as even a wise man will sometimes be. He was incensed with his mother Althea, and therefore stayed at home with his wedded wife, fair Cleopatra, who was daughter of Marpessa, daughter of Eunius, and of Ides, the man then living. He it was who took his bow and faced King Apollo himself for fair Marpessa's sake. Her father and mother then named her Alcyon, because her mother had mourned with the plaintive strains of the Halcyon bird when Phoebus Apollo had carried her off. Meliager then stayed at home with Cleopatra, nursing the anger which he felt by reason of his mother's curses. His mother, grieving for the death of her brother, prayed the gods and beat the earth with her hands, calling upon Hades and an awful Prosperini. She went down upon her knees, and her bosom was wet with tears as she prayed that they would kill her son. And Erinys, that walks the darkness and knows no Ruth, heard her from Erebus. Then there was the din of battle about the gates of Calydon, and the dull thump of the battering against their walls. Thereon the elders of the Aetolians besought Meliager. They sent the chiefest of their priests, and begged him to come out and help them, promising him a great reward. They bade him choose fifty plough-gates, the most fertile in the plain of Calydon, the one half vineyard, the other open plough-land. The old warrior Oneus implored him, standing at the threshold of his room and beating the doors in supplication. His sisters and his mother herself besought him sore, but he the more refused them. Those of his comrades who were nearest and dearest to him also prayed him, but they could not move him till the foe was battering at the very doors of his chamber and the Curites had scaled the walls and were setting fire to the city. Then at last his sorrowing wife detailed the horrors that befall those whose city is taken. 
She reminded him how the men are slain, and the city is given over to the flames, while the women and children are carried into captivity. When he heard all this, his heart was touched, and he donned his armor to go forth. Thus, of his own inward motion, he saved the city of the Aetolians. But they now gave him nothing of those rich rewards that they had offered earlier, and though he saved the city, he took nothing by it. Be not then, my son, thus minded. Let not heaven lure you into any such course. When the ships are burning, it will be a harder matter to save them. Take the gifts and go, for the Achaeans will then honor you as a god, whereas if you fight without taking them, you may beat the battle back, but you will not be held in like honor. And Achilles answered, Phoenix, old friend and father, I have no need of such honor. I have honor from Jove himself, which will abide with me at my ship so I'll have breath in my body, and my limbs are strong. I say further, and lay my saying to your heart, Vex me no more with this weeping and lamentation, all in the cause of the son of Atreus. Love him so well, and you may lose the love I bear you. You ought to help me rather in troubling those that trouble me. Be king as much as I am, and share like honor with myself. The others shall take my answer. Stay here yourself, and sleep comfortably in your bed. At daybreak we will consider whether to remain or go. On this he nodded quietly to Patroclus, as a sign that he was to prepare a bed for Phoenix, and that the others should take their leave. Ajax, son of Telamon, then said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, let us be gone, for I see that our journey is vain. We must now take our answer, unwelcome though it be, to the Danaeans who are waiting to receive it. Achilles is savage and remorseless. He is cruel, and cares nothing for the love his comrades lavished upon him more than on all the others. He is implacable. And yet if a man's brother or son has been slain, he will accept a fine by way of amends from him that killed him, and the wrongdoer having paid in full remains in peace among his own people. But as for you, Achilles, the gods have put a wicked, unforgiving spirit in your heart, and this, all about one single girl, whereas we now offer you the seven best we have, and much else into the bargain. Be then of a more gracious mind. Respect the hospitality of your own roof. We are with you as messengers from the host of the Danaeans, and would fain be held nearest and dearest to yourself of all the Achaeans. Ajax, replied Achilles, noble son of Telamon, you have spoken much to my liking, but my blood boils when I think it all over, and remember how the son of Atreus treated me with contumely as though I were some vile tramp, and that too in the presence of the Argives. Go, then, and deliver your message. Say that I will have no concern with fighting till Hector, son of noble Priam, reaches the tents of the Myrmidons in his murderous course, and flings fire upon their ships. For all his lust of battle, I take it he will be held in check when he is at my own tent and ship. On this they took every man his double cup, made their drink offerings, and went back to the ships, Ulysses leading the way. But Patroclus told his men and the maidservants to make ready a comfortable bed for Phoenix. They therefore did so with sheepskins, a rug, and a sheet of fine linen. The old man then laid himself down and waited till morning came. But Achilles slept in an inner room, and beside him the daughter of Phorbus, lovely Diomede, whom he had carried off from Lesbos. Patroclus lay on the other side of the room, and with him fair Iphis, whom Achilles had given him when he took Skyros, the city of Inus. When the envoys reached the tents of the son of Atreus, the Achaeans rose, pledged them in cups of gold, and began to question them. King Agamemnon was the first to do so. Tell me, Ulysses, said he, will he save the ships from burning, or did he refuse, and is he still furious? Ulysses answered, Most noble son of Atreus, king of men, Agamemnon, Achilles will not be calmed, but is more fiercely angry than ever, and spurns both you and your gifts. He bids you take counsel with the Achaeans to save the ships and host as you best may. As for himself, he said that at daybreak he should draw his ships into the water. He said further that he should advise every one of them to sail home likewise, for that you will not reach the goal of Ilius. Jove, he said, has laid his hand over the city to protect it, and the people have taken heart. This is what he said. 
and the others who were with me can tell you the same story, Ajax and the two heralds, men, both of them, who may be trusted. The old man Phoenix stayed where he was to sleep, for so Achilles would have it, that he might go home with him in the morning, if he so would, but he will not take him by force. They all held their peace, sitting for a long time silent and dejected, by reason of the sternness with which Achilles had refused them, till presently Diomed said, Most noble son of Atreus, king of men, Agamemnon, you ought not to have sued the son of Peleus, nor offered him gifts. He is proud enough as it is, and you have encouraged him in his pride still further. Let him stay or go as he will. He will fight later when he is in the humor, and heaven puts it in his mind to do so. Now, therefore, let us all do as I say. We have eaten and drunk our fill. Let us then take our rest for in rest there is both strength and stay. But one fair, rosy-fingered morn appears, forthwith bring out your host and your horsemen in front of the ships, urging them on, and yourself fighting among the foremost. Thus he spoke, and the other chieftains approved his words. They then made their drink offerings, and went every man to his own tent, where they laid down to rest, and enjoyed the boon of sleep. End of Book Nine